Good morning, President Smolo. Good morning. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. Will you tell me when I should launch? I think we are ready to go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rod Smola, and I am the president of the Vermont Law and Graduate School. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's 47th Vermont Law Review Symposium. I wanna thank and congratulate all of the students on the Law Review uh, for your hard work and leadership in making this possible. And I wanna thank as well, all of my colleagues from uh, here at the school and from around the country who are participating. The symposia such as this uh, are the research and development departments of the American legal system. When we bring together thoughtful contributors and commentators to tackle the issues of the day, we're doing tremendous service to the evolution of the law and to our society. Uh, it's a process that the famous scholar Harry Calvin Jr. once called the law working itself pure. Uh, the topic of today's symposium is particularly fascinating to me, both personally and professionally. Uh, it's fascinating personally because I will confess to being an inveterate sports fan and my interests, I will have to say, very often cross interstate lines. Uh, but professionally, as a constitutional law litigator and scholar, uh, today's symposium is fascinating in its exploration of the conundrums posed by the intersection of state and federal laws germane to sports wagering. It is a free country, of course, and people are entitled to their own views. My own private view is that there was always a healthy dose of hypocrisy to the uh, antipathy exhibited by the National Collegiate Athletic Association and myriad professional sports leagues in their efforts to discourage and frustrate uh, easy access by consumers to sports wagering. Uh, hypocrisy because of course, those who manage college and professional sports in the United States know that across the culture, people vastly enjoy placing the occasional bet on the outcomes of sports games. And that interest to a very significant degree drives a lot of the interest in revenue in sports. If you think about what has become one of the great American rituals, Super, Day, uh, Super Bowl Sunday, and you spend the afternoon and early evening or late evening on a Super Bowl party, some folks are there to uh, watch the commercials. Some people are there to watch the halftime show. A few may be there to actually watch the football game, uh, but quite a few are there to watch uh, what happens with the wagers they placed from ordinary wagering of the sort you might see all the time to cockamamie things like what the color of the water will be that gets spilled on the winning coach. Uh, it all adds to the amusement of people. And it is a clearly not only a driver for the culture, but a driver for the revenue that uh, all of this business generates. So again, as I say, it's a free country and people are entitled to their own views. My own private view is that the landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court in 2018 in Murphy versus NCAA, in which the court held that the uh, Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act uh, violated the anti-commandeering principles of the uh, 10th Amendment, thereby striking down parts of that act, uh, was correct. I do believe that that law interfered with the sovereignty of the states. And of course, we know that one of the uh, outcomes that came from Murphy was the uh, proliferation of consumer friendly betting sites, making wagering on sports a, a great deal easier than it had been prior to that. But alas, as I said, it is a free country and people may agree or disagree with the decision in Murphy and all the other myriad existing rules and statutes that comprise the web of regulations surrounding um, the sports wagering in the United States. In the spirit of that freedom and the spirited debate that I suspect may incur throughout the day, I hope you all enjoy the symposium. Once again, thanks and congratulations to all of the students at the Law Review, particularly those students who use their leadership and energies to make this possible. Thanks to all my colleagues here who are participating, and thanks to everyone around the country who is participating and viewing. I hope you have a terrific day. Thanks. Thank you so much, President Small.
Okay, good morning and welcome again to the 21st annual Law Review Symposium. Thank you, President Small, for that wonderful introduction and thank you all for being here. We are so excited for you to join us. My name is Elsa Larson and I am one of this year's symposium editors along with my counterpart, Madison Gaffney. The symposium focuses on cutting edge issues and while sports betting and gaming law may not be one of Vermont law's particular areas of expertise, we have gathered a fantastic lineup of speakers to explain the emerging and legal issue, the emerging legal issues surrounding trends towards widespread legalization of sports betting. The symposium topic came from my note in which I suggest amending the Wire Act to allow for the legalization of sports betting across state lines. I'll be honest, as President Smala as well, um, I am a player myself and I wanna be able to sit in my apartment in Vermont and bet on Sunday's games the way I could when I lived in Las Vegas. We live in an era where the, what was once done physically is now done virtually. To illustrate, all of our speakers today are both here and not here. Many of our speakers are joining us from across the country and even across the globe. Um, they are attending the Vermont Law Review Symposium, which prior to the pandemic was hosted in person here on campus, but none of our speakers are here in Vermont. The world is changing rapidly as we know it. Many remember back in the day when Nevada's monopoly on legal sports betting meant people called their friends who lived in Nevada and asked them to place bets for them. I personally have a lot of friends that did this, so I'm sure you guys can attest to this. Fast forward to the era of the internet, mobile sports books and sports betting apps have replaced the friends we used to call. I hope today's symposium is informative and thought, provo thought provoking. We hope the symposium can provide a platform that showcases the legal issues present at the intersection of federal and state laws regarding sports betting and how those regulations work with and impact a variety of legal fields. I would love to turn it, um, oh, actually, so the panels, there's gonna be three panels and a keynote. Um, the schedule of events is up and um, everybody should have been emailed uh, the, that schedule. Um, if we have the speakers, I'm not sure if we do, we potentially might take a quick break to admit and get our first panel over. And then I will turn it over to Professor Benjamin Verratti, who is moderating our panel one. So just bear with us one moment. Hi, Professor Cabot. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hello. Apologies that it's very early um, in Nevada. <laughs> no worries. Um, give us one moment and just bear with us one moment while we get it together. So Professor McCann has not yet joined us, just to let everybody know that is who we are waiting on. Um, so just bear with us one moment. Professor Cabot, hi, Ben Brown, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well, sir. How are you today? Oh, I'm very good, yeah. 
Okay. Weather's still considered beautiful here in Vermont. Got a little chilly, but not too bad yet. Uh, we're still we're still hot, so it's been a it's been a strange uh, year for us. Yes, yeah, I never I've never actually been to Vermont. Some someday I'll get there. My yeah, wife's we'll always have to have you over. My wife's always bothering me to get to the to the New England states, and we never seem to get there for some reason. So my uh, my intent's not to spend much time on the presentation. Uh, I just I just thought that it might be a good idea if uh, we gave some context to the to the Federal Wire Act. For sure. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to learning more. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in my previous correspondence, I uh, have some instruction in this area, but it's quite a long time ago. So, uh, but it's. You know, my my entire legal career, uh, I dealt with the fire, the Federal Wire Act. So I, I I could always like first off, it's like a hundred and five. Or Oh, are we live? I think we're live. We are live, everyone. Hello, welcome. Good morning. We've uh, uh, managed to find a few extra minutes to make sure that we uh, can derive the best benefit from our speakers this morning. Uh, and thank you all for making the time to join us. Uh, my name is Benjamin Barati. I'm an assistant professor of law here at Vermont Law and Graduate School. And I'm truly honored to be moderating this first panel of the 21st annual Vermont Law Review Symposium, Crossing State Lines, Interstate Gambling and the Interplay between federal and state laws. Uh, as President Smala and Ms. Larson uh, recently mentioned in the introduction, you know, these are areas of law that are experiencing significant reconsideration and evolution as we become an increasingly interconnected world. And we're truly privileged to be able to explore some of the most interesting and pressing issues that raises this morning uh, with Professor Anthony Cabot and Professor Michael McCann, who will be joining us shortly. Uh, our format today is, is relatively uncomplicated, We'll hear uh, a little bit from each speaker and followed by a conversational session. Uh, feel free during the question and answer session to uh, share your comments if you are able, and we will try to get to as many of those folks as we can. Uh, I believe you. I believe you can also submit questions through the Zoom chat. I'm, I'm trusting our um, symposium uh, experts can uh, facilitate that. 
Uh, our first speaker today will be Professor Anthony Cabot, Distinguished Fellow in Gaming Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, William S. Boyd School of Law. Professor Cabot is a highly experienced and awarded practitioner of gaming law, a celebrated professor, a prolific author, including six books, I believe, on gaming law and numerous law review publications. Uh, and he has extensive leadership and public service experience particularly for and within professional bodies devoted to the regulation of gaming. Professor Gabbett, thank you so much for sharing your extensive knowledge and expertise today. I, I for one, am very much looking forward to, uh, to learning from your presentation. Thank you, Professor, for that warm introduction. Uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'm gonna do a very short uh, PowerPoint presentation. And, and the reason I'm gonna do this is because I give a little bit of background in, into the Federal Wire Act which is, I think, the, the most significant of the federal uh, gambling laws uh, that impact uh, the topic of this um, symposium. So this is just a sort of a little bit of an introduction to the Federal Wire Act. And uh, I'll put a presentation up if I can get uh, screen sharing um, privileges, please. If you click share screen, does it, does it not say you're able to? No, it says host disabled participant share screening. Apologies. Um, hold on. Uh, Madison will be working on that right now. It's still saying that? Yes. Okay, it should work now. Okay. And it does. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, does everybody see that? All right, perfect. So I'm gonna talk about the Federal Wire Act and, and the first thing you need to know about the Federal Wire Act is that it was part of a group of laws that were passed in the 1960s, really 1960s, when Robert Kennedy was, was the uh, Attorney General. And Robert Kennedy really didn't like the mafia. And, and if you look at the, the picture on the right, if you, anybody can figure out who those two are, you get some bonus points. But Robert Kennedy was really trying to go after organized crime and organized crime source of money, and one of which was was uh, sports wagering. At the time, Nevada had sports wagering. It was the only state. But it was really, even in Nevada, it was sort of put off to the side. It wasn't allowed in the casinos. Uh, it only had some standalone sports books. Uh, so the Federal Wire Act, when it was passed into law, along with the Travel Act and the Wagering Paraphernalia Act, uh, was really to go after the mob, and it was really to go after the mob's money. And it's an unusual statute because unlike virtually every other one of the federal uh, gambling laws, this one is not dependent upon a violation of state laws, a predicate law that's necessary to prove a, a, a federal offense. Um, you know, under the Federal Wire Act, uh, the legality of the bet under state law is relative is is irrelevant actually. So, this was a this was an, a, a case of the federal government actually making policy in this point uh, that was that was um, supreme to the states uh, and their wishes with regard to this. So let's talk about what it says um, and. You know, one of the things about the Federal Wire Act is it's a terribly written piece of legislation, maybe one of the worst I've ever seen. Um, from from an English uh, high school English teacher's perspective, they would go crazy. So I broke it down for you. And, and on the left side is legal talk, what it says, and on the right side is what it meant. And and so what it really means is it criminalized a bookie who uses a telephone or now a computer across state lines to accept sports wagers or to provide line information. That is, you know, is it uh, the New York Giants plus six, uh, for example? Uh, and if they do that, they can go to jail. So that's basically what it says. 
And you're going to hear things like, what's a safe harbor? Well, there's actually an exemption uh, underneath the Federal Wire Act. And you know, one is for news reporting, but the other one is um, one that you might hear a bit about today uh, for the transmission of information assisting in the placing of bets or wagers on a sporting event between states where it's legal, right? Um, and remember, that's not in the wagers themselves. It's just the information assisting in the, in the placing of bets or wagers, mostly, again, line information. Uh, what are the odds of the games? Uh, there's also an exemption for use in, in newspaper reporting of sporting events. So those are the two exceptions. Now, again, be careful because in this particular case, uh, it does not apply to the bets themselves. Uh, bets crossing state lines are illegal regardless of who's doing it, whether they're licensed or not, whether it's legal in both states or not. So we know that this was actually done to, to, to attack the mob and the mob's uh, big source of the mob's revenue. But here's what I don't think anybody ever anticipated. And, and, and in fact, myself five years ago. And, and that is that there'd be this, this massive proliferation of, of sports wagering across the United States. I mean, if you look at this, this chart, which is only um, a, actually a couple weeks old, uh, the American Gaming Association did it. You know, we went from one in Nevada to where we have 31 live plus the DC and five legal, but not yet up. And, you know, potential to add a, at least one or two uh, in, the, in the coming days. So uh, sports wagering went from um, a pariah industry to now one that's been rapidly accepted uh, across the United States. And so now we have a friction, and the friction is between the Federal Wire Act, which was designed to effectively uh, go after the mob to set policy at a federal level, um, versus what the states want to do now, and 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 the, the the rapid proliferation of gaming across the United States. So it creates issues, and 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 the issues. Um, uh, uh, some of them are pretty straightforward and some get a little bit more complicated. So I'll go through those really relatively quickly. So can a legal sports book accept wagers from across state lines? The answer is no. So it doesn't make any difference if it's legal in both states. No, a book in Nevada could not accept a, a wager from New York, even if both states agree. Um, they can't do it. Again, so what happens if the states agree if they have compacts? Like they do in poker, if, if anybody knows about the poker industry, um, you know, Nevada and a number of states have, have entered into compacts so that players in Nevada can play against players in other states um, so they can have shared liquidity. Uh, no, you still can't do that under the, the, the Federal Wire Act. Now, it's never been imposed against authorized state gambling, but there's no exceptions in the Wire Act that allow it. So. My answer is no, you can't do that. So can a, can a licensed book provide its current line information across state lines? So in other words, if I'm the Caesars Palace book in Las Vegas and my line on a particular game is the Cleveland Browns minus seven, can I provide that um, if, if someone calls up from, from another state? And the answer is, is uh, probably not. Um, is if, if it's available to, to people in states where sports, waiting, sports wagering is illegal, right? So if someone called from Utah, which sports wagering is illegal, um, you know, they, they could not provide that line information um, to them without violating the Federal Wire Act. Now, at the, at the current time, no one seems to care because you know, I can go almost anywhere and get everybody's line information, uh, but you know, if you look at the, the actual wording of the statute, um, that's what it says. And then finally, is mobile wagering legal, even on an intrastate basis? I should, should say, not should say intrastate, not interstate, but on an intrastate basis. So within the state, if the caller and, and the, um, the, the servers for the sports book are in the same state, um, can you do mobile wagering? And, and the answer is, is, 
I think so. But the Trump administration insinuated that it's not. They said that even if the player and the server are in the same state, the instrumentality, the internet, um, is such that you could never guarantee that the, the communication would stay intrastate. Therefore, it's an interstate um, vehicle. And Federal Wire Act prohibits interstate wagering, um, wagering in, in interstate or foreign commerce. That constitutes interstate commerce. Therefore, even intrastate communications, according to that interpretation, uh, would be uh, illegal. I disagree with that, but it keeps coming up in cases. And, and I don't know if anybody's followed the, what's going on in Florida with their sports wagering, but the, the group that um, challenged the right of, of the tribe to do sports wagering in Florida raised this very issue, saying, um, uh, wagering via the internet or mobile phone violates the Federal Wire Act because it routinely crosses state lines. Now, that wasn't the determination uh, why DeSantis lost in that case, uh, but you can see it's, it's still an argument that enough people feel is viable that it keeps coming up. So let me talk about how it affects the sports books themselves. Um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, I think three dominant areas. The first is shared liquidity. So what does that mean? If you're in the sports book business, and, and if I have a books in like DraftKings has books in multiple states, um, it would make business sense to have a single pool where you put all the funds and from there you make all the payouts, right? So rather than have 15 or 20 or 36 separate um, pools, um, you have one pool that has all the money in it. Now, the value of that is, is, is that um, you can start to take wagers on uh, less popular events because if you have a larger group that's contributing to the pools, then it makes uh, those bets viable for the, for the book. Um, so can you do that, right? Um, and, and that's a good question because if you, if you merge all the bets, are you now sending bets across state lines in violation of the Wire Act? So that, that creates an issue for shared liquidity. And the same thing goes with risk management. Risk management really is setting the lines, right? What you're trying to do is, you know, bookmakers, they start with an opening line and then based on how much money comes in um, on any given event, they're gonna move the lines. And, and what they're gonna to try to do is manage their risk. They don't wanna to get too lopsided on, on one side of any game. And so they need information to do that. And the information is how much are we taking in on, on each side of the game? Um, but can you do that um, on a national basis if you're, if you're a big company that's in all 36 states or 30 states? Or do you have to do risk management on a state-by-state -state basis? Um, now, here's one I think that they, they probably can do it on an interstate basis, because I don't think you actually have to move the line, the, you don't have to move the bets, you don't have to have like shared liquidity or common pools, you can just get the information, uh, as long as the information is going between states where it's legal, you can probably do it, and a lot of states have authorized it, Nevada, for example, has regulations that authorizes their books to conduct interstate risk management from Nevada, but it's, it's not, you know, uh, again, it's not 100% clear by virtue of the, of the Federal Wire Act. And then payment processing. So, you know, what constitutes information assisting in the placing of a better wager? Uh, I, I think, um, and there's another provision of the Federal Wire Act that talks about payments. Um, I, I think that payment processors are probably okay, but the payment processors don't necessarily think the same way I do. And so um, I had a nice quote from Professor Holden, um, where you know, he basically said some ancillary industries to the sports betting world operating across state lines, including payment processors and banks, could face exposure to the Wire Act either as direct violators or agents or betters. So there's that chance that 
you know, the uh, read broadly, the those two provisions of the Federal Wire Act, one with regard to information, the second with regard to payments, are such that it, it's causing banks to have hesitancy vis-a-vis uh, -vis offering their services. Um, some still do, but the result is higher costs to the industry because there's higher risk to the payment processors. And the, the, the final area I want to talk about is central facilities. So um, this is concerning to the states. It's concerning to, the, to some of the operators. You know, can I put my central servers in a, in a, in a, in a co-location center in Nevada, for example, where uh, we have a lot of co-location centers because we have no natural disasters here? And so it's a very a good place to store your computer, safe, secure place to to um, to store your computer uh, to host your services for the entire nation. But in fact, they they can't do that in this industry because a lot of states, like New York, I just gave you an example. You must have your host server in the state of New York, and that's not uncommon. So ultimately. You know, unfortunately, what you end up doing is having um, setting up host servers in multiple states um, to comply with state law and to avoid any complications under the Federal Wire Act. So that's another um, problem. So I just I just look at the Federal Wire Act and, and I wrote an article on it, uh, which I'll be happy to provide anybody on what the Wire Act should look like. And I'm only going to touch on three things. First off, it should not apply to lawful wagers. I mean, there, there's really no reason for the federal government to get involved in what states do. Uh, if states want to legalize sports wagering, if they want to enter compacts, if they want to allow their people who are licensed to have central servers in other states, uh, if they want to allow them to conduct multi-state risk management, uh, they should allow that. Uh, let the states handle their own affairs in this respect. Uh, so let's take out any application to to lawful wagers uh, permitted under state law or licensed under state law. Now, the, the second area I didn't talk about is what I think is is a real major area, and that is the proliferation of illegal operators offshore. Uh, the illegal operators, in in my opinion, first off, they're very large. Uh, and they're doing a massive amount of businesses. They're not paying taxes. They have a tendency to undercut um, the legal operators for that reason. Um, plus the fact that, you know, in, in the significant number of cases, um, they're criminals. And not just because they're taking wagers, but because they're involved in other things. Um, particularly in, in some of the Asian countries, the operators are actually triad members. and and they are involved in, in match fixing in various locations throughout the world. So I think the FBI and the United States government actually need more resources and really need to start going after some of the offshore operators uh, to help with the integrity of the games. And then this whole idea of the fictitious argument about the path of the data packs that people located in the same state um, if they use uh, the internet somehow uh, are doing stuff in interstate or, or foreign commerce, um, we need to clarify that because that's just, uh, I think, an impediment to what the states want to do. And, you know, we start getting some, um, some cases that uh, are not helpful to the industry. Uh, effectively, it could shut down the industry even more legal uh, in, in, the, in the 36 states that we're talking about. So, with that, that's my um, affirmative presentation. So I hope that was helpful. That was phenomenal. Thank you so much, Professor Cabot. Uh, There's a lot to, lot to think about there. And I, I certainly have, uh, would love to read the article myself and we'll be in touch about that. Um, it, it's next my Sincere honor to introduce Professor Michael McCann, uh, Director of the Sports and Entertainment Law Institute at UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law, where he is also a professor of law and recently served as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. 
Uh, Professor McCann is a hugely accomplished and influential sports law scholar, a best-selling author, and award-winning journalist, and has written more than 1,500, that's 1,500 articles for Sportico and Sports Illustrated on a wide range of topics. Uh, no mere academic slash journalist slash influencer slash legal expert. Uh, Professor McCann is also an experienced practitioner and has represented a number of important uh, football and other sports clients. And of course, among his many accolades, one stands paramount. Uh, Professor McCann taught here at Vermont Law School from 2008 to 2012, where he served as director of the Sports Law Institute. We are truly fortunate to have him here today and to benefit from his learned perspective Professor Michael McCann. Well, thank you, Professor Marty. What a, what a great introduction. I should, I should hire you after that. I mean, that was, uh, I need an agent. I mean, that, that's, uh, that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for having me back to Vermont Law School. It's wonderful to return. I know it's virtual, but it's still a return of sorts. And uh, I really enjoyed my time at VLS and uh, getting to know so many students who I've stayed in touch with, who I've worked with on different projects in the many years. It's now been a decade, as you said. So it's been a little while since I've been, I've been there, but uh, there are still a lot of familiar faces on the faculty and staff and uh, we're honored to, to be part of today's event. And also I just wanna say Professor Cabot's presentation was outstanding. Uh, I'm just gonna add a few words and then I think we'll go into q and I, I do not have the, the, a, a formal presentation, but I would comment on a couple of things that Professor Cabot hit on. Uh, one is the idea of jurisdiction and where you can bet and where a license permits betting. So Professor Cabot noted that there's an ongoing dispute in the state of Florida regarding the Seminole tribe and their compact with the Department of the Interior on, on essentially whether or not people can bet. So very basically, there's a federal law called the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, IGRA, and it has three classes of permissible gaming. The idea of this law is to basically come up with a structure for how gaming on Indian ground could be authorized. And the, the, the topic of laws involving tribes goes way beyond betting, of course. It's a, it's a much more complicated topic that goes into questions of sovereignty, that goes into questions of, of how our country has treated these, in, these individuals and their tribes over the years. But more, more specifically here, the question is whether or not the tribe is able to offer exclusive gaming in the state of Florida for online betting. So uh, as Professor Cabot mentioned, the tribe was given the right through a compact, which is a class three under IGRA, to offer sports betting online. This was in 2021. And for a brief period of time, very brief before it was stopped, in Florida, you would bet on sports you're on your mobile phone, uh, other, other app, and you, you did not have to be on the actual tribe's grounds. And the argument was the servers are on the ground, so it's still processing through a facility that's at the tribe. Even if you're in Miami, even if you're in Jacksonville, even if you're in Tampa, the actual, even though you're betting in a different location away from the tribal ground, you're still processing it through the tribe. So that's one argument is that it's still occurring on the ground. The argument didn't work. A district court judge thought that that's not a correct interpretation of the law, that the bet itself, the wager, you with the phone, you have to be on the ground in the Seminole area in order for the bet to be lawful. Now that's of course a radically different and much more narrow value to the tribe, right? Because the tribe wants to be able to, to obtain revenue through sports betting. And if somebody has to go on the physical ground, it greatly limits the uh, amount of revenue they will get it also greatly limits sports betting in the state of Florida. So obviously Florida is a big state and there are a number of cities there. So the tribe wants to make sure that you're able to bet anywhere. And also the state loses money. So uh, Professor Cabot noted Governor DeSantis. Governor DeSantis 
and, and his team want to make sure that they are getting part of the money and they get more money if somebody's able to bet outside the physical property of the tribe. So it's a really interesting area of law. And it, there, it just, I think it was yesterday, there were two briefs filed in the DC circuit on this issue. Uh, Professor Dan Wallach, who, who teaches uh, as an adjunct at our school, uh, has written a, an excellent story on this litigation. If you're interested, it's in Forbes, where he goes through the brief uh, and he's he's located in Florida, so for him this is sort of close to home. About the different legal arguments in terms of jurisdiction, and there isn't there, you know, there there's no sort of obvious answer here. It isn't as if you know the law wasn't created with this in mind. And this we've seen this in other areas of the law, where a law that was drafted before the internet is then statutorily interpreted with a new technology leading to uncertain applications. And the question becomes, should the law be updated by Congress or should a judge have the ability to interpret the law as he or she sees fit and essentially modernize it, which goes way beyond sports betting as a topic. It really goes into statutory construction and appropriate interpretations by judges. What is within their discretion? that big topic is actually really relevant in this particular dispute because the judge, the district court judge in Florida said, I'm not reading into this. It says you gotta be on the, it's, it says you have to be on the property. You're not on, if you're in Miami, you're not there. If you're in Tampa, you're not there. Now, of course, Governor DeSantis and the tribe view it differently. And, and also the Department of the Interior. They say, no, it's not, you can't read it so narrowly. You it's not intended to be limited to the physical proximity if the processing of the bet is still on the property. So really interesting question of law that you know, for, for law students, if you're thinking of things to write on, I, I would absolutely think about that case because it, there is, this is a case where you can make very authoritative arguments from both sides. And it's also a case where the, the, the politics are interesting. I said, Governor DeSantis, so you might think, oh, this is somehow a Republican Democrat thing. It's not at all. It's, it's really about jurisdiction. It's sort of stakeholder more than ideology and where they, where they stand and what they stand to benefit. Uh, I also touch on uh, Professor Cabot's note that sports betting has become legalized by states. We have seen in the aftermath of a 2018 Supreme Court ruling Murphy versus NCAA that essentially ended the federal ban on sports betting. But that was a bit of an overstatement when I say the federal ban on sports betting. There was never technically a federal ban on sports betting. 46 states were prohibited from licensing sports wagering in their states, which is a little different than a ban. And that actually became a big issue in the litigation. And very basically in 2000, excuse me, in 1991, uh, Congress, and the president, the first president Bush passed a law, PASPA, which prohibited sports betting, prohibited states from licensing sports betting. And four states, including most notably where Professor Cabot is, Nevada, uh, were excluded from that. And New Jersey had an opportunity to be excluded as well, but it didn't take sufficient action to get that benefit. Of course, New Jersey has Atlantic City. This is pre-internet as well, which is an important factor, right? So they're thinking of it as physical, literally betting on a physical property rather than betting on a phone. And for, for what, 30 years, it was banned. And then another governor, Governor Christie of New Jersey, came along and others in the state, both Republican and Democrat, objected to this. They argue that the federal government lacks the authority to prevent states from licensing sports betting. Essentially, the federal government can't tell states what to do about whether or not to allow sports betting. And this raised all sorts of issues. One, of course, is interstate commerce. The government, federal government can say, well, look, this is interstate commerce. If you're betting, especially Atlantic City, you got people driving from nearby states, that's commerce. You have uh, all sorts of traffic, the, the bets themselves, 
if they're using a, a bank, the bank may have contacts out of state. It's very easy, you could say, to find interstate commerce when it comes to betting within a state. And, and that's also very relevant to Professor Cabot's uh, excellent summation of the Wire Act. But the flip side is to say, okay, fine, there, there's Congress has a stake here because it's presumably interstate commerce. But how can the federal government stop 46 states from doing something, but not 50? We don't really see that in law. We don't say, well, it's a federal law that only applies to most states, but not all. Uh, usually, to the extent that that's the case, there's some sort of regulatory process that leads to an outcome where a state is governed by it in a certain way or not governed by it in a certain way. Here, it's really just exempting four states from a requirement. And it was challenged and it eventually got to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sided with the state of New Jersey. The case is called Murphy because uh, Governor Christie was replaced by Governor Murphy. So Murphy's name gets associated with the holding and the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government has overstepped its bounds because the federal government is attempting to stop a state from doing something where the federal government itself has not spoken. So by that, I mean, the federal government is saying, you can't have sports bet, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, but we're not gonna come up with any sort of system that addresses this topic. We're just gonna say, you can't do something. Well, the Supreme Court said that's problematic because there's no conflict with the federal law. You're just simply denying a state the right to take action. There, there was a dissent in this case by Justice Ginsburg, who thought that this was sort of a creative way of uh, re reimagining how to look at federal authority, but the majority sided with New Jersey. And this is, it's also interesting because the NCAA was, is the name defendant, but all of the major pro leagues were defendants too. The NBA, the NFL, they were actually the push behind the original ban. And in the early 90s, there were all sorts of questions of betting on sports. There was Pete Rose that occurred in the late 80s where he was a manager who bet on games. There was a perception that sports betting, and Professor Cabot talked about sort of the linkages to, to criminals, that this is a bad thing, that we don't want to have uh, this sort of activity partaking in our state. And that was one of the, the main objectives to stopping sports betting. So after the NFL, NBA, NHL, and Major League Baseball lose, what do they do? They embrace sports betting, right? I mean, this is the, what a turn. The leagues have partnered with gaming operators. They offer their own uh, licensing involving sports betting. They have embraced it. And, and it's, it, it, look, you know, you adapt if you're a business, right? So this is a business that sort of adapted to start making money from something that they had just said ought, ought to be illegal. A very interesting turn of events. And it continues to this day. Uh, there have been issues with players who have been accused of betting. One has been banned a year by the NFL for betting on games. So it does occur. The thinking is that pro athletes, because they're making a lot of money, are not inclined or at least not as tempted by betting. So the integrity of the game, the worry that a player is going to throw a game, right? Uh, go back to the Chicago uh, White Sox scandal that uh, called the Black Sox scandal in the uh, you know, about 100 years ago, where the players were throwing games. The worry is that, that back then the players made less, so it was less of a worry. Uh, now players make a lot more. But what about college players? Are they more tempted to throw games because they can get paid for name, image, and likeness now, but they're not employees and they can't get paid a salary. Uh, we have seen point shaving scandals over the years. Uh, Boston College basketball, famously in the 1970s, the players weren't trying to lose games. They were just essentially trying to not win by as much because there was a point spread and they were caught and people went to prison. So uh, there's a lot going on with sports betting. It is a super interesting topic. I think if you're a law student interested in this area, it's an area that has fertile ground in part because it's only been legal or states are only able to legalize it since 2018, 46 states. Uh, not all of them have invoked that right. Many, it's still illegal in some states. In uh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire is one of the first to take advantage of the Supreme Court rulings. Massachusetts 
has tried and they did pass a law, but my understanding is that implementation of that is getting delayed by certain things because when a law is passed, there has to be a regulatory body that's accompanying it. And I think that tends to lead to some complexities about whether or not multiple gaming companies are gonna get licenses with the state or whether it will be exclusive. So uh, why don't I stop there? I know that we wanna leave time for questions. So I, I appreciate you listening and I hope that was informative. Terrific, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, I know we, we do, as it turns out, have someone monitoring the YouTube stream, which is the appropriate place to submit uh, questions, folks, if you haven't had an opportunity uh, to do so yet. I do have some here. Um, you know, and, and starting out, uh, Professor Cabot mentioned that uh, the, the Wire Act uh, came about with policy concerns around the mafia and, and corruption. Uh, and, and I know from my own work in regulated advice that that specter of corruption is often raised even with minimal evidence in the, the contemporary era. Uh, so, so the question uh, posed was how might we best structure law and regulation to allow regulated sports wagering while also protecting the integrity of sport relative to various forms of corruption and criminal activity uh, with, with my note that uh, presumably those protections will be necessary whether or not they're required in, in order to see uh, a, a widening uh, of permissivity in this area. You want me to take first crack at that? Okay, so um, I'm a contrarian in this position. Uh, virtually every one of my colleagues believes that sports wagering um, should be regulated at the state level. Uh, I, I look at it differently. Uh, I think that <clears throat> there's two aspects of sports wagering. Um, there's the integrity of the bet and then the integrity of the process. And, and I think that, um, that the integrity of sports itself, the, the things you're betting on, to be federal level. I, I just don't think that some of the smaller states, uh, they, they've shown very little interest in actually understanding regulation. Um, and so they're doing very little to, to I think, help um, protect the integrity of the games that they're allowing wagers on. Um, and if, if instances do occur, I'm not so sure that all of them are capable of actually detecting and having a process to which to look into uh, game fixing and things of that nature. Uh, so, and, and, and I, I analogize it by saying, okay, what, what if we did the stock market? I think we tried this once, it didn't work, and decided that the states are going to regulate the stock market. We're not, we're not gonna have an SEC, we're just gonna have states do it. Uh, you know, what, what, problem, how, what problems could possibly come up there, right? Uh, and, and the answer is plenty. Um, so I think sports integrity should be done at the federal level. And then the integrity of the operators, in other words, the sports books themselves, that can be done at the state level. Uh, I, I see the integrity issue as, as being not national, but international. And, uh, you know, and I think uh, Professor McCann did a really nice job explaining that you know, with regard to professional sports, those the players are making so much money that the chances of them uh, being uh, bribed to to throw a game, I think, are pretty small in the major sports. But you know, we're we're betting on sports here that have had histories of problems with corruption, uh, tennis, uh, you know, uh, international uh, soccer, football. Uh, particularly at the lower levels. And, and we have a, a massive illegal markets outside the United States um, that have a, a, a tremendous amount of liquidity that allows fixers to go into those different sports and fix the games. And, and I, I just think that we really have to have a very concerted effort at a federal level to start looking at the integrity of the games that we allow um, betters to bet on in the United States. Again, I'm less concerned about um, 
the NFL. I'm less concerned about NBA and Major League Baseball. Uh, but once you st- once you get down below that, then we start to have some issues. And 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 Professor McCann made a great point. And and the the to me, the vulnerability of college sports is really really quite severe. Yeah, and just to build on Professor Cabot's comments, I mean, I mean, think about it. Say you're bribed to just throw one play, right? Like a tennis, but we've seen this in tennis, right? The spot bet. Uh, when it's 30-30, you hit it deep, you hit it out. You could have done that anyway. There's really almost no way of knowing that you were bribed. It's not an obvious loss. You might still win the match. You just throw one play. And maybe you're paid a lot of money to do that. It, it's... It's so hard to detect that. And, and I think Professor Cabot is right on the money that the states are going to struggle with this. And here's the thing. All it takes is one scandal and then it will be blown up. People are going to say, well, what are we doing with sports? But it, it will it will undermine the industry in a way that the industry might not be prepared for. Because all it takes is one. And uh, the SEC example that, that Professor Cabot noted, I mean, it's a great example, right? We don't we don't let states handle the stock market. Maybe some could be fine with it, but some might not. And uh, this is something where NBA commissioner Adam Silver, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, maybe like seven, six or seven years ago. This was while his league was arguing against the legalization or the opportunity for states to legalize sports betting. He said, wisely, I think, let's have Congress enter this. Let's pass a federal law so that everyone plays by the same set of rules. It went nowhere, didn't, didn't have any traction, no one touched it. Now here's the problem. Once states get to do their own thing, they don't wanna give it up, right? These, you, they all now have their own agencies, they have employees that are mindful of their jobs. So it's difficult to, to run in to now uh, federalize something when it's already states have now for, we're, in, we're gonna be the fifth year where states have their own discretion, their own regulatory models, their own staff. It's, it's similar to name, image, and likeness in college sports, where Congress had an opportunity to pass a law, pass a bill that would have been signed presumably by the president before states did their own thing on name, image, and likeness. I think once you let states do their own thing, it's really tough to roll that back because industries are created around that and stakeholders appear that wouldn't have appeared before. So uh, this is some interesting times ahead. Fascinating. We, you know, we, we have some uh, questions that, that seem uh, quite related to me. Uh, the, the, the questions posed, and I, and I think I'll, I'll put both of these out at once. Um, do you for, uh, foresee or have you observed specific issues regarding widespread sports betting on college sports in the state where the college game is played? Uh, and a related question, uh, if interstate sports betting becomes legal, uh, do you think it's likely the NCAA will change its rules about prohibiting states from legalized sports betting from hosting playoff games? Okay, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, interestingly, the issue of, of betting on local college sports uh, really came to a head in Nevada. Uh, in Nevada historically had prohibited wagers on uh, my university, UNLV and UNR. And uh, it became an issue at, at the federal level because at the time, uh, John McCain from Arizona was uh, proposing a federal ban on college sports wagering. And one of the arguments that he used against Nevada was, well, if you think it's so fine uh, to, to allow, then why do you prohibit wagering on your own colleges? Right? You must look at it as a risk. And, and Nevada's response was, well, we really don't, and we're removing that prohibition. <laughs> and so we started to allow wagering on sports events here in Nevada. Um, you know, it, it becomes a, a good question. Uh, I, I think it's less uh, a- applicable today because, you know, frankly, if I'm, I'm gonna, I'll back up for a second. If I'm a college athlete, right, and I want to throw a game and I want to bet on the game, 
there's so many venues I can do it. The fact that the neighborhood bar <laughs> or sports book is, is not available isn't going to stop me. And, I, and in fact, um, unfortunately, the university that I went to, Arizona State, had a, had a sports uh, point shaving scandal. Um, and obviously, at the time, uh, betting wasn't allowed in Arizona. Uh, the the student athletes and their friends uh, foolishly went to Vegas, placed the wagers. The Vegas books are the ones that said something's wrong here. This game's getting too much action. Um, it doesn't seem like it's coming from the right places. They're the ones that told the 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 uh, NC two AA and and Arizona State that there's something wrong on this game, which unraveled the uh, point shaving it was a relatively unsophisticated uh, attempt to do it. Um, but I, I don't think it makes a difference anymore with, 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 you know, just because you can't do it in your state legally doesn't mean you can't do it in your state by virtue of the illegal sports books or just to go to another state because it, it's basically all over. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, I think for political reasons, it has an appeal in terms of getting it passed that, oh, they can't bet on their own college games in their own state. But I think for the reasons uh, Professor Pavlich has noted, I, it seems more about optics than substance. And it also, you know, I don't think it, the fact is illegal betting has been going on the whole time, right? So whether states have legalized it or not, there's always been a marketplace for it. There's a marketplace offshores where many people would bet and probably still bet. And one argument for legalizing it is that it allows the state to create some sort of apparatus that ensures that consumers are protected, right? So that if you make a bet in the state, it's legal, you obtain certain legal rights. If you make a, an illegal bet in an offshore place and you don't get paid, well, good luck, right? Well, good, have fun trying to collect your money. So uh, there are all sorts of ways in which legalizing creates a structure that wouldn't otherwise be in place. But whether or not a state, I know in Massachusetts, this was a big thing. And I remember thinking, it's hard to believe this is sort of the why it's being delayed, uh, that it's whether or not you can bet on players who play college in the state. It, it, it does seem sort of more about optics than, than making a big difference. And in terms of the NCAA's position, the NCAA obviously is against uh, sports betting. I think they view it for reasons that we've talked about as more worrisome, that college players are more likely to take a bribe uh, than a pro athlete. I don't think they're going to change their position anytime soon. I think it would be hard for them to, to pivot on this. But that said, we have seen some schools uh, do partnerships with gaming companies. So it isn't as if schools are not involved with this. And it's interesting when we look at name image likeness, like what's permissible in a state for, for an athlete, an athlete might be prohibited from signing a deal with a gaming company, but his or her school isn't. You know, why shouldn't it be the same? Why can a school do it, but the student can't? But uh, in any event, it's, I don't think the NCAA is gonna pivot too much on this. Uh, Professor McCann, if you're willing to expound a bit more on that, we have another question that asks, uh, could you speak about the legal issues at the intersection of sports betting and player compensation, specifically regarding player endorsements for mobile sports books and sports betting apps? Yeah, so it, it creates, I mean, the, the short answer is it's possible, but the, the tricky, the more detailed answer is it has to be in compliance with either a league rule or in some cases, a school rule for talking about a college athlete. And we have seen players sort of enter that space in a way, uh, in part because leagues are doing it, right? I mean, this is the, the difficulty for a league to say a player can't do a deal with a gaming company or some, I would say, company related to the gaming company. I mean, there are all sorts of, you know, what, what's a gaming company is, is kind of a there, there can be a nibbling about how to define that. But in any event, the, when leagues embrace it, I think it's hard for a league to say an athlete can't do an endorsement deal. I, I think it gets trickier at the college level 
where some state laws prohibit that activity. And even in the absence of a state law prohibiting it, a school rule might do that. And school, I mean, that's student code of conduct. What, what permissible websites are you allowed to be on while on school property? Is it different when you're off school property? So it's an evolving space. I don't think there's sort of a, a, a bright line answer on that. I think it depends on the circumstances. It depends on what the company is. But I would say we're moving in a direction of athletes joining hands with gaming companies. This also comes up in esports too, right? Where you can, we can wager on esports. The uh, and, and those esports players are engaged. You know, could they throw a game when they're when they're playing? A, you know, NBA two K. Could they deliberately lose? It, it's just interesting how it's how it's evolved. Uh, Professor Cabot, we we've talked a lot today, and and much of uh, the the evolving nature of this field has to do. Uh, with with increases in uh, access with with the the role of the internet uh, and in light of all of that we have a, a question that says given your extensive work and background within the Nevada gaming circuit why do you think Nevada has been able to retain its gaming success without the large presence in Las Vegas do you believe the state would be uh, competitive Oh, you're muted. I'm assuming this question isn't related to sports wagering. It's related to the gaming industry as, as a whole. That, that's my understanding as well. Unfortunately, I don't okay. have a lot of other context here. Okay. So uh, um, the answer to that is, is really, you know, Nevada legalized casino wagering in 1931. And we basically have evolved over that time period. Um, you know, we're one of the rare jurisdictions that have basically said, you know, we're, we're going to open this up for competition and we're going to let competition define the market. Um, you know, we have 400 casinos here, believe it or not, in the state. And, and over, the, over the time period, well, 90 years now, uh, we've done a really, really nice job of allowing the industry to define what they think consumers want. And so, you know, we're, we're the ones that basically created the concept of integrated resorts. Integrated resorts are these, these very uh, elaborate, expensive buildings that have the capability of drawing people from all over the world. Um, and we've created a, a synergy within Las Vegas uh, such that you know, we, we've become, you know, the de facto Disneyland of gaming. And that has a lot of power, right? And what we found over the years as we lost our monopoly in the United States, as we um, see increased competition across the world, that it actually has helped Las Vegas. Um, and it's helped Las Vegas for the simple reason that we're the, we're the, the, the Mecca, right? I mean, people get used to gambling in different jurisdictions and they like it, but now they want to go to where the action is, Las Vegas. Um, and so that has been a big thing. The other thing that's been big too is that, you know, Las Vegas has evolved into effectively a non-gaming town, right? Uh, we used to have 70% of our revenues come from gambling, 30% come from other things, entertainment, food, beverage. Um, we flipped that. And, and so now the, the experience of Las Vegas is not the same experience that you have if you go to the local casino. It, it's really a truly different experience. It's a, it's a more inclusive experience. I know we got all the sports teams now. Uh, we're, I think we're gonna get another one coming pretty soon. Uh, we have more concert venues than anybody in the world, and we have every famous chef in the world here, not nightclubs. So we, we've created that synergy that I don't think could be replicated, and, and I think that's going to propel Las Vegas uh, for a long time into the future as the premier gaming uh, place in the world. 
Thanks. That's a, a wonderful response. Also, personally, note you have uh, Red Rock Canyon, which has some amazing hiking, and it's one of my favorite my, Las Vegas activities. It's, I, I live about five miles away from it, and I'm there oh, all the time. Beautiful. <laughs> yes. uh, we, we do have a couple of questions that have come in um, uh, via YouTube. Uh, the first, do you all believe that legalizing sports, sports wagering widespread will eliminate the illegal bookies and illegal sports betting in the U.S. and or offshore? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's my take, too. My, my scholarly area is um, primarily in cannabis regulation, where we have uh, similar conversations often about um, to, to what extent uh, can, can we uh, eliminate these outside threats versus mitigate them. I, I can I can add just a little bit to that. The, the problem you have with the offshore people is um, that they have a lot of liquidity. They have very little overhead and they don't pay taxes. So I, I, I can attest that a number of the professional gamblers who come out of Las Vegas will still make most of their wagers offshore because they just get better lines. And just to add, there's, how do you stop it, right? There's no, they're there online, right? The government, we can't, we don't have jurisdiction in, in other countries. So it's not as if, I mean, unless we have a new kind of internet that starts picking and choosing which are lawful websites, which raises all sorts of other concerns if we were to have that. I don't think they're going away and some people prefer to use that and I, rightly or wrongly I just think you know I don't I don't they're not going anywhere. Thank you. Uh, we, we have another question uh, from YouTube in, in support of federal or state regulation of sports betting who or what is intended to benefit from this protection is it college athletes is it other gamblers is this mostly a moral argument what, what's who what, what was the question can you say it again sorry oh, yeah who exactly is supposed to benefit from regulation of sports uh, uh from sports betting or are we trying mostly to uh protect pr protect our athletes or other gamblers are we trying to protect the integrity of the game what what is the policy basis i'll just i mean i think part of it is the integrity of the game for reasons that we've talked about that we don't want to incentivize athletes or coaches or referees taking bribes to affect the outcome of games. That, that's certainly one concern. I think there's always concern about uh, having a regulatory body to prevent people from gambling too much or gambling, uh, problem gambling, right? That they become either addictive, if you want to use, you know, whether the word addiction is appropriate, I, I guess could be debated, but too reliant on gambling that their that their that their wagers cause really major problems for them and their families. That's a concern. Also, I think oversight in terms of for, for making sure that money is changing hands through lawful actors rather than those who have ties to uh, criminals. I think that those are all concerns. I mean, you know, is there an element of protecting those in, in industry? Sure, but that's, that's often true with a lot of, as we know, and all sorts of regulation. I, I agree with that. And, and I, I just add that, you know, oftentimes the government, i.e. the states, are doing this to raise money. So they're, they're also um, making sure they put in the necessary protections to get, make sure they get all the tax dollars they're entitled to. So th there's a multitude of different policy uh, concerns or policy goals, uh, as Professor McCann said. That's helpful, thank you. Um, and, and we do have a, a somewhat related question uh, in, in terms of uh, the potential risks of, of gambling at an individual level. Um, MGM Resorts uh, has done a lot of work trying to combat gambling addiction across their casinos and offer support for problem gamblers. Can you speak to that model and whether it might be replicated to mitigate potentially unhealthy side effects of widespread sports betting? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I can, I can uh, briefly talk about that, and, uh, and I'm sure Professor McCann has some insight as well. But um, MGM has something called Game Sense, which is a, a product that they put together, uh, which is 
uh, their social responsibility um, program to to deal with uh, uh, problem gambling and to help promote responsible gambling. Uh, now, do I think that's a good idea? Yes, uh, I, I applaud MGM for doing that. Uh, but MGM is just one company, right? There's a whole bunch of other companies out there uh, that don't necessarily have the same uh, commitment to to responsible gambling and social responsibility. Um, so I, I I think that there has to be more done in the area of responsible gambling. Um, and uh, I think that is something that the state should be concentrating on. Um, and you know what what that is, you know what that would 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 be in the context of sports wagering. And I'm not really sure, but you know, is is it um, self exclusion? Is it uh, predetermined um, loss limits? Is it um, utilizing an artificial intelligence to look at uh, betting patterns that would would suggest that the person's a problem gambler? And an intervention is required. There's there's a there's a, just a ton of potential solutions, uh, but that, that's one where I think the states really should start to look more heavily at at promoting these types of responsible gambling programs, and as importantly, to have programs for problem gamblers treatment and things of that nature. So I think it's a really big issue uh, that that. You know, we, we, we necessarily can't rely upon the companies to do themselves, but I think that is really something that the government should be uh, intervening in. Yeah, I totally agree. And we know that even if gambling, sports betting became illegal in the country tomorrow, it would still happen, right, through offshore betting. And having some system in place, I think Professor Cabot really detailed the different options is sensible. The companies leaving it to private industry is always, there's always a risk. Uh, the companies have some sort of incentive that they don't want to be associated with people losing their, all their money, right? Because that, that's not going to help them uh, in terms of marketing their product. But having the government in place, having the states get involved, and some states have done so, some states have created systems in place to, to address that. And you know, the alternative, again, the alternative is if we don't allow betting, it's still going to happen. And it would seem as if legalizing it and regulating it makes more sense than, than the alternative. Uh, I'm going to abuse my moderator powers here uh, uh, to, to ask one of my own questions, which is uh, actually a little bit more of just a, a fact question. There may be a very specific and direct answer. Uh, in my own field of study, we similarly see um, uh, conservatism uh, among uh, banking providers and uh, a, a number of different solutions have, have been experimented with that. We certainly see some financial institutions that are uh, a little less risk averse. Um, uh, FINRA has provided some specific safe harbors, which, uh, however, um, the, the, the risk uh, remains high with, with that, that a, a new presidential administration will change policy. Uh, and and uh, and enforcement will uh, include um, asset forfeiture. Uh, I, in my field of study, we see that some of those responses in, involve a movement towards uh, using utilizing state chartered banks, and there have been even uh, some proposals uh, to create state-run banks to resolve some of the issues uh, that have been raised uh, just in in access to uh, banking instruments. I'm wondering if there's anything similar in in this world. Um, well, well, I can start. Uh, so my experience with regard to online gaming, um, in particular sports and fantasy sports and some of the social gaming, things of that nature that, that are, I think, uh, lawful in the United States, um, they still have had, had problems, um, not necessarily finding the providers, the payment processors, uh, but finding them at competitive rates. So I, I think what I, at least my experience has been that um, the, the, the payment processors are available, but they're paying higher rates because a number of the people look at the risk 
uh, some of them back out and will not provide services. The ones that do um, naturally require a higher fee than if, for example, I was selling uh, vintage clothing or something else. I, I have nothing to add. That's, that's a thoughtful response. I'm just going to co-sign. That's very helpful. Thanks. Uh, well, we do want to be sure to leave some buffer before the next panel. So uh, a, a final question for you all. Um, are there specific uh, issues or perhaps cases in the uh, sports and gaming world that you are following closely right now? Uh, perhaps you recommend others to follow along? I'll jump in first, uh, Professor. I will say the case we talked about involving the Seminole Tribe and Florida, I think that's the big one to watch for. It has all sorts of interesting applications of law. It would make a great note for a law review, honestly. There's, a, there's just so much to untangle with it. I would, I would say that. And then secondly, how states continue to legalize sports betting. Will we see problems with states having this responsibility? And if problems surface, what will be the impact on the industry generally? Will, will people start rethinking the topic in ways that could create shifts? Those, those are some things that I'm following. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with uh, Professor McCann that it, the Florida case is the most interesting one that's going down right now. Um, there's a couple of things, a couple of areas that I think are interesting to watch. And, and I think California, which is going to be the biggest market if they ever get sports wagering, is clearly something to watch. And they have these dueling referendums and uh, it's definitely gonna end up in court someplace some, sometime soon. Uh, so I think that's interesting to watch. And then, uh, you know, the, the, my area that I've been spending a lot of time on is um, the organized crime influence in the offshore markets and the effect that they're having on, on the integrity of different games. Um, I, I know we talked about this and, you know, Professor McCann said, you know, the, what's going to happen, you know, what could possibly happen? I look at it from sort of like the Monday, the Monday after, right? And the Monday after is, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times has this huge article about how some game was thrown in the in some dominant athletes that involved them being um, compromised by virtue of some of these large offshore uh, organized crimes organization and what the impact's going to be of that. That's, that, that's where I see, you know, if we're gonna change the trajectory of where we're going, that is, is something that prob probably could do it. And so I'm, I'm, and I'm looking, there's a lot of uh, information right now about organized crime influence in the casino industry. There's a lot about organized crime influence in the sports book industry. And I think they're the same organized crime groups. Uh, so I, I, I really think that that's something to be watched uh, and to be concerned about from the perspective of the legal industry in the, in the United States. Well, Professors Cabot and McCann, thank you so much for taking uh, the time and sharing your insight with us. These are certainly uh, exciting and interesting and evolving areas of the law. And it's, it's, it's gonna be fascinating to watch. Uh, what happens next. Uh, I think with that, we are going to conclude. Uh, next up at 11 o'clock will be panel two, moderated by Dean McCormick with attorney Elizabeth Homer, attorney Scott Shearer, and Lindsay Slater. Uh, so thank you all for being a part of our events today and uh, look forward to that in a little while. Thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you both so much.
I'm the interim dean of Vermont Law School, and it is my great honor to introduce panel two. The first speaker that we're going to hear from is Ms. Elizabeth Homer. Ms. Elizabeth Homer of Homer Law is a member of the Osage Nation of Oklahoma. She recently completed a three-year term of appointment as vice chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission. She's a proponent of collaborative rulemaking, and she was instrumental in affecting tribal and the interim dean of Vermont Law School, and it is my great honor to introduce panel two. The first speaker that we're going to hear from is Ms. Elizabeth Homer. Ms. Elizabeth Homer of Homer Law is a member of the Osage Nation of Oklahoma. She recently completed a three-year term of appointment as vice chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission. She's a proponent of collaborative rulemaking, and she was instrumental in affecting tribal and the interim dean of Vermont Law School, and it is my great honor to introduce panel two. The first speaker that we're going to hear from is Ms. Elizabeth And she was instrumental. And she was instrumental. Sorry, I appear to be having some technical difficulties. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna restart here and introduce Ms. Elizabeth Homer of Homer, Law, of Homer Law. She's a member of the Osage Nation of Oklahoma, and she recently completed a three-year term of appointment as vice chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission. She's a proponent of collaborative rulemaking, and she was instrumental in affecting tribal involvement in the commission's regulatory processes through the establishment of tribal advisory committees and other consultative activities during her tenure with the commission. She has had a distinguished career in public service. She served as the director of the Office of American Indian Trust at the US Department of the Interior, where she worked closely with tribal governments and federal policymakers to advance issues and policies of concern to American Indian and Alaska Native tribal governments, as well as Native Hawaiians. As the director of the office, she supervised the implementation of a number of administration policy priorities in the areas of national of tribal natural and cultural resources, consultation, and negotiated rulemaking, including President Clinton's executive order, orders regarding sacred sites and tribal consultation. A recognized authority on federal Indian law and policy, she also served on several US diplomatic delegations to the United Nations and the Organization of American States on matters concerning the civil and political rights of ind indigenous peoples. She began her legal career with the Office of the District Attorney for the 2nd Judicial District of New Mexico, where she prosecuted violent felony offenses before joining the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. While at the Justice Department, her work to increase the investigation and prosecution of crimes against children in Indian country earned her one of the division's highest awards for special initiative. She also served on the Attorney General's Task Force on Violent Crime, and as the Criminal Division's representative to the Indian Affairs Subcommittee of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee of United States Attorneys. Upon completion of a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science at the University of Colorado, Ms. Homer joined the Osage Nation staff. Later, she accepted a position with the policy arm of the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, a consortium of energy producing tribes where her work was primarily focused on environmental issues related to non-renewable energy resource development. She went on to serve as Deputy Director of Americans for Indian Opportunity, a national organization addressing emerging issues of relevance to tribal governments. Ms. Homer earned her Juris Doctor from the University of New Mexico School of Law. She's a member of the State Bar of New Mexico and the Bar of the District of Columbia, as well as the American Bar Association, Federal Bar Association, and Native American Bar Association. Ms. Homer.
Um, Ms. Homer, you are muted. Wow, that was very terrible of me. I'm very sorry about that. Um, I, I have been seeing that I am um, sorry that I sent you the long version of my bio. I, I, she should have gotten the shorter version of my bio. So um, forgive me for that. But the upshot of my bio really is that I have worked in Indian law and policy virtually all of my career, you know, for 30 years. Oh God, I'm not, I'm too young really you know, to have worked in, in anything that long. Uh, but um, Indian law is about land, right? Indian law is about Indian land and uh, it's jurisdictional. It's like state law is about state land. It's territorially based, right? And that's worked for us you know, throughout the history of the United States in order to determine who has jurisdiction over what, what lands the state has jurisdiction, what lands the tribe has jurisdiction, what lands the federal government has jurisdiction. And, you know, we've got this framework that everyone has, you know, pretty much knows and understands and follows. Now, however, um, you know, we live in a kind of a different world and we've had this new development and it's called the internet. And it's, um, you know, it's caused a lot of um, confusion and consternation about, you know, about these jurisdictional issues when it comes to gaming, you know, in particular. I think the interesting thing about gaming is it's really at the forefront of a lot of issues that are emerging um, from a legal point of view um, when it comes to all of us being on the World Wide, wide Web now. And uh, this is kind of one of the first big issues, uh, first big challenging issues, because in the past we've always understood, okay, um, you know, under the Johnson Act, the states have jurisdiction over gaming, right? Um, and then we had the, we had the uh, big brouhaha between the states and the tribes back in the, um, you know, in the 1980s where the states uh, were challenging the tribe's jurisdiction over their gaming activities. And, um, you know, since that time, it, you know, uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was enacted, uh, would, which made it clear uh, that, you know, the tribes have jurisdiction over class two gaming because, you know, that statute, um, developed this kind of regulatory structure and, and kind of created these classifications of games. So it's clear that the tribes have jurisdiction, uh, exclusive jurisdiction subject to federal oversight uh, with respect to class two gaming. And uh, with respect to class three gaming, which is what we understand generally to be, you know, casino style gaming, uh, such as craps and roulette and other card and table games. Um, the uh, tribes and the states enter into these gaming compacts. So now we kind of have this intersection of jurisdiction between tribal and state government with the state having a regulatory role in a, or a, you know, having some type of role in the tribes class three gaming activities. Okay, now we've taken that next leap. Now we're talking about sports betting which naturally requires the use of the internet. And uh, we're all trying to figure this out and it's not that easy. Uh, recently, there was a compact between the state of Florida and uh, the um, uh, Seminole tribe. And in that compact, the tribe and state had basically agreed that under its compact, the tribe could accept wagers from persons anywhere within the jurisdiction of the state of Florida. And that person did not have to be on the tribe's Indian lands. And uh, the court here in DC, the, the district court ruled, uh, no, you can't do that. Indian gaming must all transactions must take place on the tribe's Indian lands, on the, on the reservation. So this basically undid the compact between Florida and, um, and uh, the Seminole Nation. 
Now that is up on appeal um, before the, um, the Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and we're gonna see how that comes up. So this is just one of the examples of um, how challenging the question of jurisdiction is becoming in the, you know, in the world of the World Wide, world wide Web. And uh, we're gonna see more of this. Um, and I think that there are ways um, to resolve these issues, uh, that it's just gonna take time. I would like to see the Congress um, perhaps, you know, have more conversations on, on you know, on these issues. Uh, I think the tribes in the states are quite capable of working out these issues. But right now we have a lot of tribes and states that are trying to get class three gaming compacts for sports wagering and, um, you know, and trying to figure out this jurisdictional issue. Because if the wager has to be placed on the tribe's Indian lands, uh, the payout has to be made on the tribe's Indian lands, um, then the tribes are going to have a very, very tiny market share if they can't participate um, in this type of gaming activity on par with the rest of the world. And so, you know, in my world, that's the big issue right now in terms of interstate um, uh, jurisdictional issues and boundaries and, and, um, and uh, what that means in terms of uh, any type of activity between tribes in the kind of the greater world. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to announce our second panelist today, gaming law veteran Scott Scherr. Mr. Scherr uses his unique mix of regulatory business policy and legal perspectives to help highlight, to help clients achieve their goals. He's got more than 30 years of gaming experience, which includes serving as a member of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, where he had responsibility for the investigations, audit, and technology divisions. As a supervising deputy in the gaming division of the Nevada Attorney General's Office and as in-house counsel for a major gaming device manufacturer, these experiences informed his representation of clients on a state, national, and international business regulatory and compliance matters. Over the course of his career, Mr. Scherr has worked with clients in Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, Macau, and beyond. In addition to his private sector clients, he has also advised and assisted various governments in drafting gaming laws and regulations. He has served as a chair of the International Association of Gaming Regulators, a member of the Nevada Assembly, General Counsel and Chief Staff for Nevada Governor Kenny Gwynn, one of Nevada's representatives to the Conference of Commissioners on United States Laws, a member of the Nevada Commission on Ethics, and a member of the Nevada Gaming Policy Committee. Mr. Scherr. Thank you very much. Um, I am honored to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to you today uh, at the uh, 21st Annual Symposium. Uh, our topic is uh, crossing state lines, uh, interstate gambling and the interplay between federal and state laws. So I'd like to address that topic uh, from my experience as a gaming law practitioner, though uh, Ms. Homer's addressed already some of the, the uh, tribal gaming issues. And so I'll touch only lightly on, on those. Uh, let me see if I can be technologically capable enough to share my screen. Perhaps not. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's given me the option to share that this that particular slideshow, but I do want to uh, start by giving you an overview of the state and federal gambling laws, uh, and then I'll we'll talk about some of the challenges that those present for gaming companies and for gaming law practitioners, and some of the ways that uh, those companies are attempting to, to overcome those challenges. And then finally talk about perhaps where gaming law may be going in the future, especially as gaming expands across the country. 
So the gaming industry in the United States is governed primarily by state laws, uh, federal laws governing gambling, primarily target activities that are illegal under the laws of the state, where at least some of the activity takes place. Ms. Homer referred to the Seminole Compact, obviously the, the activity of accepting the wager may be different from the activity of actually placing or transmitting the wager, uh, making the payments, uh, receiving the payments uh, may occur at different places, but typically the federal laws have focused on uh, activities that violate the laws of the jurisdiction where at least one of those activities has taken place. One exception is the Wire Act, uh, which prohibits the interstate transmission of bets and wagers on sporting events or contests. But even the Wire Act contains certain exceptions for transmission of information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers where the wagering is legal under the laws of both states, with the state where the uh, information is transmitted and the state where the information is received. So some of the other uh, some of the federal gambling laws, the Wire Act we just talked about, but it's in 18 U.S.C. 1084. It uh, applies only to those who are engaged in the business of betting or wagering. So it does not apply to mere bettors. Uh, you actually have to be in the business uh, of, of betting to uh, violate the Wire Act. It applies to those who knowingly uh, use a wire commun communication facility. It, uh, for the transmission in interstate or foreign commerce of bets or wagers, information assisting in the placing of bets or wagers, and again, this is the one where there's an exception if it's legal in both jurisdictions, or for information which entitles the recipient to receive money or credit as the result of bets or wagers. And this one has become important in recent years with the spread of sports betting. Uh, some of the exceptions, there are exceptions for news reporting. So for example, you may see um, your uh, point spreads in, in your local newspaper. Uh, you may see one of the many sports betting broadcasts uh, on television that are occurring these days talking about point spreads. So those are covered by the news reporting exception. Um, and the other is the uh, transmission of information, uh, again, assisting the placing of bets or wagers from a state or country uh, where betting is legal to a state or country where the betting is legal. So if you can just go ahead and start the slideshow with, uh, I think I'm on slide four. Thank you for, for doing that, I appreciate it. Actually, let's go to slide five. Um, so some of the other federal laws, the Illegal Gambling Business Act uh, applies to a gambling business that is a violation of a state, uh, of the law of a state or political subdivision in which it's conducted. Uh, so again, the IGBA requires a predicate violation of state law before it constitutes a federal offense. The Interstate Transportation of Wagering Paraphernalia Act, this is 18 USC 1953. You'll see a lot of these uh, federal uh, gambling prohibitions are in chapter 18 of the United States Code. Uh, this law prohibits the tr interstate transportation of materials for use with bookmaking, sports pools, or lottery games. Uh, they use a number of, of older terms for lottery games, but essentially they're all draw, draw style numbers games. Uh, but there's exceptions. There's exceptions for common carriers in the usual course of their business. There's exceptions where the parimutuel betting or sports betting is legal and for state lotteries. So again, another form of legal gaming. So again, we have a situation where a federal law applies essentially only where the gambling is illegal uh, under, the, under the local state laws. Although some private lotteries could potentially get caught up in, in this particular law. And the next slide uh, pertains to the Unlawful Internet Gaming Enforcement Act. And this one has become uh, much larger and has taken on a very large role with uh, the spread, again, of sports betting uh, online and also with uh, internet gaming starting to spread uh, in different jurisdictions. 
the Uliga really was an attempt initially to address offshore uh, internet gaming uh, with U.S. players placing bets with uh, sites, uh, unregulated uh, gambling sites in the Caribbean or other international locations. Uh, and essentially it required blocking the financial transactions related to unlawful internet gambling. So it was trying to cut off the supply of funds, stop people from using credit or debit cards to fund accounts to place wagers with offshore gambling sites. Uh, under UIGA, unlawful internet gambling means, uh, again, to place, receive, or otherwise knowingly transmit a better wager. And again, this is, this is the most recent uh, pronouncement by Congress on federal law. And so it, it carries a lot of weight as to how a lot of the federal laws uh, are interpreted. But by any means which involves the use, at least in part of the internet, where such better wager is unlawful under any applicable, applicable federal or state law, in the state or tribal lands in which the better wager is initiated, received, or otherwise made. So again, any of those different activities, uh, they're looking at, at all of the jurisdictions involved uh, having legalized that particular conduct. And in that, if, that, if that's the case, then it's not unlawful internet gambling and UIGA doesn't apply. Uh, unlawful internet gambling specifically does not include a better wager which is initiated and received other, otherwise made exclusively within a single state. Uh, so this is known as the intrastate exception. Although it's not a blanket exception, the state actually has to have some regulatory authority and make sure that there are there is appropriate age and location verification in place and appropriate data security to stop people who are trying to um, hack or avoid the, uh, the, the age verification and location verification features. Uh, there's also an intra-tribal exception. Um, so, uh, you know, it, this uh, activity was taking place uh, wholly within a particular tribe's lands uh, would also not be subject to UIGA. The consistent theme here is to respect the decisions of the states with regard to the legality of uh, various forms of gaming. So if we move to the next slide, so the big, the big case recently, of course, was Murphy versus NCAA. Uh, and this is the uh, case where essentially the US Supreme Court struck down the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act, uh, known as PASPA, under the anti-commandeering principle of the Constitution. Uh, in Murphy, the Supreme Court distinguished the various other federal gambling laws stating that these provisions implement a coherent federal policy. They respect the policy choices of the people of each state on the controversial issue of gambling. So again, the Supreme Court affirming essentially all of these different federal laws that they give primacy to the states uh, and, and, and their particular laws. But in the wake of Murphy, which essentially said that, uh, or PASPA, uh, PASPA essentially prohibited states from legalizing sports betting, uh, in all but a handful of grandfathered states, Nevada among them. Uh, and But so with PASPA having been struck down in the wake of Murphy, sports betting has now spread across the country. Some form of sports betting is, has now been legalized in 36 states in the District of Columbia, although some of those states have not yet started up their uh, sports betting markets. They're still drafting their regulations or uh, issuing licenses. But, uh, but we're now up to 36 states in the District of Columbia that have legalized sports betting in the United States. So let's talk a little bit more about sports betting in particular uh, and some of, some of the challenges that sports betting companies are facing. Uh, because of the primacy of state law, uh, it is interstate only. So under the Wire Act, bets and wagers cannot be transmitted across state lines. Um, there are, you have to have servers in each state that receive the wagers. So the wager has to be transmitted uh, from within the state and received in the state. Uh, sports betting companies that are active in very multiple jurisdictions have to deal with 37 different uh, state and tribal laws, uh, at least, and 37 different sports betting apps that are compliant with the local laws. So, these are obviously, if a player comes to Las Vegas 
uh, signs up for an account and goes home to uh, to Iowa, where there's also sports betting, and want to be able to use that account and place sports wagers, they can't use the same account or can't can't directly wager uh, with the Nevada sports book, even if that Nevada sports book happens to have an affiliated company in Iowa. Uh, so what do they do? What do, the, what do these companies do? How do they make it easier for players uh, to have the experience they expect uh, with all of their other apps? Uh, in the app economy, if we can go to the next, uh, the next slide, uh, of course, consumers expect to be able to use their apps wherever they are you know, to have access to all their accounts uh, at all times. So to enforce the legal requirements, the apps must locate the players uh, who are trying to place a wager and reject a wager from individuals who are not within the jurisdiction. And our next speaker on this panel, uh, Ms. Slater, is uh, with GeoComply, and GeoComply is the leading company providing geolocation services to sports betting companies, internet gaming operators. So they help those companies determine where a player is located and make sure that uh, if they're not within the jurisdiction where they're supposed to be to place that wager, that that wager gets rejected. Uh, but this is where the smart techs have to take over. So us lawyers can tell us what the, tell them what the law is, but they have to decide how do they come up with something that uh, satisfies the consumer while still complying with the law? And can they seamlessly switch between loca location compliant apps for the different jurisdictions? So if you sign, if you open your app for Nevada and, and the uh, geolocation software tells you, you know, tells it that you're actually in Iowa, can it then automatically switch to the Iowa app? And so that's one of the challenges that uh, a lot of the companies are currently facing. And for those of you who are having second thoughts, it's not too late. You can still go back and get an engineering degree. Uh, sorry, that goes back to my first, my first uh, job as a law clerk where I was frequently told it was not too late. I could still go back to, to medical school, but, uh, but I have enjoyed, enjoyed being a lawyer and uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a great career for me. Uh, one of the other issues that they uh, need to address or that the sports betting companies need to address is the single wallet. Um, and this is one of the, the big issues in sports betting for the sports betting companies right now. They want to be able to, if you've deposited money again, if you've deposited money in Illinois and you happen to be in Iowa, they want you to be able to use your, your uh, money that you deposited in Illinois. But as we talked about earlier, the Wire Act has that prohibition on transmissions entitling the recipient to money or credit as a result of bets or wagers. So if it's simply a deposit you've made in Illinois and not money that you've won from bets or wagers, uh, that money should be transportable uh, across to another jurisdiction. Um, even if you've, it's been the result of bets or wagers, but has been deposited into your account in that state, then the thing is, is it not now your money that you can do anything you want with, including withdraw it, or transfer it to a sub account in another jurisdiction. So again, one of the issues that the sports betting companies are dealing with is, is how do they make that seamless for the consumer uh, to be able to transfer the money and let it follow them as they move around. So some of the you know, future national legislation, uh, you know, it, are there going to be federal fixes for some of these obstacles? Uh, I don't think so, and, and there are a number of reasons why, but uh, the background in Murphy, the court left open the possibility that Congress could pass its own national legislation addressing sports betting, uh, but it said that where a federal interest is sufficiently strong to cause Congress to legislate, it must do so directly. It may not conscript state governments as its agents. Uh, and then went on later to say the anti-commandeering doctrine does not apply when Congress even-handedly regulates an activity in which both states and private actors engage. So if Congress is going to enact fed, uh, federal legislation, it needs to do so itself uh, for the entire country, not tell the states to either enact or not enact particular legislation. So gambling is still a, a controversial topic, although I think it's becoming less so as it spreads uh, across the country. But Congress has trouble agreeing on legislation involving anything other than the most basic functions of government. Uh, so getting a degree on gambling legislation, I think is extremely unlikely to happen without some significant event that galvanizes public opinion. 
So let's switch from sports betting for a minute and talk a little bit about online casino, poker, and social gaming. There are, I think it's five states now that have some form of uh, on, online casino and online poker. Um, Nevada, Delaware, New Jersey, uh, Michigan, and West Virginia all have uh, online gaming. I may be missing one or two, but there, it has not spread nearly as quickly as, uh, as sports betting has. Uh, in the recent First Circuit decision, New Hampshire Lottery versus Rosen, uh, the First Circuit decided that uh, the Wire Act applies only to race and sports wagering. So it doesn't apply to online casino uh, games, to online poker, or to online lotteries, uh, which is why the New Hampshire Lottery challenged it. Uh, consistent, uh, it's consistent with the decision of the Fifth Circuit that affirmed a Louisiana District Court decision in a case called NRA MasterCard. MasterCard. So, uh, and it's also supported by the structure and, uh, of the statute of the Wire Act and, and the legislative history of the Wire Act. So I clearly believe this was the right decision, but the uh, Department of Justice had taken the position that the Wire Act applied to all forms of gambling, at least most of the Wire Act applied to all forms of gambling uh, in a, an opinion that was dated late 2018, November 2, 2018, but actually issued in 2019. Um, but now we've got two circuit court decisions saying that it applies only to uh, sports, race and sports wagering. Um, I think many companies are feeling more comfortable that the Wire Act does not apply. Um, that, that there's no outright federal prohibition on transmitting non-sports wagers across state lines. However, as we talked about the Illegal Gambling Business Act earlier, it would prohibit the transmission of wagers where those wagers would constitute a violation of state or local law and as mentioned, there are only a handful of states now that have approved online casino games or online poker. Uh, additionally, under UEGA, the intrastate exception we talked about would not apply because it's not wholly within a single state. So you'd have to uh, satisfy the other tests in UEGA to show that it's not unlawful uh, internet gambling. Uh, so that makes it a little more difficult from a payments perspective to make sure that people can deposit and withdraw money, uh, deposit money into and withdraw money from their accounts. So the interstate online gambling uh, though is taking place. It's taking place through a multi-state lottery compact where many of the states with state lotteries have agreed to have participate in certain multi-state large jackpot games. And it's taking place in part through an interstate online gambling compact uh, between Nevada, Delaware, New Jersey, and Michigan. Uh, originally Nevada and Delaware, uh, New Jersey and Michigan uh, agreed to add it later. It's primarily for poker liquidity. I mean, if you want to play poker against other players, you have to have other players to play against. At any time of the day, uh, there has to be a table with, uh, with a game going on. So in smaller jurisdictions, uh, Delaware and Nevada, as I mentioned, were the first two, don't have as much population. Having sufficient liquidity to make sure the players can find a game anytime they want to find a game uh, was difficult within a single state. This compact allows players to play across state line, lines, allows the operators to accept those players from other participating states and to accept wagers from those players. So it increases the pool of players available uh, and allows someone to find a game when they're looking for, for a poker game and find other players to play with. Social gaming is something that's become huge in the last uh, number of years. Uh, so these are games that try to avoid the legal definitions of gambling. Uh, almost all the states define gambling or lottery as involving three elements, uh, prize, chance, and consideration. Uh, the social games attempt to negate one of the elements of the definition of gambling, either by negating chance with uh, certain skill games. And you, you'll see online, if you search around, there are different sites that offer various skill games available where you can wager on, on your own skill. Uh, and most states, uh, if you're simply wagering on your own performance, uh, those are exceptions uh, to the gambling laws of many states. Uh, another way to, to negate one of the uh, elements is to not charge consideration. So if it's a free game or a free sweepstakes. Uh, you know, no purchase necessary is the, of course, the common language in a lot of the sweepstakes and the promotional uh, drawings and things that are available, promotional contests that are available uh, to the public. 
uh, or by not offering prizes with real world value. And this is what the, where we're seeing a, an explosion uh, in the market. Uh, a lot of different slot games and games that are clearly determined by chance and where you can actually, uh, you, can, you can play for free, but you can also uh, pay to um, get additional credits or to buy additional enhancements. Uh, but you win virtual currency that can only be used in the game itself and has no real world value. Uh, but states have different definitions of each of these elements. Uh, on the chance element, some states say that any chance constitutes sufficient chance to make you gambling. Uh, others say that chance has to be a material element, and yet others say it has to be the dominant element. So again, there's different tests in different states. In some states, the right to continue playing with virtual currency may constitute a thing of value. So it may actually constitute a prize uh, and make that particular game uh, gambling. So there have been several major cases filed in the state of Washington under, under Washington's definition uh, of gambling and there have been some large settlements of those class action lawsuits uh, there, which has then led to the filing of additional class action lawsuits. Uh, one of the things we frequently do in our practice is 50 state surveys because state laws are, are uh, primary in the gambling space. We're frequently asked to, to survey different state laws and tell our clients you know, where they may need to make sure that their, their site is not available to uh, offer their games um, to, to residents of that particular state. But there's, as I mentioned, there's recent class action litigation and some of that's been consolidated. There's now multi-district lit litigation against both Google and Apple in the Northern District of California. So that litigation uh, alleges that Google and Apple by hosting some of these apps on their, the App Store and the Android Store are, um, and then receiving a percentage of the revenues from those apps, uh, are engaged or profiting from illegal gambling. And the, the plaintiffs allege there that they are violating the gambling laws of 25 different states. I will say that we, we disagree, but that's uh, that, that they're violating the laws of 25 different states. I think there's actually only a handful of states where it's really problematic or social gaming is really problematic. But nevertheless, there is, there is risk there because it's become a hot topic for new class action litigation. And until those uh, cases are decided on the merits, uh, I don't know that we'll have any clear guidance as to what those uh, state laws require. As I mentioned, the, the cases with some large payouts in Washington state involved settlements. So even those cases were not decided on the merits. Um, there was a Ninth Circuit decision that overturned a motion to dismiss and allowed one of the cases to go forward. And that spooked some of the participants enough to decide they should go ahead and settle those cases. But again, even that, that was on a motion to dismiss, not on, not on the merits of the, of the action itself. So I think there's a, there's a lot of room for interesting developments in this area and, and I'm closely monitoring those, uh, the multi-district litigation to see how those cases come out. Turning to some of the other federal decisions uh, involving gambling, uh, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because I think this these sort of reflect uh, what I think is some movement in 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 the laws related to gambling. Um, the first case is Posadas de Puerto Rico Associates versus Tourism Company of Puerto Rico. This involved advertising restrictions. Essentially, Puerto Rico legalized casino gambling, but prohibited advertising that gambling. Uh, and in later interpretations said those restrictions only applied to advertising to locals. You couldn't advertise uh, gambling to locals. So and here's a the significant quote from the, uh, from the decision. This was a decision authored by Justice Rehnquist, at that time, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, and you know, the plaintiffs in that case uh, argued that uh, the First Amendment, that once Puerto Rico legalized gambling, the First Amendment allowed them to, to advertise that even though it was commercial speech, they had a right to commercial speech. Uh, the court there disagreed saying that it was precisely because the government could have enacted a wholesale prohibition of the underlying conduct 
that it is permissible for the government to take the less intrusive step of allowing the conduct but reducing the demand through restrictions on advertising. However, uh, 13 years later, this was a 1986 case, 13 years later uh, in Greater New Orleans Broadcasting, which is the next slide, Association versus United States, uh, the court there, the Supreme Court struck down 18 U.S.C. 1304, which prohibited broadcasting advertising for commercial casinos. Uh, the lower courts had relied on the decision in Posadas. Uh, and they said the majority relied heavily on our decision in, in Posadas and endorsed the theory that because gambling is a category of vice activity, that can be banned altogether. Advertising of gambling can lay no greater claim on constitutional protection than the underlying activity. Uh, the Supreme Court there said the flaw in the government's case is more fundamental. The operation of Section 1304 and its attendant regulatory regime is so pierced by exemptions and inconsistencies that the government cannot hope to exonerate it. So uh, in particular, 1304 had exceptions for government-owned gambling, including tribal casinos, uh, state lotteries, uh, exemptions for charitable and ancillary gambling. Uh, and so the Supreme Court there said in, under those circumstances that if there was a coherent policy prohibiting advertising, it couldn't be a, a policy that had numerous exceptions to it. Otherwise, that policy was not coherent and there wasn't a rational basis for, um, for the prohibition on advertising uh, that was an, an issue in, in the Greater New Orleans case. So you can see the change in attitudes reflected in the law. I mean, uh, the fact that the states had the right to ban gambling altogether wasn't enough to uh, allow federal restriction on restrictions on advertising, uh, where again they otherwise met the central Hudson test of being uh, uh, they're not misleading and about a, you know about a permissible or legal product. Uh, so it's interesting to note that from 1986 when Posadas was decided to uh, 1999, when Greater New Orleans was decided, this was a time of rapid expansion of gaming industry with uh, riverboat casinos approved in a number of states, including uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, Illinois and Iowa, all had approved uh, riverboat casinos during this time period. So just a, this kind of leads me to the topic of where does gaming law go from here? And I think one of the things that, uh, we should look at as uh, attitudes continue to change. And if we can go ahead and add a couple more slides. Uh, so will the spread of legal gaming change gaming laws? I mentioned, I think to some extent, the spread of riverboat casinos did change attitudes about gaming and gaming advertising. Uh, and I think the continued spread and now the spread of sports betting, as I mentioned 37 different US jurisdictions now, actually 38 Puerto Rico has now legalized uh, sports betting as well. Um, I think attitudes will continue to change. Uh, you're gonna have increased participation uh, in the gaming industry by major companies from other industries. We're already seeing uh, Google uh, providing cloud services, for example, to uh, online gaming, sports betting companies and, and other gaming companies. Uh, having a number of the major technology companies come into the uh, gaming space, uh, offering banking and payments, uh, solutions. So I, I think they, those companies bring with them obviously certain political clout, but also uh, ways of doing business that were not hindered by uh, gaming regulatory regimes in, in the various states. So I think there will be subtle but uh, gradual pushes for uh, a loosening of some of the restrictions that make it difficult for some of the companies to, to do business across state lines. One of the other things that I think uh, is an interesting question, and, and it would take much longer to delve into than I have here, but is, is the question of due process. Uh, you know, due process requires uh, a notice and an opportunity to be heard uh, when you are denied a license for a useful or common occupation of life. Um, and historically, many of the gaming cases have said that gambling is not a useful or common occupation of life and have denied uh, any particular due process rights other than what's set out in the, in the, in the state law. I and mean, in some of the state laws are very um, 
strong. For example, Nevada law allows denial of a license for any cause deemed reasonable uh, by the regulator. Now that they usually have much better cause than that, but the statute itself is pretty broad. Um, and I think it may have especially impacts on occupational licensing. Many gaming employees are required to be licensed in different states. And I think uh, they will have certain due process rights that are expanded and we'll see them become more equivalent to the due process rights that uh, employees have in other, uh, other professions and uh, with other licensing boards. And so I, I think that's gonna be an area to watch as we go forward with potential changes to gaming, to gaming law. With that, I'll wrap it up because I know I need to leave some time for Ms. Slater and, uh, and for questions. Thank you for, your, for uh, listening. Thanks, Attorney Sure. I now want to introduce our final panelist, Ms. Lindsay Slater. She's the Managing Director of Gaming at GeoComply. She joined the company in its infancy in 2012, serving in various operational roles, most recently as Vice President of the Regulatory Affairs Division. Over the last decade, she's provided expert testimony on geolocation technologies and regulatory compliance at several state and federal hearings, and is frequently a public speaker an industry contributor on these topics. Prior to GeoComply, she, her background was in technical compliance where she spent five years in business development and marketing at the leading compliance testing companies, GLI and TST, where she serviced both the iGaming and land-based markets. Ms. Slater. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm just gonna share my screen here. All right, so um, I, I thank you to my two fellow panelists that pretty much laid out the groundwork for, for everything that I wanted to talk about today. Um, Ms. Homer, you obviously introduced the idea of, I mean, the, the impacts of, of jurisdiction and law and uh, really the, um, the, the introduction of, of the internet to gaming that's brought us to where we are today. Um, and Mr. Shearer, thank you for your complete background. I had a slide or two about some of the, the laws and regulations that affect something like, like geolocation for online gaming. Now everybody's fully briefed. Um, I'm going to do a couple different things. I've got a few different slides. I've got some, some fun heat maps and things like that. And then I have a little bit of a live map demo that I think will um, round out the conversation that we've had to put it into context of what, what things look like in real life today, um, particularly in America with, with um, regulated sports betting markets and online casino and, and other forms of gaming. Um, so here's a little bit of a, a fun fact heat map on, on Vermont. Um, and this is all data that's based on um, geolocation technology that's built into today's regulated um, online gaming sites. Um, <clears throat> so this is Joe Compliance data that we've pulled. I'm just thinking about Vermont though, because the, the, there is no um, structure currently for legalized online sports betting or online casino or poker, for example. Um, but there's still you know, active technology that needs to exist to, to block um, any such activity from occurring. Um, so this just shows you for the first you know, two to three weeks of September um, that there were almost 12,000 different attempts to access predominantly New York sports books from, from Vermont, um, but also of neighboring states that have um, legalized uh, online activity, even, even up in, uh, in, in Canada and Ontario. So this comes from about 2,300 different uh, user accounts and gives you a little bit of an idea of, of what happens even in a place where there is no um, structure to have legal traffic occurring online. There, there's still a facility required to block it. Um, so thinking about the idea of geolocation, what is it actually used for? It's, it's a really tiny little piece of um, an online gaming system, for example, but still it's, it's, uh, it's purpose is quite key. Um, an, an online gaming operator might use it to obviously comply with any federal or regional laws that may exist. Um, having this kind of technology is also going to be required by their banks um, that are going to help facilitate the, the actual deposits, the transactions of, of an online gaming business. 
um, as well as the payment processors that are going to be involved in that kind of the the compliance checklist that they may be looking for, along with you know ensuring that the the age and identity of the user has been verified, uh, and and that there are a, a, a number of other uh, controls and and internal procedures that are that are in place as part of a, a legal online gaming business. So. So sure, obviously ran through a whole bunch of, of uh, different legal um, precedents that need to be considered. Um, I just I wanted to draw your attention to the orange puzzle piece up in the top left here because um, there's gaming laws and then there's also other laws that affect more of the financial side. This is the Bank Secrecy Act, um, any kind of regulations that pertain to FinCEN, money laundering, um, FDIC, things that are more related, again, to, to the banking and the, the monetary controls that ultimately feed through to, um, you know, to, to UGA or to the Wire Act, um, and, and ultimately this idea of, of how money and gaming activity are, are controlled um, on a on a state-by-state -state basis and to ensure that these things aren't occurring across state lines. So um, when we think about a federal law like UGA, it obviously is prohibiting interstate wagering. So this means that the wager must be occurring within a single state that and not across state lines, um, that that individual state has obviously um, has the, the legislation in place um, to facilitate it with inside the borders of their particular jurisdiction. And then, um, as I've mentioned before, these, you know, there's state laws and regulations also need to include things like age and location um, verification to ensure that, that minors don't have access and that ultimately the, the people that are allowed to access wagering um, are indeed within the borders of, of that state, but, but also in other use cases like tribal use cases, it, it may not actually be a state, it could be some other zone. Um, and then looking at the Wire Act, obviously the uh, again there's there's really the same concept, um, but also um, the Miss Homer had, had mentioned the the idea of where the betting server is and and the the permission to to wager does it does it rely on where they are um, within that area? Can it go beyond that? Um, Typically, when you're thinking about the geolocation technology, the server location is one thing and to be determined by uh, the laws that govern the jurisdiction that you're in, but um, ultimately that, that the person needs to be in a particular place. So the geolocation tech is designed to confirm where that is. And then layered into that, there's also going to be a number of state-specific technical requirements as well that dictate all the little details of, of how something like a geolocation system is, is supposed to work. Um, so the way that companies like, like GeoComply have uh, um, operated in this space almost nine years now, um, New Jersey went online with online casino and poker in November, 2013. So I mean, when we started as a company, there really wasn't any particular use case of regulated online gaming in the states. Um, but but obviously, with the the intention that one would be coming, and of course, state by state, things have rolled out not only for online casino and poker, but sports betting and, and other gaming products um, that have been mentioned today, like you know, skill based gaming and and um, other verticals that that may have you know. Few, fewer legal implications or different legal implications. Um, but for for a company like GeoComply, we started out thinking, well, we just have to build this technology that fits this very specific legal need, make sure nobody gets shut down, maintains the integrity of this idea of online gaming. And uh, and then everybody will ha be happy. Um, and then what we realized is there's actually a few different things happening. Obviously, Ensuring that an operator is complying with with federal and state law is one thing, um, but then there's also the impact on the user funnel. And you know, if you're following the law, but the the experience for the user is a train wreck, so that nobody can even uh, bet in the first place. Um, there's lots of other things to consider. So a lot of what we do is actually ensuring that 
or figuring out how an operator can still comply with regulations, but still um, enable eligible users to proceed through the gaming funnel and, and ultimately place their bet. So I thought I would give you a little bit of a, a show and tell um, and also explain a couple of use cases. Um, you know, when we started this almost a decade ago, it was New Jersey. And um, this is a live map of geolocation checks that my company's um, system is processing right now. So this is online casino, poker, sports betting um, happening in New Jersey right now. And, you know, there are states like New York didn't have sports betting yet. So the focus was on well, what's happening right down on the banks of the Hudson River? And is there some way that you can pinpoint with lots of accuracy where somebody is? Um, because there's lots of people commuting back and forth here. And indeed, you need to be able to help somebody on this pier place that bet because they are where they're supposed to be, um, but ensure that you cut them off by the time they they hop on the train on the path and, and scoot over to Manhattan. Um, and so this has really evolved. Oh, someone's right on the bridge. Um, to something more like some much more complicated use cases. Um, I know we're really short on time, so um, please feel free to interrupt me as the minutes or seconds decrease here. <laughs> but um, this is what's happening in a place like Arizona right now, where there are um, there's obviously the requirement to contain people um, who are betting inside. The state lines of Arizona, but then you also have the requirement to um, geofence out any of the tribal reservation lands um, in in the state as well. So that's where you see the red um, shaded areas are those exclusion zones. Um, and so the technology that goes into this has to filter out all the people that are, for example, right here in the greater Phoenix area and um, ensure that these systems also don't allow betting in the exclusion zones. That being said, some of these exclusion zones are actually inclusion areas for other betting apps that might be run by a tribe, and then it needs to be contained all within their own region. So um, kind of like pieces of a puzzle, sometimes you've got isolated pockets of, of a, a mobile betting app that might be existing just within one of these areas um, right alongside, uh, you know, a, a wider scale commercial um, state regulated market. And then this is an, a, a similar use case for Louisiana. Um, when when Louisiana decided to regulate sports betting, um, there were some parishes that did not opt into that. And so as a result, there's, I believe, nine or 10 here that need to have sports betting excluded from uh, an online gaming system by, by any operator that, that might offer an app. Um, in addition to that, there's also some little red specks that you might see here. And these are tribal reservations too um, that need to be excluded um, per the requirements in the in the state and, and the federal laws that that affect that. Um, and sorry, one thing I didn't explain that the the colors obviously the the red pins are um, users who do not qualify to to bed um, either because they're in an area an exclusion zone like this one up here, or uh, they may be ineligible for other reasons, like they show signs of faking their location, they're, they're, they're spoofing where they are, um, and we cannot confirm that they're they're eligible to play. The other colors just signify the type of device the user's on. So um, green are Android phones and tablets, white pins are iPhones and iPads, and then there's a few blue in there um, that represent PC and Mac computers. The majority of, of at least sports betting, though, is occurring on, on mobile devices and not on desktop. Um, if anyone is interested in, in, in any other mashups of these particular maps, I, I do have other ones for places like New York or Connecticut that, that I could show you. Okay. Um, so just got a couple more things to say. Hopefully, how, how are we on, on time? Should I wrap it up or should I spend a couple of more minutes? 
you can certainly spend a few more minutes. We, uh, we have plenty of time. Okay, great. Um, so I, I showed you what some of those use cases look like with the geolocation technology, fencing out particular zones and special exemptions that, that might exist in regulations or laws. Um, this is another example of one in Oregon where um, you have a, a, a market with a, a single gaming operator servicing sports betting on the internet. Um, however, they don't have the right to do so um, on, on any tribal reservations. I believe there's eight or nine different tribes in the state of Oregon, but it actually amounts to two to 300 different pockets of land um, that look like a patchwork, kind of like this, uh, this, this purple um, uh, patchwork that you see here. Um, that has to be, you know, superimposed and cut out all the little tiny pieces of of the puzzle that you see in the background. So this is what it looks like uh, in in real time. And then this idea of cutting out little zones also lends itself really well, not only to um, how you you might set up a legal framework for for an a mobile sports betting app, for example, but also the way that an operator might control um, things like fraud. Um, so a lot of the geolocation data that we're collecting in our system at GeoComply is also really, really amazingly powerful for law enforcement to understand, um, you know, as they piece together the the who, what, where, of uh, any kind of financial crime that might occur with things like online sports betting, uh, they may leverage the data that we're collecting. Um, once it's recognized that, hey, there's some sort of a, a fraud ring that involves identity theft or promotional abuse from a particular location, we can actually drop a little, like this red square here, a blanket over a, a house or, or really any kind of area that you might be able to define on a map and block um, any any traffic from coming there to help thwart that that fraud. Um, and then the same function can be used to make really small betting zones like you have in Washington, D.C., where um, there's some mobile apps that only function inside a particular sports betting arena. Um, there's, there's four different ones in Washington, D.C., for example. You can draw a little zone right around the building and ensure that betting is only happening there. So it's it's pretty powerful and a small and, and a much larger scale. And then while all of this data is collected when you're locating a user, um, we can also see what types of things might a user try to fake where they are. Um, because to ensure that that the geolocation technology is, is reasonably designed, I think is the wording that's used in UGEA. Um, you still need to do a pretty basic check of, well, hey, are they running some sort of app that can spoof your, uh, your, your GPS signal on your phone? Um, how might someone have tampered with their device to make it look like they are somewhere where you can legally bet when actually they're not? So there's literally thousands and thousands of different tools and, and spoofing manipulations you can use on, on every type of device out there. Um, and so geolocation technology is designed to, to identify when these things are being used and, and block users who ultimately just don't qualify because they're not in the right place. Um, quite often, they may also be involved in things like like fraud, and they're trying to conceal where they are, conceal what they're doing. Um, and this, this is... Um, can be a, a tip off for that as well. Um, so of all these things that I, I have mentioned, the little breadcrumbs that are found in the data when you locate a user lends itself really well to law enforcement. Um, and uh, GeoComply collaborates quite closely with law enforcement to identify you know, payment fraud, identity, uh, identity theft, bonus abuse, credit card fraud, um, money laundering, and and you know more mild things like proxy betting, where you just have somebody that's logging in uh, from California into their they call a friend in some other state that's got uh, regulated sports betting and ask them to submit their betting slip. Um, depending on you know what the what to to what extent 
this uh, something like proxy betting is is called out in in state regulations along with federal ones. This type of thing still technically is a crime, um, and every state manages that that scenario differently. Um, but when it gets into the weeds of law enforcement, and this is my last slide, uh, they'll use geolocation data to piece together uh, the the activities of of criminals. So this little web that you see is um, um, all the 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 orange circles here. These are devices, so they could be computers or phones. And then you know, if if I have a phone, but I've logged into fifty or maybe even a hundred different accounts from that one phone. You know, that, that that doesn't make sense. That's there's there's no way that anyone would ever share their phone with 50 different people. Clearly, it's someone that's stolen a list of identities and they're cycling through them, logging into all of them on their phone. Um, so this is a pretty hallmark characteristic of what a fraud ring looks like. Um, and so you can use geolocation data to map out what a fraud ring may look like, um, ultimately find locations of a suspect. And, and this type of data is used from discovery all the way through to, to prosecution of, of some sort of a fraud case that might be involved in gambling. So I can tell you, um, uh, I, I didn't expect when I got involved in, in geolocation 10 years ago for the purposes of uh, you know, U.S. gaming compliance that I would ever be talking about uh, some sort of a, a fraud ring with law enforcement, but um, that that's what the demands of this type of data is uh, is driving today. So I uh, that's that's um, the extent of my my presentation. I, I hope that this gives you a little bit of of context into the the legal um, descriptions and, and frameworks that were shared by my fellow panelists. Thank you so much, Ms. Slater. I'd be interested in using that technology to find out who's online gaming during my class. <laughs> um, now we're at the point of the panel where I'm gonna invite questions from the audience. So you can feel free to ask questions and I have a few that have been pre-submitted. Um, I know we're gonna lose one of our panelists first. So I'm gonna start with a question for her while we're getting warmed up. And because we have so many students in the audience, um, Ms. Homer, I was wondering if you could tell the students a little bit about how you got in to your career path and, and in particular, what skills were most important to you in starting your own law firm? Oh, gosh, great question. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that I grew up knowing I was going to be a lawyer someday. And I think I did that, you know, because my, um, you know, my father was a lawyer and uh, I'm a member of the Osage Nation. And uh, lawyers were not very popular. Outside lawyers were not very popular. So every Osage that had any kind of propensity or hopefulness that they might become a lawyer uh, and serve the people uh, was encouraged to do that. And uh, so I fell for that and uh, grew up with this idea that um, I could be a lawyer and I could make sure that uh, my people were treated justly and fairly. And, uh, you know, that the, the, the next pathway to the protection of tribal rights is through the law. And so I have dedicated my career. I think I had a short stint as an assistant district attorney. Um, but I think that's one of the only places in my career um, that I was uh, not directly involved in, um, in Indian law with tribes, uh, with tribal issues, even at the Justice Department, my role there was to increase the prosecution of crimes against Indian children in Indian country. And so I did that. Um, you know, I've worked for tribal state and federal government. So the last thing to do was to hang my shingle out and practice law. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years, um, mostly as counsel to tribal gaming regulators, but I am counsel to uh, some tribal gaming enterprises as well. And so after my stint at the NIGC, the rest of my career, you know, was spent in um, um, private practice. I've been doing it ever since. I love it. I, if I look back on starting it, I was crazy. I had like $25,000 in the bank and that was it. And I hung my shingle out in downtown DC, hired, you know, hired a lawyer, you know, hired a staff. And uh, somehow by the grace of God, I figure it all worked out. 
Thanks, I'll stick with you because I know you have to leave, but thank you for that advice for our students. My next question is really about relationships and how do you want the relationship between gaming and Native American nations to develop? Are there any efforts currently in place to promote this relationship? You know, it is very, um, God, you know, I could talk on this subject matter of tribal state relations for a hundred years um, because of course, you know, what I do in gaming uh, always involves tribal state relationships. And I'm from Oklahoma and uh, we've recently uh, experienced a very poor relationship with our governor. Um, you know, and I had been really hopeful. I really irritated, I think, a tribal chairman one time. I was on a panel at our sovereignty symposium, which is sponsored by the Oklahoma Supreme Court annually, uh, to talk about tribal state legal issues. Um, and uh, I had said, you know, um, I anticipate that our tribal state relation will, will improve with this gaming compact because now the state of Oklahoma has a vested interest in our success which they never had before, right? And, you know, I, I encourage everybody to think about that statement. You know, once the state has an interest in our success, instead of fighting with us and challenging us with our jurisdiction and, and uh, kind of fussing over who gets to regulate this or regulate that, that, you know, that, that we come together through these compacts and iron out these issues in a way that's mutually beneficial. You know, and I deeply, believe that that's the way to go. However, politics is like the weather. It changes. There are shifting tides. There are heavy winds that can, can blow in and the tribal state relationship can become uh, very contentious, you know, very, very contentious. Um, so, um, you know, working these things out, you know, through, you know, through arbitration, or litigation, or ideally coming together and putting it down in writing. I remember once I was working with my tribe um, and um, we have a grocery store and we got into a fuss about who was going to inspect that grocery store, right? And we were telling the state or the state was coming in and the tribe was saying, no, this is our jurisdiction, not your jurisdiction. You know, and we got into this big kind of back and forth and somebody dragged me into the fight. The chief dragged me into the fight. And, uh, you know, I said, you know what I think we should do? I think we should hire you state agency and pay you some money and have you and have you come in and perform the inspection because we didn't have an inspector. We didn't have a food inspector. So you come in and you perform that, but you do that under an intergovernmental agreement with us under our authority. So if there's gonna be any enforcement, it's not state enforcement, it's tribal enforcement. And you know what the, you know, you know what the state health department said? Okay, we can do that. And so we started doing that with everything. Uh, Osage County, Oklahoma does not have its own inspectors, building inspectors, plumbing inspectors, and doesn't even have a health department like that. Um, so what did we do? You know, we're building a big giant casino. And you know what, when you're building a big giant casino, you want it to be done right, right? You want it inspected. You want standards that apply to it. You know, all, all of those things are very important. Uh, and so what we did is we went to the next county over, Washington County, and we did an intergovernmental agreement with them to come in and be our building inspector and our plumbing inspector. And, and, you know, and they did a great job. We were happy. They were happy. There are ways that we can make these relationships work and make everybody happy. But we've got to overcome the politics. We can't just dislike each other just because. Right. We got we we're all a part of the American political framework. You know, they don't teach us that in ninth grade when we take civics, but our constitution sets up this framework that includes tribal, state, and federal government. And we are a part of the political framework, the political family of this nation. And so working those relationships out is something that we just have to figure out how to do. And that includes, so do the states, they have to work with us. And hopefully, you know, hopefully just as the winds come up, the winds dissipate and the sunshine comes back out. And so 
that's what I look forward to. And I really hate to run, but I, I have a, another um, a client matter that has come up that I, I have to get to. Well, on behalf of the Law Review and the students of Vermont Law School, let me thank you for your sharing your perspective and knowledge with us. And uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, now I'd like to ask you, Mr. Scherr, if assuming our students don't run off to medical school or engineering school, can you share a little bit about your career history? How'd you get into gaming law? And, and what would you say to students that are interested in following another a, a similar path? Well, I'm, I'm from uh, Nevada originally. I'm from, uh, as I like to say, a small town in Nevada called Las Vegas. Uh, because when I was born there many years ago, it was actually a whole lot smaller. Um, but so I'd grown up there. My dad had worked in casinos uh, as I grew up. Um, I'd gone away to college uh, on the East Coast and then to law school on the West Coast and returned home to Nevada and was working actually as a labor and employment lawyer in a small firm. But uh, working with one of my colleagues, his, uh, his wife worked in the attorney general's office um, uh, in, and in the gaming division of the attorney general's office that represented the Nevada Gaming Control Board and the Nevada Gaming Commission. And they had a case pending at the time um, involving um, whether uh, union officials who represented gaming employees could be required to undergo background checks by the gaming regulators because uh, there was a regulation that required that and the culinary union was challenging that particular regulation. So the deputy was handling that litigation left and uh, they decided they needed somebody who knew something about labor law because obviously the argument by the union was that it was preempted by the National Labor Relations Act. And uh, she talked me into going to join the attorney general's office. And so that's how I got my start in gaming law. Uh, went there to, to uh, help them with their, their labor law related issues, but learned gaming law along the way. Um, and, you know, I, I've enjoyed it. And I think uh, with the spread of gaming now across the country, I do think it's a good field. And there's a lot of opportunity in it for, because um, it is a very heavily regulated industry. Um, I went to a doctor recently who told me that her, uh, her husband works for International Game Technology, one of the big slot machine manufacturers. He had previously, he's got a biomed biomedical engineering degree he had previously worked for one of the uh, companies that made brain implants and told her that uh, slot machines are more heavily regulated than brain implants are. So, uh, so I mean, there is a lot of need for, for legal and compliance help uh, in, in the gaming space and with it spreading across the country, I think it is a, a, certainly a field that uh, has some opportunity in it. Thank you. And same question to you, Ms. Slater. How did you get into your field? Uh, good question. I uh, I got my first go job in the gaming industry 15 years ago that was uh, at an organization involved in technical compliance. Uh, and, and then uh, that led me to, to 10 years ago joining GeoComply. So I knew nothing about the idea of geolocation, but more so the idea of um, you know, regulatory compliance for, for, for gaming and you know, how things... Uh, like uh, tech and law intercede is, is something that I now think about a lot more than I ever thought I would. I'm going to stay with you for a, another question, uh, Ms. Slater. Can you tell us some of the drawbacks and challenges um, about giving testimony about geolocation technology and regulatory compliance when, when it's constantly evolving? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, you know, the, the, the map, the live map that I showed everyone today, I find is often the most effective way of doing something like going to a hearing and trying to describe, along with a bunch of other people, very abstract things um, about how online gaming and uh, virtual businesses are existing to often a set of lawmakers who may actually not be familiar with the internet or technology whatsoever. And then you can show them a little map with some pins falling and a picture is worth a thousand words. So I would say one of the greatest challenges of, uh, of, of testimony is talking about yeah, abstract ideas to an unfamiliar audience, um, particularly when 
you're you're trying to describe a technology to meet a legal need uh, to non-technical people. I'm a non-technical person, so if it makes sense to me, my hope is that it's going to make sense to other people. And and so I found that's been a very effective of way of communicating something complicated to a much wider audience. Um, another challenge is that uh, organization like GeoComply, we never really want to put ourselves in the shoes of being a proponent or opponent of particular legislation, because at the end of the day, just like the little map that I showed everybody of, um, you know, attempts to bed in Vermont, regardless of what a, a state, for example, elects to do to allow uh, online gaming to occur or to not occur, thing, the technology still has to exist either way, right? It's going to block it or it's going to enable it and, and really getting muddled into the, the the will of the state. And and I guess the, the political swings of that is something that I try to avoid to be as objective as possible from a technical sense. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sher, you did a great job explaining to us the regulations and the federal law that's out there um, relevant to these issues. But we now wanna know, in your opinion, should sports betting be regulated at the federal level or should it continue to be left up to the states? Do you foresee any federal oversight coming in given the increasing legislation of sports betting? You know, I, I don't see uh, federal oversight coming in uh, in the near term, certainly, because I think the states have a vested interest in the particular way that they are regulating. And they have every state, if, you know, there's a lot of common provisions in the different state laws, but there are also some unique provisions in, in different state laws based on their unique uh, public policy concerns or the way that they've balanced their public policy concerns, whether it's advertising, uh, problem gambling uh, issues, uh, you know, what, what types of events can be wagered on? You know, some states, for example, prohibit wagers on in-state uh, universities uh, when, the, when they're playing, uh, but they allow wagering on other college sports. Um, some prohibit wagering on college sports altogether. Some prohibit wagering on uh, the performance of an individual athlete in a college game. So that's the way they've balanced it and uh, the, the, con the competing interests and concerns. So I think with 36 different states now, each of which has senators in the Senate, I don't expect to see um, them to agree to federal oversight, certainly if it means the federal government is going to be taking a percentage of the revenue. Uh, I think Ms. Homer uh, hit the nail on the head when she talked about kind of the sharing of revenue and, and, and having a, an interest in success. Um, but I do think the one thing that could change that is if there were a national scandal of some type involving gambling that caused such an outcry among the public that the Congress felt that they had to act and it would galvanize them to act. And then we could see some kind of federal oversight in that case. What would such a scandal look like? Uh, you know, it, one of the things, one of the benefits of legal sports betting is that all, all the different reports, just as Ms. Slater talked about the, the ability to help law enforcement, the sports betting operators, if they see a pattern of, of betting on a particular event that is unusual, they can report that to the league or to law enforcement authorities. It actually helps uh, in tracking down those who might be involved in some kind of match fixing, for example. Um, but sort of, but there have been match fixing scandals that have occurred over the years. Um, I, I think they're less likely now with the technology we have, but, but not impossible. And so if there were a, a major match fixing scandal that the um, sports betting companies either failed to report or failed to detect, uh, and there was some way that they could have, especially, uh, or arguments that are made that they could have or should have detected it, um, I think that's the kind of scandal we might see, or if there was, uh, you know, a, a pattern of taking advantage of consumers or taking advantage of, of players who have a, uh, a, who are problem gamblers. Uh, I think that could be one of the situations where you might see some kind of a scandal as well. Thank you. Ms. Slater, some have commented that without GeoComply's work on securing geolocation technology, there would be no sports betting industry in the US. What do you think about that? I think that is pretty accurate, actually. Um, like I said, there's uh, 
it's such a tiny little piece of an online gaming system, but ultimately no bed is placed if you can't verify where somebody is. So for, for a company like GeoComply, we're under uh, an imme immense amount of pressure and something like, you know, week one of the opening of the NFL football season, you've got every betting transaction in America coming through our servers. It's a little bit of pressure on our IT infrastructure, <laughs> but uh, I, I guess maybe if you if you remove it or our systems were down, it goes, goes to show, yeah, how, how that statement can be quite true. Thank you. Mr. Sher, can you tell us about a difficult issue you faced while serving on the Nevada Gaming Control Board? Oh, there were many. Um, the, the toughest ones probably in terms of just personally were probably, again, I mentioned occupational licensing. You know, every gaming employee in Nevada has to be registered. And if they, depending on their background, if they've committed certain crimes, um, they can there can be an objection to their registration. If that, if it's objected to, they can't work in the gaming industry. In Nevada, obviously, a lot of employment is tied into the gaming industry. So if you can't work in the gaming industry, that significantly curtails your, um, your opportunities. And so it's always difficult to, to weigh um, how serious the crime was, how long it's been, have they been rehabilitated, you know, should they be given another opportunity. And a lot of times those were the most difficult decisions uh, to make. Um, you know, I, I tend to believe everybody deserves a second chance, but obviously if you start to see a, a pattern of behavior, then you know, you've got to worry also about what the, you know, about the industry and uh, protecting the industry, protecting the state, um, and it's, especially with gaming, because it's sort of, of course, historically, Nevada started out uh, with organized crime running a lot of, of the, the gambling in the state. And a lot of the regulation has been about trying to get that criminal element out of, uh, out of the gaming industry. So you've got to kind of balance those competing, uh, you know, interests of trying to make sure that people have an opportunity to be employed and earn a living, um, but also that they're not uh, bringing that criminal element back into the gaming industry that we worked so hard to get out of the industry. We're just about out of time, but I wanted to invite both of you to just give some parting advice for our students interested in these issues um, or anything else that you wanted to say to wrap up um, what we've learned today. So we'll start with you, Ms. Slater. Oh, man. Um, well, I would say that uh, at case in point, things like geolocation and, and any kind of technology can drastically affect what uh, an online casino business can can look like, but also creates lots of innovative opportunities. So I would say that um, as much as, as uh, we're going to be governed by laws that perhaps were created 50 years ago, like the Wire Act, um, and you know the, the interpretation of them will continue to evolve along with the technology. So I would say watch what the new technical innovators are doing because they may continue to challenge um, or, or change the, um, the, the, you know, the, the legal um, framework for what happens in the gaming industry. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Yeah, I would build on, on that as well, because I think obviously keeping track of the technology is going to be critical in this industry. It's going to be a very high tech industry going forward into the future, but also understanding the regulatory framework. Uh, and that may mean, um, you know, starting out with a regulator uh, rather than in the private sector. But uh, I think the Slater started with a quasi regulator, one of the test labs that is uh, approved by the regulators to um, you know, I think that's, if I understood correctly, that's how she got into the gaming industry. And, uh, you know, I started out in the attorney general's office uh, as counsel to the regulators and, and kind of un learned that mindset, learned what was important uh, to them, learned to balance those uh, regulatory objectives with commercial objectives. Because if you can't find the balance between the two, uh, it's not going to, you're not going to be successful. Well, thanks to you both for being so generous with your time today. And we really, really appreciate it. 
Um, and now I would like to maybe pass things over to Elsa, but also to tell you that lunch is now at 12.30 and we'll reconvene back at 1.30 for our keynote speaker, Tom Parker. And what did I miss, Elsa, anything? No, oh, that's exactly what I came here to say. Thank you so much um, to both of you, as well as Ms. Homer, who I know has already left. And that, yes, we are taking a one hour break and we will be back at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
much. I am really honored today to introduce <laughs> you our keynote speaker, Tom Parker, who maybe has the coolest bio of anyone <laughs> that I've ever introduced before. <laughs> uh, and he's reporting to you today from Cairo, which perhaps I'll tell you a little bit about. But I wanted to introduce, introduce you to Mr. Parker, who spent 24 years as a special agent and the deputy chief of the Los Angeles field office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and retired at the rank of assistant special agent in charge in the FBI's second largest office. Prior to this assignment, he served in the Houston, St. Louis, Las Vegas, and Minneapolis FBI offices. He also served twice at FBI headquarters in Washington, DC, first as public affairs manager and speechwriter for the FBI director, and second as chief of the strategic planning committee for the criminal investigative decision of the FBI. In the field, Tom specialized in investigations of organized crime, official corruption, and violent crimes, including international kidnappings, airline skyjackings, and domestic terrorist organizations, among other areas of FBI jurisdiction. During his investigative career, Tom initiated and conducted the investigation of the mafia and their hidden control of several Las Vegas casinos, which was depicted in the movie Casino with Robert De Niro and Sharon Stone. In that case, the entire leadership of the mafia families in Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit were convicted of racketeering, and the case broke the stranglehold of the mob on Las Vegas. He also posed undercover as the co-pilot of a skyjacked airliner, and while on the aircraft after it was airborne, was instrumental in the capture of the skyjacker and the ultimate safe release of the passengers. While in his leadership position in the Los Angeles FBI office, Tom also led his agents in various major international narcotics trafficking investigations, resulting in the seizure of large shipments of illicit drugs destined for the streets of American cities and the capture and conviction of numerous leaders and members of various drug trafficking cartels. He also investigated and convicted the Speaker of the Missouri State House of Representatives and led his FBI teams in the investigation and conviction of several other high-level government figures on bribery and corruption charges from their time in office. He received over 20 personal commendations from the FBI director for valor, significant arrests of violent federal fugitives, and his management achievements in other major FBI cases. Since his retirement, he has been a consultant to major law firms and corporations around the world on complex criminal justice matters, including international child kidnapping, major white collar crimes, international terrorism, Russian organized crime, terrorist attacks on passenger ships, and political murders and kidnappings. He is also a former fire and police commissioner for the city of Santa Barbara and a past chairman for the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission for the Santa Barbara County Superior Court. I wanna to welcome Tom to Vermont Law and Graduate School and thank Vermont Law Review for bringing him to speak with us today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dean, for that, uh, that nice introduction there. It's been so long since I retired, I'd forgotten quite a bit of that, <laughs> but thank you. I, uh, I just somehow reduced my, uh, my picture here. I hope you can still see me. There it is. It's back now. Um, and thank you to Elsa and Madison for the invitation to participate in this uh, today. Um, as uh, the Dean mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm currently in Cairo, Egypt. I've been here for six weeks uh, at the request of the FBI uh, on an international kidnapping case where three young American children were kidnapped uh, almost a year ago and brought to Egypt by their uh, Egyptian father, non-U.S. citizen, who uh, had lost all of his parental rights over domestic violence and other uh, things that fathers should not engage in. Uh, unfortunately, the international treaties between the U.S. and Egypt did not provide any avenue, really, for the FBI or any American law enforcement agencies to come over and uh, investigate the matter, try to locate the kids, and, and also try to recover them. Uh, because I had some experience in this area, uh, I uh, uh, was asked to assist the family and to assist the FBI, really, as a private citizen. And uh, I've been here six weeks now directly negotiating with the uh, the kidnapper father and uh, i won't get into all the details of that it's been one of the more interesting negotiating uh, episodes i've ever been involved with but um the um we've had some some recent breakthroughs in the case just in the last few days and quite frankly had we not had those i probably wouldn't be able to participate in this tonight because it's been a very active uh, uh investigation uh 
What I'd like to do with my time with you, uh, I'll keep saying this evening because it is evening here, uh, but uh, what I'd like to do is to, to give you a bit of a kind of an informal capstone uh, for the information that I think you've been receiving today from the other participants in, uh, in this seminar. And uh, it, it, it goes back and, and falls back on my own history and experiences with illegal gambling and the involvement of organized crime in, uh, in gambling and uh, the impact it's had on uh, legitimate gambling industry across the country. Um, the FBI and the federal government, as you may know, and I don't know if any other speakers have mentioned it, has really been the agency that has the jurisdiction uh, in these matters and has really led the way in terms of going after organized crime involvement uh, in illegal gambling, as well as in non-organized crime illegal gambling that, that also does exist out there. Uh, and of course, that's been with the assistance of the criminal division of the Internal Revenue Service and other federal agencies that have uh, unique skills. But I'm going to focus on the FBI tonight because that's where my background is. And uh, I want to try and give you uh, hopefully some additional context to uh, some of what you've been hearing about today and perhaps some of what your own studies have uh, presented to you. So to get started, let's journey back really to the, the, the last century, uh, the start of the last century, and uh, the history of gambling in the United States that even goes back half of, of the century before that. Uh, and, and what's really interesting is the history of gambling in, uh, in our country really follows along with the development of the country, and, and the two histories go almost hand in hand. Um, and I, I hope you'll be able to see some of the major developments uh, that have progressed both in the industry and uh, how they do match up to where we are in this country uh, over the past couple of centuries. Uh, from the first settlers uh, coming to the U.S., uh, they, they brought card games and roulette and other forms of, of uh, uh, gaming and gambling with them. Uh, this included... Uh, the, uh, the first settlers basically focusing on card games and on roulette. Uh, later, uh, immigrants to the U.S. coming to New York, Chicago in the 30s, 40s, and 50s brought other forms of gaming, such as numbers games and, and things like that, to add to the retinue of, of gaming or gambling that's available to U.S. citizens. And, of course, all of that essentially culminated in the uh, in the 50s and 60s and proceeded even into the 70s uh, with the uh, the growth, the establishment and the growth of the, the desert uh, gaming mecca uh, of Las Vegas, uh, which really took off uh, in a sense or started at the beginning of the last century uh, and then uh, continued on and really saw uh, went through a boom time in the uh, late 60s into the 70s, uh, followed by yet another large uh, gaming boom uh, in the 90s. Uh, I know when I was assigned there in the late 70s, uh, it was still kind of a, a sleepy town, very similar to what it had been back in the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, the last time I was there, uh, it had been about 10 years since since I'd last seen Las Vegas. And frankly, I hardly even recognized that uh, there are so many new casinos and so much high tech uh, stuff going on in gaming uh, that it uh, it was really a, a, a surprise, quite frankly, uh, in terms of how far legitimate gaming has come and all the things that have been done to basically keep organize crime and keep the, the bad elements out of legitimate gaming so it can remain as an honest uh, pastime for Americans and visitors uh, to our country. Uh, because of all of that, and I don't know how much any of you followed it, but the U.S. has really remained uh, at the forefront of gambling uh, on, a, on a global basis. Sure, a lot of other countries uh, have uh, gaming establishments or different forms of gaming. Even the hotel I'm standing here, the Hilton, has a small casino downstairs that basically mirrors the type of games that we find in Las Vegas or uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. But uh, as I said, uh, gambling has been a part of the U.S. culture since the first pioneers came, and, and many of them headed west in search of gold and glory and a, and a whole new life. And they took with them 
the game we know today as poker. And poker, the word poker seems to be based upon a French word, poque, I think is a pronunciation, P-O-Q-U-E, uh, which it's, it, poker is thought to have originated from. That was a French card game brought over by French settlers uh, who also brought roulette with them. Both games swiftly became mainstays of uh, the American gambling psyche. Uh, especially in the western uh, part of the country, and uh, uh, it's incidentally, and you may have seen it in movies and things like that. But uh, uh, as the Wild West was being settled, uh, poker and roulette were the the two main games that you found in uh, the the old frontier uh, gambling halls or in hotels that had gaming or bars that had gaming and that type of thing, uh, and uh, betting. Uh, and those games even spread to people betting on gunfights out in the street. Uh, many of those gunfights were over gaming disputes, gambling disputes, or accusations that somebody was cheating or, or what have you. And uh, they would bet on uh, who was going to win the gunfight or who was right, who was wrong. Uh, and uh, that became also a, a kind of a way of life and what later became known as the Wild West. Um, if you've ever visited uh, Taos, New Mexico, or Cimarron, New Mexico, or even Tombstone, Arizona, you can really see the remnants of the old uh, gaming uh, enterprises that existed there, as I said, mostly in bars and uh, dance halls and gambling halls. Um, I was... Uh, I was in Cimarron, New Mexico myself a couple of months ago, and I'd been there before, but I visited the old St. James Hotel in uh, what is uh, euphemistically called downtown Cimarron. If you, if you blink, you miss it. But uh, the, uh, the hotel was a favorite hangout of people like Bat Masterson, uh, Jesse James, uh, Wyatt and Virgil Earp. Uh, the notorious bank and train robber Blackjack Ketchum, uh, and even Annie Oakley and Buffalo Bill Cody. And uh, when I told this story before, people are surprised. They thought those were all just movie characters, but no, they were they were real people. In many names, those were pseudonyms or nicknames that they they've been given instead of their their real names. But they did exist, and in the ceiling of the bar in the St. James Hotel are in excess of 20 bullet holes that remain from back in the, uh, the mid-1800s, 1850, 1860, of uh, gunfights or shootouts that actually occurred over card games or other disputes uh, in the bar. And uh, the current owner uh, and the prior owners thought it would be kind of neat uh, historical thing to leave those there. And they are quite a, quite a tourist attraction. Everybody wants to go into the St. James Bar and see the bullet holes in the ceilings. Um, but as I said a minute ago, most of those gunfights were uh, evolving out of card games or, or uh, roulette uh, uh, betting. And uh, oftentimes were the result of disputes or accusations of, of cheating. Uh, in Tombstone, Arizona, it was a little bit different. Uh, but again, Tombstone, not a night passed there without numerous poker games being played in the various uh, gaming halls and stuff. I think I read somewhere recently there were like uh, back in those days, there were like 44 uh, gaming establishments in Tombstone, most of them affiliated with bars or with hotels or restaurants or, or what have you. But uh, they had the same disputes that we saw in New Mexico of uh, accusations of cheating or uh, players who got into disputes with other players over uh, the way a hand was played in, in poker or what have you. And uh, you probably all have heard of Boot Hill Cemetery. Well, Boot Hill Cemetery is a is a cemetery that dates back to the, the mid 1800s and contains the remains of a lot of the uh, the people that were accused of cheating. And uh, back in those days, those uh, accusations were handled on the spot. There was an instant trial and usually an instant execution for whoever it was that was, uh, was thought to be the cheater in the game. Uh, incidentally, the uh, Tombstone is also the home of the infamous uh, gunfight at OK Corral. 
And the glorified version of that gunfight is not quite the way it's portrayed in the movies, but it was between Wyatt Earp and his brother Virgil Earp and Doc Holliday with the infamous Clanton gang, which were uh, uh, gambling cheats. They were uh, bank and mail robbers, uh, the whole thing. And the uh, the Earp brothers and Doc Holliday came out on top in that one. And the Clanton brothers are also buried in the, in, uh, the Boot Hill uh, Cemetery. It was actually a 30 second gun battle that was over with in the blink of an eye, but uh, it's lived on in infamy. And uh, there's still stories written about it. You still see it in movies. And, and what have you. Uh, but a few decades ago, uh, gaming laws really started to change across the United States. There was much more attention being paid to keeping organized crime out. Uh, there were a lot of uh, major corporations that were starting to come into gaming. And uh, for the most part, most of them wanted a clean, legitimate gaming business because the profits the profits were really quite good, and uh, they wanted to maintain a as legitimate an operation as they could. Um, but uh, what we saw here about uh, going back about forty years ago uh, were, was the emergence of uh, riverboats riverboat casinos on the Mississippi River and some of the other major rivers in the country, uh, especially the Chicago River and along the, the beaches of the, uh, of the Gulf Coast. Um, and these gaming sites became so prominent and in such demand that they even began starting to ferry gambling passengers to those casinos. Now, I use that term loosely about uh, the, 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 the casino ships and, and ferrying passengers out there because the vast majority of those waterborne floating casinos were permanently moored and uh, rarely, if ever, moved. In fact, most of them were never moved. Uh, so it, it, was, uh, it was kind of a misnomer to call them ships. Uh, there were also a, a few paddle wheelers on some of uh, those navigable waterways that indeed traveled up and down the river and would stop in small towns along the way and, and offer a night of gaming or gambling or entertainment uh, to the people that live there. And as happens with so many things involving gaming or gambling, uh, organized crime groups, some small ones, independent ones, as well as the major ones out of Chicago and Detroit, Kansas City, uh, tried to get their fingers on the profits coming out of there. And they did it in a number of ways that we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, interestingly, this, this concept of ferrying gamblers out to the, uh, these casino boats uh, was really the forerunner of what are today known as gaming or gambling junkets. And most of the casinos around the country, especially in Las Vegas, run these junkets for not only high rollers, but for just everyday mom and pop gamblers who have the money to gamble, uh, uh, you know, with, with a, a fair amount of money so that they're attractive to the casinos. And they actually run junkets from small towns to uh uh, to some of these, uh, some of these larger casinos in Vegas, uh, uh, in Reno, in, uh, uh, back in Atlantic City, and some of the other places where casino gaming is is legal. And these are ones where gamblers uh, become known to the casino, and uh, they uh, will be picked up by buses or even airplanes, and uh, uh, brought to distant casinos uh, to get their business. And usually, they're treated with a great deal of of um, uh, deference while they're there. Usually their rooms will be comped, which means they're free. Uh, they will give, be given meals free and uh, whatever else can be done to encourage them to spend as much of their money as they can at those casinos. And then they'll be taken home and all of that travel and everything, there's no charge for it. Everything is free, including their, their transportation. Um, that, uh, that obviously added to uh, the number of, of Americans uh, engaging in gambling. gambling. It was kind of an attractive thing to be flown to Las Vegas from some small town in Iowa or, or someplace like that and be treated like royalty uh, while they're there. And in the meantime, drop hundreds, if not thousands of dollars uh, in the casino. But the real, the real explosion in gaming across the US came with what is called the Las Vegas boom. And this really started in the early uh, 
in the early 20th century, the early 1900s, in the days of Bugsy Siegel, and uh, people like that that uh, came to Las Vegas, built the first casinos, and uh, really planted the seeds for what is today a massive billion dollar industry, in not only in Nevada, but in Atlantic City and other parts of the country that have uh, uh, legislated uh, legal, legal gaming. Um, and these casinos, uh, as you've seen, if you've been in any of them, they offer just about any type of gaming you'd, you'd want, not only table games like poker and blackjack, but roulette and uh, uh, other games. Uh, and uh, uh, it's hard to walk into a casino in Vegas, a major casino, and not realize what a booming business it is, uh, not only with the money that's exchanging hands, but <clears throat> just with the number of people that are playing. Anytime you have a lot of money flowing freely, uh, traditionally in the FBI, we saw organized crime showing up very, very quickly and trying to plant some roots there and uh, get their fingers on, on some of that money. Uh, they've even, aside from junkets, they've even gone to the point of uh, many years ago, uh, starting to offer Hollywood style entertainment with uh, well-known singers, Frank Sinatra's, people like that uh, coming in, uh, dancers, magicians uh, that are really in the public eye that also serve as attractions to bring people to the casinos and get them to gamble with their money. That uh, that tradition has continued. It's continued to grow in these major gambling meccas. And uh, it, uh, it actually turns some of these casinos into entertainment destinations in addition to gaming destinations. And that also continues to grow. <laughs> It wasn't until those early years, though, that the, the generation of these gambling centers really took off. Uh, major destinations emerging across the United States. And of course, as we all know, and I've mentioned this, Atlantic City, New Jersey became the, the eastern shore of that, uh, that cross-country tsunami, because it was like a tsunami. Once laws started getting passed, allowing it, it took off like a wildfire. Um, Las Vegas, though, has consistently maintained its place, more or less, uh, as the world's premier gambling destination. But other places are dipping at their heels right now, especially in foreign countries. Uh, Dubai and Qatar and some of the other Middle Eastern countries have, have set up major ga gaming uh, operations uh, that, that are operating uh, ostensibly, legitimately, and are becoming major attractions, too, for people willing to travel there on vacation. Um, the 1970s, though, was a period of very difficult times for the casino business. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute with uh, the, the ga gaming that uh, was going on there that was totally infiltrated by the mafia, by the, the mobs out of uh, Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, uh, New Jersey. And... Uh, uh, the FBI came in, and I'll, I'll tell you the story about what happened, how we uh, turned things around there also in just a minute. But it, it started a boom. It led to an, a second boom in Las Vegas of more and bigger hotel casinos being built in the 90s uh, in spite of the organized crime involvement that had been discovered and dealt with in the mid to late 70s, uh, especially along the, the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, Despite the, the recession of the mid 2000s uh, hitting Vegas profits, uh, a move to more sophisticated hotel complexes, hotel and gaming complexes uh, continued to grow. In fact, it grew at explosive rates. Um, and even today, Vegas shows no sign of losing uh, its iconic status as America's betting destination or, or betting mecca. It's still the home of the, the World Series of Poker, which started in 1970 and has attracted a lot of worldwide attention, a lot of worldwide uh, or poker players from around the world that come there because of the, the, uh, the, the just dozens of events and the tens of millions of dollars in prize money that's available. Uh, 
as you might imagine, with the, the, the mushrooming of uh, casinos and casino gaming, along with other forms of what I call facilitated gaming, which involves uh, uh, electronic gaming machines and uh, what have you, uh, the mob, the con artists and other criminal groups soon joined these expansion uh, movements in their own ways and their own methods. And of course, those ways and methods were rarely uh, legitimate. Uh, they involved uh, different ways to steal money out of the casinos and uh, uh, were, were initially quite successful with it for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Nobody was really equipped to deal with it, nor did anybody really have the willpower uh, to deal with it. And part of that was a result of the fact that the profits were so high by so many of these casino operations that uh, they were willing to just write off whatever losses they were suffering uh, due to organized crime skimming and, and other illegal activities. Um, as I said, the, these organized crime families uh, quickly recognized that here was a ready source of money that was a lot easier to go after with their mob tactics and where a lot of their other organized crime activities such as loan sharking or drug dealing, things like that, that carried a lot of risk. Uh, they felt fairly safe skimming uh, out of the casinos. And uh, they, they felt also fairly comfortable using threats and extortion, even deadly force uh, to start gaining control of uh, some of these casinos, especially the ones in Las Vegas that became the subject of the casino case. Basically, the mob was trying to gain what was called under the table control, hidden control of uh, these money generating machines, as, as they were often called, the, the casinos. They recognized that they could infiltrate the count rooms. This is where the, the, the take from the gaming tables uh, is taken every hour or so from whether it be the blackjack tables or whatever and uh, it's counted and accounted for and uh, locked up in vaults and what have you so the mob discovered that if they could get control of those count rooms or get their people into the count rooms and maybe bribe the people that were already there uh, they could literally take money off the top of the table that had not been counted yet and walk out of the casino with thousands and thousands of dollars in briefcases or in gym bags or whatever it was. And uh, it became a very attractive money-making uh, or money-stealing business uh, uh, for them. Uh, these count rooms were, were easy pickings for them. And uh, interestingly, there was no way of tracing what had been taken off the table initially uh, because there had not been a count. Now, what's happened since then, though, the casinos have gotten much more sophisticated and there's ways based on the volume of business at uh, the tables, at the slot machines and, and what have you, to come up with pretty scientific estimates of uh, what, uh, what kind of action, monetary action those tables had seen and what should be coming into the count room. Uh, by no means is it exact. And no means is it scientific, but uh, uh, they can come up and, and do come up with pretty good estimates of what the uh, what the count should be. And they also recognize that the count has certain norms during the day or over a period of several days or on weekends. And uh, they can also estimate uh, what, what it should be. But while they've they've been become pretty good at, at those kinds of estimates, the casinos have also instituted a lot of barriers, electronic and otherwise, uh, to, uh, uh, to help them detect cheating or skimming or stealing uh, that can go on in the count room and had gone on in those count rooms for decades. Um, so they're no longer easy pickings for the mob. Um, the uh, they even discovered that the mob, when, when some of those things started to dry up on them, they found other ways to tap into the, the, the very sizable revenues of these casinos. And they started uh, trying to get people into the, uh, the junket operations. And what they would do is uh, falsify the, um, the numbers of people 
uh, on these junkets and where they were coming in from. And they were able to monetize that so they could pull some of the money out of the junket business uh, and also uh, put it into the, the coffers of, of organized crime. In other words, where there was money available, there was always a will and there was always a way that the mob would get their hands on it. <laughs> Excuse me. Basically, the mob wanted to control the cash flow in these casinos. And by controlling the cash flow, they had almost unlimited profits. I remember during the casino case, uh, we had uh, we had wiretaps on the homes of most of the mob guys that were involved with the casinos. We actually had wiretaps on the switchboard at the Stardust and Tropicana casinos, uh, where we could monitor uh, calls coming in and coming out and the illicit conversations that were taking place uh, between the mob guys that were there and their cronies back in whatever cities they came from. And uh, uh, the it, it was amazing how creative some of these mobsters were in coming up with with new schemes, with coming up with ways to beat the barriers that the casinos the casinos were setting up. And it wasn't until uh, uh, things it really got out of hand with those problems that the FBI, uh, Congress, the Department of Justice really started to stand up and take notice of what was going on. Uh, Senator Kefauver of Tennessee uh, held hearings and uh, introduced legislation to create several new organized crime control laws. Uh, Senator John McClellan, who ran the Senate Rackets Committee, uh, ultimately uh, introduced and got passed what is known as the Organized Crime Control Act. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute as well. But uh, up until the passage of those uh, criminal acts uh, by the Congress, the, the FBI's toolbox was also very limited in what we could do. We had to fall back on, uh, you know, laws that, that had come up and, and investigative techniques from the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, uh, to go after these casinos. And the casinos and the mob guys had gotten very, very sophisticated uh, in terms of how they were doing things, which made it even more difficult for us to detect uh, what was going on. Uh, I remember when I first came to uh, Las Vegas, it, it was the result of these situations that gotten very much out of hand. And unfortunately, the organized crime division, the organized crime squad of the Las Vegas office, which had about 20 agents, uh, basically, uh, it was composed of agents that had been there for years and uh, were... Um, it really had gotten too close to people in the casinos, not only the pit bosses, but the management people. And basically they had kind of gone native uh, in terms of, of uh, not paying close attention, but enjoying the perks of going to free shows and uh, uh, being treated like, like royalty to when they came into the casinos. But with the passage of, of these, uh, these acts, the, the, the tools were now there. But the, the willpower of not only Las, Las Vegas PD, but uh, uh, the FBI and some of the other agencies that were, uh, that were there um, were not, excuse me one minute, I'm getting buzzed here on my, uh, on my computer. There we are. Um, the FBI, FBI finally had some new tools, but lacked the willpower in Las Vegas, especially to go after the mob in the casinos. So the FBI made a very dramatic decision. They basically cleaned out the organized crime squad. They transferred agents that were too young to retire. They forced some of the old timers that had been there for years that were eligible to retire. They forced them into retirement. And over a period of about 90 days, they transferred in in excess of 20 uh, additional agents, uh, younger ones. Uh, I was lucky enough to be chosen as one of those. And we were transferred in with marching orders that we were to go in and basically take care of, of uh, what organized crime was doing. When I say take care of, I mean, by, by investigations and prosecutions and, and what have you. Uh, the agents that came in had backgrounds in, in organized crime. They had backgrounds in, in accounting, in, uh, in the law. 
uh, in public corruption, because along with all of these uh, organized crime figures, public corruption followed right along. They pay off legislators and mayors and city council people to, to get their way. And uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the group of us that came in all brought in backgrounds with us of going after those types of federal crimes. Uh, I uh, uh, started the, uh, the investigation of the Stardust Casino uh, based on information we had that Alan Glick, the owner, 32-year-old owner of the Stardust and three other casinos in Las Vegas, who had come to Las Vegas really without a penny to his name, but suddenly had $67 million to buy four casinos. And uh, that $67 million came in the form of a loan from the Teamsters Union Pension Fund, which was like the piggy bank for the mafia, uh, especially in Chicago and Detroit. And uh, when you looked at it, there was no logical reason that uh, Alan Glick would have received this $67 million. But a little bit of investigation found out that he had been close friends for years with the son of Frank Balistrieri. Balistrieri was the, the uh, capo, if you use a mob term, of the Milwaukee organized crime family, which was in cahoots with the Chicago organized crime family and getting their fingers into Las Vegas. And uh, what we found out uh, through the wiretaps and investigations and informants that we developed was that Glick was actually a front man for the mob for a consortium of Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, and Kansas City uh, mafia families to gain control of as many Las Vegas casinos as they could. And they had selected the Stardust uh, through their frontman, Alan Glick, uh, to start their march down the Las Vegas Strip and get control of as many casinos as they could. Uh, shortly after we got into the case, we found out that Kansas City mob had joined that illicit consortium and uh, they had installed a fellow named Joseph Augusto uh, from Sicily uh, as the behind the scenes power guy at the Tropicana Casino. Augusto also had absolutely no experience with casino, with gaming, with entertainment or anything. But uh, when he came in, uh, he was under a lot of suspicion about why he was there. And it was pretty clear that he was another front man. And uh, uh, the wiretaps that we had on the Tropicana and on his home and his office quickly revealed to us that, yes, that's a fact what he was. He was there to uh, help establish organized crime control of that casino to start or increase the, uh, the skimming and other uh, illegal uh, acts that were being done to, to pull money out of, uh, out of that, that money machine. Um, the, the task that had been assigned to us was to do something about this. And with the team of, of real experts among the, the, the cadre of agents that came in there, my particular expertise was, was in organized crime, it was in political corruption, and it was in labor racketeering. And uh, all of those elements were present in Las Vegas, and other agents had very specialties too that contributed to the investigations. But we decided the first thing to do was to, to get permission from the U.S. Department of Justice and from the federal courts to install almost 25 wiretaps on various significant locations around Vegas, the homes, the casino offices, the cars, even uh, 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 hidden cameras and microphones over tables and small restaurants where the mob guys were meeting and discussing their illicit activities. And uh, it didn't take long. It took all of about six or seven months to really develop a full picture of just how entrenched these mafia families were in Las Vegas and the amount of control that they exerted over the financial affairs of these casinos. And uh, uh, along with that, we started uh, doing things to infiltrate the mob. We brought in very experienced undercover agents, uh, one of whom a good friend of mine, Rick Bacon, uh, also now retired, but Rick uh, was a, an expert on gambling cases. He was an expert on jewelry heists and things like that. And we brought him in and he ultimately developed a close relationship with a guy named Tony Spilatro. 
Tony was the mob's enforcer in Chicago. He killed any number of people that run afoul of the mob. He was sent out to Las Vegas to be an enforcer, to keep an eye on Alan Glick and, and Augusto and these other people that were, uh, were into the casinos. And uh, he was a very violent individual, constantly getting in fights and beating people up and threatening people with guns and whatever. So uh, with, with Rick uh, uh, targeting him uh, in an undercover capacity, he ultimately was invited into Tony Spilatro's poker games and started playing poker with, with uh, Spilatro and his mafia cronies uh, uh, at least once a week, sometimes multiple times a week and uh, was posing as a, as a jewel thief and had jewelry to sell. And at that time, Spilatro had a little store called Gold Rush, which was basically a front for uh, a, a hiding place for mobsters, but also was a front for uh, fencing the, uh, the, the, the goods and the jewelry and uh, monies and whatever that they were getting from their illicit activities. And pretty soon, Rick was was made uh, 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 privy to all those conversations that occurred during the poker games, and uh, it was just invaluable information that that we had. Um, so it got to a point ultimately that we had enough evidence that we knew we had to start making some some very distinct moves. And this was about a year and a half, almost two years into our investigation. And by that time, uh, some new laws were coming uh, out onto the table for us to use. Uh, McClellan had passed it, uh, in uh, his from his rackets committee this Organized Crime Control Act of 1970s that had not really been test it yet. So we decided to apply that to the investigation. And uh, that allowed all the wiretapping and other things that we were doing uh, uh, legally. But it also created a whole series of new laws that were classified under a racketeering chapter in the United States Criminal Code, Title 18. Uh, these were things called the Hobbs Act, interference with interstate commerce in furtherance of organized crime activities, interstate or foreign travel in furtherance uh, of aiding or facilitating illegal uh, organized crime type activities, so racketeering enterprises, uh, interstate transportation of gaming equipment, uh, which was used to, to uh, uh, facilitate illegal casino style gaming in basements of bars and things like that, uh, influencing illegally, influencing uh, the flow of funds in and out of uh, union retirement funds, uh, the prohibition of illegal gambling businesses. Uh, engaging in money laundering, uh, violent crimes that, that help to protect uh, uh, these illegal racketeering activities, uh, the prohibition of unlicensed money transfer uh, or transmitting businesses, which was another leg of the, uh, of the uh, um, uh, money laundering uh, statutes. But the most important law that came up to us uh, is something that is today known as RICO. R-I-C-O, and that's an acronym for Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. It was Section 1961 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code. Now, what this RICO Act did was greatly expanded the tools that we had to go after organized.
that has spotty Wi-Fi sometimes. So he will be back on momentarily. Just give us one moment. Tom? I uh, I think I'm back. You are back. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Everything just disappeared all of a sudden. I think this hotel doesn't have the best Wi-Fi system. Unfortunately. Understandably. Can you hear? Yeah. Can you hear me? We are all good. You can continue. Okay. Yeah, I was getting pretty close to finishing. I was giving a, a recitation of those the different racketeering crimes, but I, I wanted to explain next that uh, it requires at least two acts of racketeering activity, which are two crimes from a list of about 35 crimes that could be adopted under the RICO statute to establish a pattern of racketeering activity. And these, uh, most of them are pretty common, like loan sharking and illegal gambling and extortion and uh, union racketeering and things like that. But uh, there also has to be uh, a nexus between the acts and a criminal enterprise that they are trying to either take over or to skim from or, or what have you. Uh, the neat part about this is those that are found guilty of this type of racketeering can be fined up to $25,000 and sentenced to 20 years in prison for every single racketeering act they commit in conjunction with this particular scheme that they're working on. So it's really very, very significant penalties. Um, the, uh, those, uh, those violations had to be approved at the Washington level because they were very, very complex with these real draconian penalties. And, uh, uh, but once everybody got used to using these new laws and especially the prosecutors got used to using them, um, we actually became very, very effective with them and uh, uh, put away a, a, a number of mobsters for long periods of time for things that they were doing. Um, 
the the predicate crimes well i touched on those predicate crimes were things like bribery counterfeiting extortion loan sharking uh human trafficking uh retaliating against witnesses whatever one of the very first cases that tested these new laws was the casino case which uh, uh i happened to end up as the the case agent on and actually started the case and uh, uh managed the case for three years uh and this as i explained this is where those those different uh, mafia families came together and controlled four major casinos in Las Vegas and also some minor ones and uh, were, were stealing money like crazy out of there. And uh, we were able to put some hidden cameras into the count rooms of these casinos and actually record the skimming that was going on and who was doing it and how they were getting the money out of the casino and, and things like that. And the interesting thing is Alan Glick, who was the front man for these, uh, it was clear as we did surveillances and listened to the wiretaps and whatever, uh, the guy w was an absolute um, uh, tool being used by the mob. He didn't know the first thing about gaming. He was learning it as he went, but he was there to to provide cover for the mobsters. And uh, within his first two years in Las Vegas, he was considered the, the boy wonder of Nevada casino, casino gaming and uh, w was actually honored uh, as the man of the year uh in las vegas by the i believe it was the chamber of commerce that did it but uh when it all came out several years later at the end of our investigation when we basically dropped the boom uh, no pun intended there on uh, on las vegas casinos with raids of uh all these casinos that were involved with raids on the offices of the the executives of the casinos with raids on the homes of the mobsters and the casino executives which really helped us to establish the fact that he was a, a front man. Uh, in the movie, um, the, uh, uh, there, there was a guy uh, that had also been assigned, I should, I should back up from the movie, there was a guy who had also been assigned by the Chicago mob named Frank Lefty Rosenthal. He was a, a Jewish bookmaker from Chicago. He'd been convicted several times of, of bookmaking and other criminal activities, but was also a front man for the mob. And they sent him out to Las Vegas uh, to uh, work with Glick. He was supposedly the number two man at the casino. But in reality, as the wiretap showed, he reported directly to the mob bosses in Chicago and these other cities. But um, uh, he was a very, very interesting character. In the movie, he was played by Robert De Niro. Uh, incidentally, if you haven't seen this movie, it goes back to 1995. It's available on Netflix. I'm, I'm not a salesperson for the movie, but it's also available on DVD. And the movie itself is about 95% accurate. Uh, Martin Scorsese won an honor, an Oscar for a, a director. Uh, directing the movie and really putting it together and he did really one heck of a job that really told the story uh, of the mob and all the different components uh, involved in it um, when it was clear that we we had them that we had our case and we started doing raids and making arrests and what have you we suddenly were faced with a lot of murders of some of our key witnesses in the case uh and uh things were just uh really we, we turned las vegas upside down and uh, unfortunately we felt bad about the murders of those witnesses but they were mob people themselves and uh uh you know it it uh, it uh, I, I sound kind of crass here, but we it enabled us to convict a number of these mobsters on actual murder charges uh, as well, which got them the, the, some of the heaviest uh, uh, penalties of, of going to prison. Um, the uh, uh, Robert De Niro played Lefty Rosenthal, uh, a very interesting role uh, that uh, that Lefty Rosenthal had in the casinos. He was kind of a pretty boy and uh, was not very smart, but uh, was a good gambler, a good numbers guy. Uh, 
And uh, De Niro did a fantastic job playing him and really captured the role. Funny thing happened while we were investigating, uh, we were monitoring and surveilling a number of these mobsters. And Rosenthal was one guy we were keeping an eye on. And we were using aerial surveillance. We had some agent pilots flying planes and we would do surveillance from the air instead of from cars. And one day Rosenthal was having a meeting with Spilatro and some of the other mob guys out on his back patio. And uh, we had agents up in the air surveilling it. And the pilot had forgotten to fill up the gas tank. And pretty soon the plane starts sputtering and they were in trouble. Uh, they had to land. And the closest plane to land was on the fairway of the golf club that Rosenthal's house backed up to. And they ended up landing and the plane stopped literally 50 feet from the back of Rosenthal's house. Uh, needless to say, that was a kind of an embarrassing moment for the agents, but it too is portrayed in Scorsese's movie and it gets a, gets a good laugh. Those things, uh, those things do happen. Um, Spilastro was actually played by Joe Pesci uh, and I, I've got to tell you, Pesci is one fantastic actor. He captured this this mob hitman, Spilatro, perfectly. Even the mannerisms, the style of speaking, the appearance, uh, uh, all of that. And uh, I, quite frankly, I thought he deserved an Oscar for it as well. It's interesting, though, the Casino movie was told entirely from the mob perspective. It was based on a book by a guy named Nick Pelleggi who's written a number of uh, true crime books involving the mob. And uh, there's been some recent talk of a couple of producers are interested in telling the story from the FBI side. And of course, that's a decision the FBI is going to have to make as to whether they want to uh, uh, allow uh, what we did in the case, which I think should be done uh, to be portrayed in, a, in another movie. At the end of the case, we found that the Glick casinos and these other mob casinos had actually had skimmed uh, well over a hundred million dollars uh, from these various casinos over this three-year period that we were on top of what they were doing. Uh, Spilatro himself in the, the rash of murders that occurred, uh, he was uh, uh, basically kidnapped by the mob. He and his brother were uh, while they were in Chicago. They were taken out to a cornfield in Indiana and beaten to death with baseball bats and thrown into a hastily dug grave in the middle of a cornfield. And that too is portrayed in the casino movie. And uh, from uh, what we know happened and the, the pictures of the crime scene where they were killed, uh, it too was portrayed very, very uh, accurately. Unfortunately, it's, it's probably the, the, the most gruesome part of the, the whole movie itself. But uh, that's how they met their, uh, their, their water boot, so to speak. Um, there's other things about the case that, that if we had more time, I'd tell you about, uh, but the, the, the biggest awakening moment for me came after uh, we were wrapping up the cases and my son, Todd, who was, uh, uh, 12 at the time, uh, was going to, uh, a junior high school near where we lived on the east side of Las Vegas. And, uh, he came home one day and he was just, uh, uh, full of, of joy and whatever, because he'd had trouble making friends. Uh, FBI agents, and the kids of FBI agents were not real popular in Las Vegas in the, in the late mid to late seventies, but he came home and he'd made friends with this young boy named Joey. And uh, as we started talking about it, he uh, had this friendship had been developing over several weeks. And I finally asked him, I said, well, what's Joey's last name? And he said, Joey Spilatro. And I thought, oh, my God, my wife and I looked at each other. And for the first time, we had to sit down with my 12 year old son and explain some facts of life to him about what his dad did, about what Las Vegas was like and why, unfortunately, this new friend that he had found uh, really that, that could not go anywhere. And uh, a lot of tears were shed and whatever. But uh, as he grew older, he realized the wisdom of that. And uh uh, certainly survived uh, losing losing that friend. Um, the The end result of this whole thing was we put away the, all the top leadership of those mafia families from four major cities. Uh, su surprisingly, Glick turned state's evidence. Uh, 
and testified against all of them and what his role has been for, as a front man. Uh, we were very surprised that he survived very long after doing that because that was all public testimony. But uh, he was not charged uh, as a result of his cooperation, which, which seriously put the icing on the cake for us on the case. Uh, he did have the money. He bought a big walled estate in San Diego, and he basically lived behind those, ball, those walls for the next uh, uh, two decades. Uh, he passed away last year in 2021 from cancer, uh, but uh, lived basically a secluded life and uh, was afraid to go out, and, and probably rightfully so, because the mob still has very long memories and, and who does, uh, does, them, does bad things to them. But I think we sent a message to the mob in terms of any future efforts to infiltrate the legal gaming business to turn it into an illegal gaming business. And uh, there's been other uh, similar type cases, not of the magnitude that this one was, but uh, similar cases that have happened on the East Coast, some more current ones that have happened in Las Vegas. And uh, I think the message is out there that uh, this type of mob activity is gonna, no longer going to be tolerated. Uh, as a result, it pretty much dried up a lot of the, uh, I would call the piggy banks for the mob. They don't have the access to these just unlimited streaks of money coming into them. And uh, that's hampered them. We put away all of the old leaders. So we put away a lot of the, when I say we, the FBI, a lot of the young uh, soldier type mafia guys that were coming up in the ranks, they've gone to prison for, for doing things. And as a result, I think the, the gaming industry is a lot cleaner than it was 50 years ago, probably even cleaner than it was 30 years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm proud personally to have had a, a, a role in that. Uh, people have asked me, am I fearful of the mob uh, based on what we did? And uh, let me just answer that by saying that every FBI agent that's been in my shoes is careful uh, with, with what we do. Um, there was a new law passed uh, a couple of years ago under President George W. Bush, which gave um, retired federal law enforcement officers the right to carry a concealed weapon for the rest of their lives. We don't have to go to the sheriff or anything. And uh, most of us don't carry that much, uh, but uh, when we're in situations where uh, we might feel a little uncomfortable or whatever, uh, obviously we do. Uh, my wife, unfortunately, my current wife did not go through my FBI or law enforcement career with me, and she does have some trepidations about uh, uh, what I did uh, and uh, uh, even trepidations about what I'm doing here in, in, uh, in Cairo, Egypt. But this is relatively calm compared to, uh, to those things. But I, I, I just like to wrap up with saying that I think um, legal gaming in this country is on pretty solid grounds. Uh, most of these hotel casino operations uh, around the country are now run by major hotels like the Hilton, like uh, uh, other major hotel companies, or by major corporations, major gaming companies that are parts of major corporations. It's become a very, very uh, corporate type business. And while the corporations have done that, they've hired a lot of ex-FBI agents that have come in and helped them build barriers to entry that will keep the mob out <clears throat> and will detect them if they do manage to infiltrate uh, the casino business somewhere. But there are, there's always going to be criminals that think they're smarter, more cunning, and more devious than what the FBI is going to find out. And uh, our, our answer to them has been, uh, if you think that if you if you really believe what you're saying there, uh, we tell them, okay, guys, step up and try us out, and see what happens. And that message has been delivered over and over again by all of our, I think, our successors in the FBI that are working these types of cases. But I know the the ones like Casino are now very, very few and far between, and it still remains as the 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 the, the king of those types of cases. It was one of the largest ones, actually the largest one to ever hit Las Vegas, and uh, still holds that uh, that title today. So with that, uh, let me say my thank yous. I, I really 
have enjoyed this opportunity to talk about some of my own past history, as well as tying it in with what this symposium is all about. And uh, I hope I provided some additional information that will help the, the attendees here uh, put some of what they've heard earlier today into uh, uh, the context of, of uh, what illegal gaming really is. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, as you graduate from law school and move on, some of you might even consider becoming FBI agents. You know, accountants and lawyers are the two preferred uh, uh, backgrounds for new FBI agents. And that has changed a little bit with, with uh, other uh, candidates coming out of very sophisticated careers that, that have uh, value to the work of the FBI. But if you're still thinking about something that you want to do after graduation, graduation from law school, uh, consider going and talking to the FBI. It's a good job. The salaries are competitive. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, you're you're going to end up moving around quite a bit and may not always be exactly where you want to live, but uh, I'll tell you, it's tolerable. I moved nine times in 25 years, and I found each move kind of exciting and a new adventure, and uh, uh, my family and I adjusted fairly fairly quickly to it so give it a try it's a very interesting and a very rewarding career and with that i wish you the best of luck in whatever career you choose after law school and thank you again uh, elsa uh, for inviting me and dean mccormick for allowing me to be a part of this well tom thank you so much for that i really thought my job was exciting before today <laughs> but, <laughs> and i'm a little disappointed you didn't say that um Law school deans is, an, is another good background for FBI agents. But um, my first question for you, and I'm going to invite our audience to pass on questions to, um, to Elsa and Madison and Chase, and, um, and I will relay them to Tom. But my first question for you is, is just on that point, what advice would you give to our students who are interested in a career in the FBI? Well, <clears throat> number one is finish law school with decent uh decent grades. I, I'm not quite sure what the grading system is, but uh, one thing that the FBI insists on is they, <clears throat> they really want to land the cream of the crop, no matter what career or, or background agents are coming from. Uh, the other thing is uh, the undergraduate degree um, has some impact. Uh, if it was in music or art or something like that, prior to going to law school, uh, they probably won't be quite as attractive uh, to the agency. What they're looking for more than that is people that have uh, experience in business, that have experience in uh, uh, various areas that the FBI has a need for, and the law and accounting are right at the top of that list. Um, certainly preparation in criminal law, depending on what the elective system is, um, is a real benefit because that's that's what we're working with. But in addition to that, I think courses, and it may be, I don't know if law schools offer these anymore, but courses in logic, in uh, uh, even business courses in business law, uh, things like that are also very attractive to the FBI. The FBI is, a lot of people don't realize it's it's actually a very sophisticated organization. It's like a major corporation. It's run like a major corporation. As you said in, in my introduction, uh, I uh, my last tour to headquarters, I was chief of strategic planning for the criminal division. And uh, that was very, very close to strategic planning units in a major corporation looking two, three, four, five years ahead setting the goals and policies and all of those things really help. Uh, but finishing law school, uh, staying out of trouble uh, uh, are, are probably the best advice I could give right now. Great. So of course I wanna talk about the lawyers. So you have had the opportunity to work with lawyers a lot in your career. And I'm wondering if you could share with our students some of the characteristics and qualities that you saw that made lawyers effective. Number one, the ability to think on your feet. That, that's probably the most critical. The other thing is a strong writing ability. Uh, we do, we did, uh, or they still do. Uh, I, I talk in that we sense too much anymore. But uh, the ability to write is absolutely critical. We do a lot of writing, not only affidavits and declarations, but reports and uh, strategic plans, things like that. The other one is to have an outgoing personality. 
a person who is withdrawn, stays in the background, will not step up and take charge when uh, there's an opportunity to do so, uh, is also not going to go far in, in the FBI. Uh, agents are in many ways almost like independent contractors. A, a good agent develops their own cases, just like this, the casino case. Uh, that was that was one that uh, I saw the opportunity, for, formed a team of agents, and we uh, you know we we put it together on our own. It was not an assigned case. Those kinds of agents go a long ways in terms of getting hired, but also their careers in the bureau. Um, uh, a, a person who is aggressive, not to the extreme, but aggressive and is not afraid to stand up to a mob guy or to stand up to a criminal and tell them they're a liar, tell them they're under arrest, uh, that type of thing, that's also critical. Uh, but those traits, if, if they're not already there, with a little bit of work and a little bit of study, those can be developed. And uh, if the basics are there, the FBI Academy, four months there, will take care of, of honing those skills. But um, uh, the, uh, the FBI will go back and look at the high school and college records of applicants, and they'll look for indicators of these kinds of traits, where they act even sports, where they act even student council, where they act even clubs. Um, did they uh, did they engage in in uh, you know outside activities that benefited the community? Uh, things like that. Uh, they, they're, the FBI is really looking for what what they describe as just well-rounded individuals that that certainly have the personality and the skills to be effective out on the street investigating crimes. I have a question about the shift in crime. Um, have you observed a shift in crime lately to more internet-based crimes? Yes, absolutely. You know, I'm of course I'm I'm out of the FBI 28 years now, but uh, with cases like this one, I'm I'm still connected, and uh, absolutely, uh, internet crimes are are certainly on the increase. You know, as as technology has increased, uh, the criminals and especially uh, mob people, they're not as sophisticated as they used to be. They're right in there figuring out ways to use them. And in fact, that's another trait that there are another skill that the FBI is looking for people with strong uh, information technology uh, backgrounds uh, that can put that to use strong computer backgrounds uh, uh, as well. But uh, yes, there is a shift and uh, many, many more crimes are being committed electronically today. And, uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, you know, I'm I'm basically, of course, I'm an old timer, but I'm basically Ill illiterate technologically, and I'm glad that I only went offline once here. I would have had trouble a second time. But uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, the crimes change with society. They really do. As society becomes more sophisticated, the crimes become more sophisticated. As there's more money out there, crimes become more sophisticated and more criminals going after it. Um, so the answer is yes. I know you touched on this a little bit in your remarks, but can you tell us a little bit more about um, how the laws to enforce gambling regulations have changed over the course of your career? Sure. The uh, well, uh, just touching on the subject we just talked about, the, the, the biggest change lately is there's been a host of new laws dealing with electronic uh, um, uh, what's what's the word, but uh, uh, the way crimes are being committed electronically, there previously were not uh, laws that were technical enough to increase the chances of agencies like the FBI to successfully investigate them. But uh, uh, Congress now has got a lot of young people there, people with the right backgrounds, and laws are starting to get passed and starting to come out that uh, are trying to close that gap between the electronic side of society today and where the crimes uh, are being committed and how they're being committed. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 we saw with the passage of the Organized Crime Control Act in 1970, that was probably the biggest shift in federal criminal law to address the role of organized crime in society. It gave us the laws, uh, the investigative tools that we needed to go after them. And uh, with the advent of much more technology, 
uh, I know the academy, uh, the FBI academy has developed a whole section back there now that teaches uh, how to go after these crimes, how to investigate them. And they're bringing in people with PhDs and information technology and, and things like that. So, you know, uh, law enforcement is if, after decades of being kind of on the back end of things is really really marching forward today with with new tools new skills uh to go after the, the crimes that, that are uh, damaging society i hope that answered your question i think so i have a question about motives for terrorist attacks um so in your opinion what what do you find are the underlying motives for terrorist attacks and what can american lawyers do about it most terrorist attacks political base to them there's a political message that these terrorist groups want to want to get out either uh, supporting whatever their wayward ways of thinking are or approaching life and uh, uh, terrorist attacks are designed to gain attention to their cause and uh, that's basically been the the underlying um, reason for the vast majority of terrorist attacks that have occurred now again i'm i'm out of the the mainstream on that but uh, they'd certainly started in the last few years that i was in the fbi and being the deputy chief in la uh, I, I saw everything that we did there um but uh but political motivation is the main thing retribution is uh, is another reason where the terrorist groups think they've been wronged by uh, a government or a corporation or something like that uh and uh they'll retaliate uh, the other thing is there's uh, oftentimes a religious basis for terrorism. Uh, unfortunately, for the last uh, uh, couple of decades, terrorist acts have really been focused on, on the Islamic extremists. And um, uh, they certainly still tend to dominate, uh, you know, what's going on in the world of terrorism. But... Um, I will say this particular trip here to Cairo, and I'm not saying it just because I'm here, but this particular trip to Cairo, I'm dealing a lot with people in the Islamic uh, faith, the Islamic religion on a very professional basis. These aren't terrorists, they aren't kidnappers, but what I'm finding is the fear that a lot of people have, and this runs rampant in California, uh, the, the fear of, of Islam, uh, is, uh, with just small exceptions, is really unfounded. It's a very gentle religion. It's, it's one that uh, a lot of very good people uh, adhere to the beliefs. And uh, that's been a real education for me because most of my exposure previously had been uh, through, you know, Islamic terrorist groups. Uh, but, uh, but here I'm dealing with, with members of that faith on a daily basis, you know, in terms of law enforcement and, uh, uh, uh legal people that I'm, that we're working with and, uh, things like that. What can American lawyers do and what can our students do to, to help with that anti-Islam sentiment that's unfounded? I think number one is become familiar with the, the tenets of, these groups, uh, especially the Islamic groups uh, and the Islamic faith. Uh, I think as I've come to under Looks like we may have lost Tom again. Let's just stand by for a minute. Yeah, it looks like we have lost him again, but that's okay. I'm sure he will be back on momentarily to finish his thought. And then we will continue on to panel three. Thank you everybody for your patience.
Tom, can you hear us? We can see you, but we can't quite hear you yet. I don't know if you're muted. It doesn't look like you're muted. Uh, oh, there you are. We got you now. We got you now. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if it was me or the system or what it was, but uh, as I said, the, the Wi-Fi links here are not all the, uh, the best. We can relate. We've had <laughs> we've had similar issues from time to <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I hope I answered that last question. I think I think that you did. Um, and I have one more question for you before we'll we'll let you uh, give some parting words to our students. But the the question is, um, some of our students read your bio and they found that you engage in a lot of pro bono work for criminal defendants and local police departments, or you have engaged in that type of work. And we're wondering, given your experience, what are your thoughts on working with local law enforcement? And what do you think local law enforcement could do to restore trust in the communities they serve? I think the biggest problem with local law enforcement is uh, defective training. Uh, most of the case, I've probably done a hundred cases pro bono against police departments uh, for excessive use of force or uh, unjustified shootings or police corruption, things like that. And um, the, the, the biggest thing I find is, is faulty training. Unfortunately, most police academies, most police departments, their training people are ones that have come up through the ranks. And uh, for whatever reason, they end up as training officers or what have you. And there's a mentality that exists in I'll call it uniform law enforcement that uh, is not a good one uh, at all. And uh, uh, and I don't mean to paint all of law enforcement with a broad brush here. You know, there are departments out there that are absolutely exceptional, uh, that have very forward looking chiefs that have put in policies that have really developed very professional training courses. I was in charge of the St. Paul, Minnesota FBI office at one point. So I'm very familiar with both St. Paul and the Minneapolis police departments and the Floyd George situation up there. I've, I've talked to people that I knew and uh, Minneapolis PD was always a rogue department. And I was there 30, 35 years ago. Uh, and it hasn't changed. And that's a problem of management because there were certainly enough indicators that the department has had problems forever. They had uh, a, a high level of distrust by the community. Uh, they've had some real goofball ch ch police chiefs. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that almost creates a little bit of an epidemic because they are the premier law enforcement agency in Minnesota. And a lot of the smaller departments, especially in the Twin Cities area, tend to emulate what Minneapolis PD does. And, and it's not good. You know, Ferguson uh, in St. Louis, I was also assigned to St. Louis at one time. And Ferguson emulated the St. Louis PD, which was a very brutal police department back in that time, back in the, the, the uh, early to mid 90s. And uh, uh, Ferguson was a direct outgrowth of that. It didn't surprise me a bit when I saw what had, what had happened there. And, they, and it, the community didn't surprise me either with the, uh, the, the protests and the riots. It's a shame it came to that point. But I think there has to be major changes in the way police are trained. And some progressive departments are bringing in citizen trainers that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer that once someone is, is uh, taught how to teach, if they put their mind to it, they can teach just about anything. You know, the teaching skill is what's important. The knowledge can be gained. And some of the best college professors I saw, sure, they became experts in their field, but they really knew how to teach and get the points across. Uh, and um, I, I think there needs to be some real uh, uh, some real analysis giving to, to police training techniques. I also think that um, the the supervision levels in police work are a major cause of a lot of the excessive use of force. You know, sergeants one day are a patrol officer and the next day they're a sergeant. And uh, they may or may not have had any supervisory training. Uh, 
but they bring with them the same attitudes they had when they were out driving a patrol car in the community. And it carries over. I've, I've seen cases of police brutality that I did as an expert witness, but also the ones we investigated in the FBI. And we had a lot of them in Los Angeles. Uh, but um, I saw how the attitudes, uh, especially of first line supervisors and maybe even the next level up of lieutenants uh, can just permeate a, a department. And if there isn't a chief there that's strong enough to deal with that and to make sure he gets, he or she gets the right people into the right roles in the department, uh, they're destined for more Floyd George cases or Ferguson's or, or whatever. So it's a, it's a problem that's been around for a long, long time. I can't really say, and I mean, I've been in a criminal justice system for 50 years now, and I can't really say that I've seen a whole lot of improvement uh, in it. And, and it's a real shame because I, I would think that the profession, and sometimes I hesitate to call it a profession, but the, the law enforcement career uh, can be a lot better than what it is. And I think hiring techniques are, are part of that. Uh, you know, the, the FBI served on the FBI's management assessment team, which uh, did all of the assessing for new first line supervisors and second level supervisors. And uh, or actually second level were more uh, executives, but um, the FBI sent us all to schools to learn how to do these assessments and to do them to further the professionalism of the FBI. And they worked, you know, using those techniques, we were able to select good people that, that moved on. I look back now, I've been gone, most of the, the special agents in charge now, of various field officers came in after I retired. But I see the traits they have. I see how they handle themselves on television. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's a result of, of not only the assessment techniques we learned, but the rest of the selection process and the, the FBI training process, the academy. We have, uh, and they still do have a lot of PhDs there. Uh, some of whom don't come from a law enforcement background, but are able to teach the skills that, that, that we need. Uh, I hope that answered the question. It did. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So on behalf of the Law and Graduate School, I really want to thank you for sharing with our students your remarkable career. And we appreciate you being so generous with your time, especially when you're um, working so far away. <laughs> um, uh, well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And, and I just close with saying that uh, Elsa has my number. Uh, we have family connections back in uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, not family, but I, I'm familiar with, with her family, her parents. And uh, if anybody has any questions about the FBI or any of these topics, uh, get a hold of Elsa. And uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to respond to emails, even while I'm on the road like this. Or uh, I, I, I can't really predict when I'm going to be home. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I would do my best to respond and try and answer any additional questions. Thank you so much. And good luck with your work there. Thank you. Can I go to the other website now to listen in on the next part? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I have I, emailed that um, link to you, Tom. Okay, great. Thank you. I, that's where that's where I'll go. So I'll watch the rest of it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Tom. Okay, back to Elsa to introduce panel three. Dean McCormick, thank you so so much. My you pleasure. have been phenomenal, and yes, Tom is incredible. Good morning, Judge. Sir. Uh, yes, afternoon. Now it's 12.01. Good afternoon. <laughs> and good afternoon, Professor Werner. Hi, thanks for having me here. Of course, thank you both for joining us. All right, with that excellent um, segue, I think we are going to get on to our third and final panel. I am so excited for this one, I'm not gonna lie. All right. Um, Judge Colleen K. Stern was born in Santa Monica, California and raised in Southern California. She attended the University of California, Santa Barbara, graduating in 1980 with a BA in English. She graduated from Santa Barbara College of Law in 1988 and she holds a graduate certificate in dispute resolution from Pepperdine University. Judge Stern was appointed to the Superior Court by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in January 2010, selected in 2002 by the Superior Court judges to be the Family Law Commissioner for Santa Barbara County 
Judge Stern served as a bench officer in that capacity until 2010. Before taking the bench, she engaged in a civil litigation trial practice, which she later limited to mediation and dispute resolution. Judge Stern is a 2006 recipient of the Judge John T. Rickard Judicial Service Award and was named Attorney of the Year by Santa Barbara Women Lawyers in 2010. She is a past president and board member of Santa Barbara Women Lawyers. She has participated in the Santa Barbara County Bar Association, California Women Lawyers, and the William L. Gordon Chapter of the American Inns of Court. Judge Stern currently sits in the Superior Court Civil Division, where she hears a wide variety of civil disputes, including family law. She has been the primary probate judge in the South County for more than 10 years, hearing probate, trust, conservatorship, and guardianship cases. She also hears the LPS mental health calendar for the entire county and takes an active role in shepherding the court's dispute resolution settlement programs. Thank you, Judge Stern, so much for your time, and we are very excited to have you. And um, I think you absolutely take it away. Well, I'm ready to take it away. And thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. And thanks to Elsa Larson and to Madison Gaffney for the invitation and for their work organizing this event. I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak to you today. In the County of Santa Barbara, California, where I serve in the Superior Court, which is our court of general jurisdiction, we do not hear gaming issues per se. Although we do have gaming in our county that's operated by the Chumash tribe in the central area of the county near the city of Solvang. Most court activity we see from the casino is in tort cases, things like premises liability and the like, and some employment and general business disputes. There is also, of course, criminal activity that is connected to the casino as well. Most gaming issues per se are handled in the ways you've been hearing about from your symposium participants today. My remarks will be focused on the experience from a judge in the trenches, the utility or lack thereof of unified legal arrangements in specialized disputes, and the value of settlement through mediation, arbitration, or other means. First, I will discuss UCCJEA and UIFSA, or UIFSA, as examples of cooperation among states to de devise a legal framework that solves important societal problems, and the way these constructs are experienced in the real world by ordinary people. I will also talk about the importance of settlement programs in managing court caseloads and in providing tools to aid litigants in navigating a legal system that is likely to be daunting to them. Family law is in fact a very good area to discuss in tandem with gaming law. Family law has been part of, been part of my beat as a judicial officer since 2002. The Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act or UCCJEA was created by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws in 1997. So it was already on the books when I joined the court. It has been adopted by 49 US states in the District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. The only state, the sole holdout, um, is Massachusetts. They go their own way. The UCCJEA provides a consistent framework for dealing with child custody and parenting time orders among the states, creating uniform procedures to register and enforce child custody orders across state lines. It also dissuades or attempts to dissuade from forum shopping those parents who are trying to seek advantage in custody matters. And in fact, UCCJEA had as a, had as a large part of its purpose, harmonizing various state laws with federal statutes, such as those that prevent parental kidnapping or absconding with children across state lines. UFSA, the Uniform Interstate Family Support Act, did the same thing for court-ordered child support and did it earlier. UFSA has been a work in progress since 1995. The last sizable changes to it were made in 2008, and it has attained the form that we now know it in 1992. It provides that there will be only one order controlling child support at any given time for any given family, preventing issuance of competing orders. It also provides for registration and direct enforcement of child support orders issued in one state and another state without a separate action in the state where the enforcement is sought. This prevents individuals in our increasingly mobile society from avoiding child support by relocating or becoming employed in another state. A primary utility of the act allows child support orders in one state to be collected via 
um, wage garnishment in another state. And this separate um, collection effort does not have to be supported by a separate action in the state where the collection is taking place, which is a tremendous benefit to the litigants. The separate um, state child support agencies, and every state has one and has separate outposts of that agency in every county, they have significant power. This uh, our legislation um, empowered this, way, this agency in a way that many um, find unexpected in that they can seek out information about employment and earnings and including a rather unique and comprehensive access to IRS records which is somewhat unusual. These two tools have significantly benefited the children of the United States. As of 2001, 66% of child support was being collected by income withholding. 96% of the funds collected go to families with only a 4% public assistance reimbursement rate. This is one of the most cost-efficient programs in all of government with $5.21 collected for every dollar that is spent in collection. This program served 13.2 million children in 2021, which is one in five children in the United States. UCCJEA and UIFSA are excellent examples of the benefits that accrue when states and the federal government work together to provide uniform legal process. But, drum roll please, <laughs> Fair custody arrangements and collection of child support are still enormous problems. We have multi-layered law arrangements in commercial transactions, labor and employment law, and many other areas, including this developing area of gaming law. But all have significant imperfections. A key attribute of such schemes is that they provide a special forum for resolution of disagreements such as workers' compensation court and the like. In the family law setting, in most states, it's actually the state courts who absorb this task, but the law requires that they be staffed with special personnel and, special, and especially special judicial officers for the purpose and with special procedures designed to manage these particular kinds of arrangements. Each state, as I said, has a state agency that um, is called to uh, administrate this, um, and uh, they support and guide the work of the local agencies. Judges themselves are given some interesting tools um, under the family support arrangements that we don't see in other places. Judges have the ability to confer individually with the judge assigned to the same group of individuals in the other state in order to directly figure out where the case should be located and to address other concerns that may affect the ability of one court or the other in order to properly hear the case. All of this special legal arrangement has not ensured that children will be supported or will be raised in a safe environment. Statistical improvement is great, but judges don't live in a world of statistical improvement and theoretical frameworks despite being educated and interested in such systems. Where judges live and work is in the gray area where theory meets practice. The responsibility of a trial judge is to deal with one case at a time, considering the interests of each person involved, whether it's criminal stuff, community versus individual, of ind individual versus individual, business interest against business interest, we apply the law to the infinite variety of human experience. The courtroom is a place where the cracks in the system and its inadequacies are highly visible. And where that very uncomfortable reality, the moral dimension of law is inescapable. Now trial judges decide based on evidence and existing law. We don't make new law and we try to apply it without fear or favor. So sometimes we are required to make decisions that are not at all pleasing to us as individuals. But every case presents on some level issues of fairness and equity. 
Individual legal disputes reflect all of the problems in our society. And for a diligent judge, there is nowhere to hide from this. Some may try, but there is no such thing as a bloodless, purely legal dispute. Some people are negligent, sometimes dreadfully, in the care and support of their children. Some people can't handle the temptations and the negative fallout from activities like gaming. I doubt there is a, any system of law that could correct for this kind of human limitation completely. Gaming brings with it a significant set of potential harms to people. I do not necessarily fault the purveyors of, for example, casino gambling for this, particularly the enterprises of indigenous Americans. Having been robbed of your culture and meaningful ability to participate in the economic si system of the country for decades, the desire to access the resources that gambling can produce is most understandable. But as legal professionals or as law students seeking to be legal professionals, it is critical not to render the individuals who are negatively affected by societal problems like this invisible. Our society is very, very good at taking resources from those who already have little and relocating it to those who already have much. And we are far less efficient in the other direction. Only the most naive would fail to understand that the entire legal system is in many ways designed to serve and in many cases increase the wealth and power of those who already have great wealth and power. And people should be able to spend their money as they wish, is this not so? They deserve to. As Stephen Colbert amusingly put it in a recent program, a billionaire deserves to have that smaller boat that they can nest inside their giant yacht. And they deserve it. They, they need it. They may feel that their life is incomplete without it. They're entitled to make the choice. But the choices of those with lesser means are often judged very harshly by society. Look, that woman, she gambled away her paycheck instead of paying her child support. She's just irresponsible. She's a bad person. I think not. Gambling in particular can pressure people into catastrophic choices. The promise of relief from financial desperation is more than seductive. It seems to offer for once the possibility of moving beyond mere survival or lack of survival to the possibility of a freeing windfall. The moral dimension of gambling law is inescapable and the judges sees those affected by gambling not as a monolith, but at one person of time in their need, pain and weakness in the face of a moral dilemma. One person at a time, one dispute at a time. Life is what happens while you're having a dialogue about the theories. My message as a trial judge to lawyers and academics working with the gaming industry and those who aspire to do so is to try and keep the problems of ordinary people in mind as you work, rightly so, to increase the wealth and success of your clients. And those in opposition to the industry, do not quail in your efforts to improve the situation for ordinary citizens. Such disputation, this tension, is how we creep closer to fairness. And a key piece of this is providing opportunity to settle disputes. These kinds of processes have become increasingly important to the courts in the last couple of decades. And these are processes that are especially important for citizen litigants. It has always been an open secret that the vast majority of cases settle, historically right on the courthouse steps. Well-managed settlement programs that address court cases earlier in their litigation cycle are becoming the norm, a trend that I hope will continue. California requires state trial courts to implement such programs and they have been highly successful. In Santa Barbara County, we designed programs to meet various needs. We have a court employed mediator um, to help work with family law litigants. 
We have a mediator panel for civil disputes of less than $50,000 and one designed for those with a value of over 50,000. And these panels are staffed by volunteer mediators mediators <clears throat> who are attorneys and who are required to meet very rigorous experience and training requirements. We also have a pretrial mandatory settlement conference program that is staffed with special masters. I'm rather proud of this program because the special masters are personally handpicked by me. These programs have been highly successful in reducing the number of cases required to go to court or jury trial. And regardless of the nature of a legal dispute, including gaming related matters, the desire for such cases to settle even before entering the doors of the courthouse should be a core value. Why, you ask? Shouldn't zealous representation in contested hearings be the best tool? For a few cases, yes, absolutely. Some cases have to be tried. For the majority of cases, Unequivocally, no. When I was a lawyer, the masthead on the stationery of my firm identified us as lawyers and counselors at law. Some think this is a bit pretentious, but I think it represents a critical part of legal rep representation, as you will hear. As a judge, I love trial. Court trials are often a tremendous intellectual exercise, and it is a true privilege to work with juries. Despite all you may hear about jury nullification and jury misbehavior, juries work, and they prove their worth in trial courts every day. The problems are visible because of their rarity. When you consider the countless ordinary juries hearing ordinary disputes all over the nation in countless county courts every day, this becomes inescapable. And speaking from my own experience, I find jurors to be attentive, hardworking, and surprisingly serious about their task. Everybody hates receiving their jury summons and most complain bitterly about the need to serve if they've never served on a jury. But those who have served often develop a very different perspective. I get letters all the time after trials from jurors that describe how interesting and fulfilling their participation was. We rarely think about how juries work until we need one or until we've been a party in a case that needed one and we learn the critical importance of a juror of one's peers in reaching a solution to particular disputes. Lawyers who do trial work regularly must like trial too. <laughs> At least I hope they do. <laughs> and I did when I was in practice. It represents the highest and best use of skills that have been honed in practice over many years. And of course, every attorney wants to win the case on behalf of their client and are disappointed when they lose. But despite that, if a lawyer has done the best job possible for their client, they can walk away with a sense of professional pride and satisfaction despite that disappointment and hopefully with a paid invoice. But this is not the case for litigants. No one from the humblest ordinary person to a captain of industry wants to be sued, nor if they are normal and not unbalanced, but of course, unbalanced people do exist, do they want to sue other people? The necessity to sue or to respond to a suit is very emotionally charged, and it impacts the ability to process a dispute in a detached and logical way. Trial is hard for litigants. It takes them away from the ordinary activities of their lives to be in court where they're compelled to listen to testimony that they may find painful or even insulting. And in nearly all cases, it also involves the necessity of the complaining and responding parties to testify. I've been surprised over the years by the number of very sophisticated business people who are up in front of groups of people every day who are terrified about the idea of testifying. It can be quite daunting to contemplate taking the stand. Will you be understood? Will you be believed? Will your view of the events carry the day? Will your positions in the case survive cross-examination? It is a scary process if you aren't in and out of courtrooms every day. 
and the emotional cost to litigants is high. And of course, litigation is very expensive and trial is the most expensive part. Attorney hours mount up, expenses may be substantial, including things like expert witnesses who can be very costly indeed. I love and respect lawyers. I was one once as nearly all judges were. And the work people are worthy of their hire. And the zealous attorney has to put in the hours to do a good job, but those hours cost the litigant or a responsible party like an insurance company a lot of money. Sometimes more money than the case is worth. But this can be very hard to see when you're emotionally involved as parties generally are, or if you're trying to implement a corporate policy that may not be the best approach for the particular case. These issues apply to very large litigants. You know, it takes a very, very large enterprise indeed. And sometimes they're even the more uh, economically oriented than smaller firms um, to spend the kind of money that it takes to fight. There may be companies out there, and I think we know who they are, who some of them are, who seem to just be willing to, you know, do not a penny in tribute, everything for the argument, not a penny in tribute, but they were always been rare and they're becoming even rarer in this day and age. But that doesn't mean the people that they've put in charge of it are implementing a good policy. And the courts are of course a consistent target of research by legal scholars, psychologists, sociologists, and academics. Many of you listening here today may be very familiar with this research. And it shows that over time, that those who research court outcomes and those who interview parties downstream from a lawsuit find that settling parties are generally more satisfied with the process. It is a situation rife with, if only I had known. It is hard indeed to look in the rear view mirror and realize that the case could have been disposed of with far less expenditure emotionally and financially. And of course, one has to add here reputationally, because again, particularly for large litigants, sometimes the public relations barriers and, and uh, results of such litigation can be um, extremely serious indeed. Which brings me back to the idea of attorneys and counselors at law. The lawyer's job, in my opinion, goes well beyond representation and must include efforts to counsel, to educate, and to make sure that a client clearly understands what the future may hold. Because clients are so enmeshed with their disputes, it can be hard for them to see that their hoped for outcome may not occur and that in fact, the outcome at most trials is highly unpredictable. And not infrequently, trials result in something that neither side expects. It's surprising to me how little this particular attribute is known. And this causes much consternation after the fact. So I would urge all the law students here to pursue education in settlement modalities and in negotiation. Not only should you consider solid coursework in this area, but look for internship and authorization programs and opportunities and practical skills opportunities to develop your professional expertise in this area. You might even consider at some point making mediation and dispute resolution your primary legal activity. Some of my happiest years in law practice were my final years, which I spent in a practice limited to mediation and appropriate dispute resolution. Such practice offers a way to use your legal skills in a way that truly benefits others. Now, few things top sitting behind counsel table and hearing the jury come back with a verdict in favor of your client in a hard fought case. But for me, that paled in the light of walking out of my office, having succeeded in helping parties achieve a successful settlement. I'm gonna end my formal remarks here because I'm hoping that you have questions 
And this is because the most useful part of an exercise of this kind can be that dialogue. So I thank you for your attention and fire away. Thank you, Judge Stern, so much. And we're gonna give the floor to Professor Werner um, in one moment, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. And I have a list and we will also be accepting questions in the chat, live questions. Um, Don't be shy. Thank yes, thank you so much. <laughs> professor Werner, Bill Werner is an associate professor in the College of Hospitality at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he teaches undergraduate um, and graduate courses in hospitality law, employment law, labor relations, hotel security, and risk management, which is a great course. I highly recommend it. He has served two terms as chair of the hotel management department and presently chairs the department and college, and college bylaws committees. He is a certified hospitality educator and has twice been named Boyd Distinguished Professor. Prior to his appointment to UNLV in 2001, Bill practiced law in Las Vegas for 12 years, first in the law firm of Smith & Kochka, then as in-house counsel for Mirage Resorts, which is now part of MGM Resorts, and Boyd Gaming Corporation. His law practice included representation of employers, member, um, representation of employers in employment litigation, personal injury litigation, and labor negotiations. He is an active member of the State Bar of Nevada, the Clark County Bar Association, and the International Council on Hotel, Restaurant, and International Institutional Education. Professor Werner's primary research interests are in the areas of employment dispute resolution, wage and hour laws, and labor management relations. His research has been published in the Cornell Hotel and Restaurant Administration Quarterly, the Florida International University Hospitality Review, and the Nevada Practitioner's Journal on Labor and Employment Law. He co-edited Student Freedom Revisited, Contemporary Issues and Perspectives, and co-authored Managing Hospitality Human Resources, sixth edition. Bill's a graduate of the, university, the Ohio State University, I'm so sorry, I apologize, and the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Yeah, there it is. He was born and raised in Kettering, Ohio, and has resided in Las Vegas since 1989. Take it away, Professor Werner. Well, thanks very much, Elsa. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to participate in this. Uh, I want to be clear about one thing in that history is that it was a long time ago that I worked in-house at uh, Boyd Gaming Corporation. That's really what I want to uh, address is my time there, because that was a period of time when the expansion of gaming was just beginning. So. We were a Nevada corporation at just uh, operating in Nevada. And then during the time I was there, we expanded out into six other states and operations. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. But uh, what I just want to give the students for the most part is a picture of what it's like to be an in-house lawyer in a company that's going into an interstate practice. And some of the issues we dealt with, some of the things that surprised us. Uh, that we wish we'd been better prepared for, we probably would have, uh, but things that come up, issues that come up, uh, particularly with a gaming company, but a lot of this will apply to others as well. Um, the first has to do with the problem of practicing law without a license. Um, I had a Nevada license, uh, but that was it. And when we started expanding it to Mississippi, Louisiana, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, uh, the first problem we have, we have an in-house legal team of six or seven lawyers, but we, our local counsel in the beginning, were our local gaming counsel and our corporate transactions. And they led the beginning of that uh, process of moving into these other states. So now we have issues of employment law, of uh, workers' compensation liability, personal injury litigation. Those sorts of things that come up once the operations actually begin, where now we're trying from an in-house legal department in Nevada to solve problems in, in other states. And we get phone calls. One of the parts of being an in-house lawyer is that your phone rings constantly. And, uh, and the questions would be something, for example, uh, the human resources manager called me from Missouri and said, um, you know, we've got this person in the HR office, and they're telling us that in Missouri, if you fire somebody, you have to give them a written statement uh, of the reason that you fired them. 
And uh, I'd never heard of that before. Certainly don't have to do that in Nevada or any place else that, uh, that we've done business. But go look it up. And uh, well, sure enough, there, there is a Missouri law about that. You don't have to be very specific, uh, but you do have to provide this letter for them. Uh, but then uh, if you've uh, taken professional responsibility class, which I'm assuming most of your uh, classmates have at this point, you think, wait a minute, aren't you practicing law in the state of Missouri when you do that? You are advising a Missouri business about Missouri law and giving them advice about what to do in that legal situation. Isn't that the practice of law? And our answer at the time was, I sure hope not, but we better look into that. And what we found looking into it is that, uh, first of all, from state to state, the definition of what is practice of law is different. The ABA rules provide not totally clear guidance, but as you know, state by state, they make their own decisions about things like that. And so um, it was something we immediately were concerned with was what can we do and what can't we do for our other jurisdiction properties uh, and to try to draw some boundaries about that. One thing that is very helpful in, in all of the literature is that there's a distinction when you're in-house counsel you can act as the attorney of the corporation. You are also capable of acting as an agent of that corporation, not practicing law. So if I'm negotiating with a labor union in another state, a human resources vice president could be doing the same thing without a license, without a license to practice law. So uh, we wanna make some distinctions between what is advice, what is uh, just being an agent of the company performing some task uh, for that company. What we came down to was if it was a matter of legal advice or interpretation of local law, that we automatically would retain local counsel to do that for us. And even if it was something simple, well, then fine, give me a simple letter uh, explaining this to me. But we want to be careful about that because in a lot of states, practice of law is not a violation of professional ethics because you're not licensed to be a lawyer there. It's a crime in the state to practice law without a license. And something you have to be very careful about when you're applying for gaming licenses is that you are legally super clean. Uh, you don't wanna to have to answer for things like that in a gaming licensing hearing. So uh, that's kind of where we drew the line on that. And of course, you're going to be retaining counsel outside anyway. You're going to have to, if you're going to operate in a bunch of states. The very first uh, out-of-state property we opened was in Tunica, Mississippi. None of us had been to Tunica, uh, Mississippi before. We None of us had practiced. The gaming lawyers had an easier time of it because Mississippi gaming law was very similar to Nevada gaming law. Uh, but it was those attorneys who had control of the situation until operations began, and then the rest of us come in. And so at that point, we had law firms we had hired to do that part. And those firms mostly were big firms that could also handle other things too. They could do the employment discrimination cases. They could do uh, the labor relations or, or whatnot. That's kind of a, a distinction when you're looking for uh, what we called outhouse counsel from the inside, uh, we referred to them as outhouse counsel, but uh, not disparagingly most of the time. But if they did gaming, they might be a specialty firm that does just gaming. So now we're going to need another uh, attorney. If we hire an employment specialist to do employment, okay, that's great. But now we need personal injury defense too. And you can end up with four, five, six different firms in the same state. What we found for the most part was that it made sense, it cost a little more upfront, is to hire really big law firms uh, for two reasons. One is they could handle just about anything we had. Uh, if they had a gaming practice, they also had an injury practice and an employment practice and uh, other licensing practices, and that, things that we were going to need anyway. So that, uh, that provided that without going and hiring more lawyers. The other nice thing about a big law firm is they have lots of attorneys who are licensed in multiple states. 
So we don't have to deal with this problem of who's practicing law in what state. You got a firm that has attorneys licensed in four or five, six different states. We had one firm in Illinois, everything that we needed in Indiana, they had somebody who could do it and who was licensed in Indiana. So you pick some on efficiency that way. One of the problems, well, one of the responsibilities of in-house counsel is just is managing outhouse counsel. So you get the legal bills, you get the, um, you know, the phone calls, what should we do about this? We've got a depth, who's our person most knowledgeable about this? You spend a lot of time talking with uh, your outside counsel. And if you've got five different law firms, uh, it's gonna take up more of your time than if you have one. And so that's what we found. Other, uh, other companies did it differently. Other companies thought if I'm in an employment discrimination lawsuit, I want one of these national employment litigation uh, firms. And certainly a good decision there, but uh, as, as the good judge mentioned, we, uh, we stay out of court as much as we possibly could. I mean, that was our objective was to not have to go to trial. I mean, unless there were times when you just have to, there, there's just no other way, no doubt. Uh, but from our perspective, we have to report all of our litigation. When we went before gaming licensing, you had to report all your major litigation, what was happening. And uh, we found it a lot more advantageous uh, to settle cases, even when they were disputable, that maybe if we paid a little more than we had to, that we would benefit uh, on the back end from that, because we didn't, uh, we didn't have to spend a lot of time in litigation. And when you're the one reviewing all the legal bills, um, trials get more and more and more expensive every day. And you think every day you look at another monthly bill and think, you know, what are we fighting for here? What's the prize if we if we win this? And lots of times the prize is you might pay a little less money than the money you're going to pay anyway. So uh, lots of times it just made sense to us to settle cases, even when we might have fared better in a trial. That was okay with us. The, um, the next thing, I hope all the law students have heard this before because we heard it to death when we were in law school, which was anytime you talk about something in all these different states and say, well, here's how it is pretty much in every other state, except Louisiana. Louisiana is different. And if you leave law school without hearing Louisiana is different, then I don't know, I think you missed something because not just the law, just not the thing about the civil code and all that, but the, the legal system there is a little bit different. The courts are divided up into different jurisdictional uh, settings than what we're used to. And in our case, unfortunately, it also led to a very difficult situation, which was uh, in our first two operations, we didn't require any local partner. We owned 100%. We went in, we got the license, we operate. But then in Louisiana, we had a local partner and that was necessary because we had to, um, the local politics and the local situation was you, you need to have a local partner here and, and okay, we did. Um, unfortunately, our local partner got himself into some legal trouble. And uh, if you wanna read about Edwin Edwards uh, and, the, uh, and his corruption trial in the state of Louisiana, it's great reading and it's a thrilling story. Uh, it, it could not be better as fiction, it's such a great story. Uh, but one of the people who was paying bribes to Governor Edwards and was our partner. And he never accused Boyd Gaming of being involved in this. He swore in federal court, we knew nothing about it. Nobody ever claimed that we had anything to do with it, but it is a little bit close to home when your partner uh, turned state's evidence in a corruption trial. So uh, we dealt with that situation in Louisiana. And just to sum that up, uh, Edwin Edwards was elected governor uh, at the same time that the state authorized gaming and the state law authorized the governor to appoint the members of the gaming commission who would decide who got the limited license in the state of Louisiana. So essentially authorizing gaming and giving all the authority uh, to the governor 
who unfortunately took great uh, personal and financial advantage of that situation and eventually was tried and convicted for uh, corruption in that case for taking bribes. So that's one of the problems of a local partner is that you can, uh, is you're not quite sure what they're doing. Uh, but the other is this, is we found that our, we had local partners in a couple of other places that held small parts. This, this person was not a 50% owner, but it's very important when you go into a partnership, uh, not just the legal uh, foundation of the partnership, the who has what legal authority and whatnot, but also kind of what I call power sharing arrangement, which is who's going to make the operational decisions day to day? Because what we found is that we had a 5% partner who was there at the property every day, telling the managers what to do, uh, making changes, changing rules. And we said, wait, we own 95% of this. So we have to make, we have to draw some boundaries for our local partners here. Um, and the other, going back to the professional ethics problem, is now you're in a partnership and you will remember from professional ethics all the problems that can happen in a partnership where an attorney represents one partner and then there's a conflict in the partnership. So the other partner now needs separate counsel to avoid the conflict of interest. And then, so now you have more people involved. And you're negotiating essentially against yourself when you're in a conflict with your partner. Uh, and so having separate counsel, now you have the company's local counsel and you have the in-house counsel at the, at the corporation. And now you have three attorneys at the table, um, which right, two attorneys is hard enough to resolve something. Three, now it's going to get really difficult. And so, um, that's something when you take in a, a, a partnership like that is to make sure you understand not just the legal situation, but also the operational situation. Who actually gets to make the rules here? Who gets to tell the general manager you're doing something wrong here? Uh, and what happens if one of those local partners gets into trouble and, and how can that affect you? So as you can imagine, uh, we had to uh, address this at every other gaming jurisdiction about, you know, your partner has just turned state's evidence. But, um, you know, we successfully did that. And, and frankly, Boyd Gaming Corporation has a very clean reputation. They've always had a very clean reputation. And so it was not a big problem for us, but uh, certainly not a comfortable situation to be in, uh, especially when the person causing a problem is a minority partner uh, in the operation to start with. So I guess the moral of that story is be careful who you go into business with, but you can't uh, you can't foresee everything that everything that they're going to do. Um, another big issue we ran into. So we started. We were obviously land based in Nevada. It's the only thing you can be. Uh, but we moved into Tunica, Mississippi. That was a riverboat casino, although it was not a boat by any definition. Uh, it was not on the river. It was near the river. It was permanently moored. It was set on pilings that was never going to float anywhere. But that was good enough for the state of Louisiana. So that didn't cause a lot of problems for us because we weren't navigating on the Mississippi River. We, we weren't involved with Coast Guard regulation or any of that. Then we went to Missouri or uh, Louisiana. And now you have to be a riverboat and you have to navigate. And so our boat was not on the river, it was on Lake Pontchartrain, uh, but that counts as navigable waters in the United States. And so now we're facing all the maritime regulation. And that means Coast Guard regulation, it means Army Corps of Engineers, uh, it means you have to have pilots and, and uh, captains who are licensed. Uh, to operate uh, those vessels. You have to learn, as I did then, that there's a difference between a boat and a vessel. And if you call it a boat, that's what you go fishing in. A vessel is what you do business on. That's how it was explained to me. So, uh, but, so now all of a sudden we have all these maritime laws. Well, you're going to need another local council now. You need a maritime expert for that. You can't uh, hire somebody next to them to go learn maritime law for you. So, uh, that was a whole nother thing. And it brings in a lot of different problems. So the states were governing how much 
how close to a vessel did you really have to be? Each one was different. So some called it all that maritime law into, into place and some didn't. Uh, Indiana, we had to sail uh, on Lake Michigan, but we didn't have to go into Lake Michigan. So we had kind of like this big trench. It was about a thousand yard long. And we the sailed, the vessel sailed up and down this trench. Uh, but that's legally for them, that was as good as sailing across the lake and back. It made no difference. But that's operationally now you have to shut your doors and move. And it sounds ridiculous, but it's like, well, that's what the state regulation is there. So that's what we're going to have to do. Um, the other states like uh, Mississippi, uh, for example, that, that not really concerned at all. Uh, and then Missouri had some uh, a different, they had kind of a hybrid, which is you had to be able to sail, but you didn't actually have to do it. So you had to be Coast Guard certified. You had to be vessel. but you could mock sail. So that just meant you have to close your doors and not let anybody in or out while you are virtually sailing. You haven't moved. Your, your vessel is still right there. It doesn't, it never moves, but you have to act like it's moving. Uh, so you can imagine that. So now you have to announce to the, all your, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to lock the doors for 45 minutes and everybody would run off the, the casino they would get out. And so then you have to develop land-based facilities to try to keep them there until you can open. So each of these states, a different situation. Like I said, some of this has changed since then. This was, uh, this was 20 years ago, uh, but I think it gives uh, an idea, especially for law students thinking about working in-house, that uh, it seems like a great job. In a lot of ways, it really is a great job. And, and being that closely tied with a company um, sometimes it makes it a lot easier to, uh, to work with them, but you're also expected to come up with solutions to new problems that may be something you've never seen before. Uh, here's an example. If you're under maritime law and your employees get injured, that's not a workers' comp case. That is a Jones Act case under the federal maritime law. And our first experience when I first heard about the Jones Act after we'd already had an injury on the vessel. Well, it's a little late to be learning about that. Our insurance people were aware of it. We were insured for it. But the most shocking thing was a Jones Act plaintiff, this is an employee injured in the course of work, is considered under the Jones Act a seaman working in the service of the vessel. Uh, that was not very clear back then. Well, wait, this you know, okay, the people, the Marine crew, obviously they're, they're seamen, they're sailors, but um, a decision came out of a, a federal court somewhere uh, and it was a hairstylist working on a cruise boat who, who filed a Jones Act claim. And everybody said, what well, hairstylist, that's not a seaman, that's the uh, legal definition, the legal word, uh, a seaman in the service of the vessel, the court said, well, it depends on what the purpose of the vessel is. And if the vessel includes hairstyling, then the hairstylist is working in the service of the vessel. And that basically puts everybody on the entire vessel under the Jones Act. The problem is, first of all, the Jones Act is like personal injury law. So first of all, you get not just, you get compensatory damage, general damages, pain and suffering, it's the same remedies as in a personal injury lawsuit under the Jones Act. And the second, which I hadn't heard until we actually went to a trial in a Jones Act case, that under existing law in the Jones Act, the plaintiff's burden of proof is, quote, featherweight, end quote. And when I heard that in the jury instructions, I thought, boy, now that's something I wish I had heard earlier, because featherweight burden of proof. And I kept hearing that over and over and over again, like that can't be good for us. And it means, well, if they say they got hurt, then they got hurt. Uh, you better prove they didn't. And of course, when you're dealing with back strains and you know the typical kind of workers' compensation problems, now these are personal injury cases and ones that are, uh, that are not particularly difficult to prove. The other thing that the Jones Act allows is class actions. So an employees can file a class action the same as 
uh, guests can. And so we had one of those. We had a secondhand smoke uh, class action. All of our employees in a class action for uh, injuries sustained in secondhand smoke. We thought, well, come on, that's going to be hard to prove. Well, not if your burden is featherweight, it isn't going to be hard to prove. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's something we just, we Sorry about that. Okay. So did you hear the part about that wasn't my fault? Okay. All right. So um, of course, another issue now, one of our other casinos was tribal, tribal gaming. So we went into a partnership with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi. And of course, that's a whole nother legal world is to be involved in tribal gaming. Uh, this was not real long after the Indian Gaming Reform Act was passed. And so some of these state compacts that are very common now uh, were fairly not young then. But uh, you have to deal with the sovereignty uh, of the tribe on their reservation, which, um, you know, which courts are we going to go to? Most tribes have their own police, their own courts. Uh, so you have to deal with questions of that. Usually those are done ahead of time. Uh, but to do that ahead of time in a contract, you have to foresee it. You have to see uh, that those are coming. Um, the last thing I want to add, uh, I hope I'm not going past my time, is I, I want to address one thing for the students who are thinking about working in-house. And it, it's a great job. There's a lot of great things to it. Um, but there's a very common myth that people have about in-house that I wanted to spell for you very quickly. And that is what I call the one client myth, where if you work for a corporation, uh, one of the great advantages is you have one client. You don't have all these different corporations all competing for your time, all trying to prioritize uh, your work for you. Uh, and that is a good part. And it's nice, especially Boyd Gaming was great because the chairman of the bo uh, board, Mr. Boyd's also a lawyer. and uh, he understood issues uh, that, that we had to uh, that we had to bring to him. Um, but the downside is this: is that really you don't have just one client. Really, you have lots of clients because every executive, every GM, every department manager, the way they see it is they have their own lawyer and they don't have to pay them, and they can call them whenever they want, and they can run anything past legal for free. And now it's those people that are competing for the time and the attention of the legal department. And so that, that one client, <clears throat> excuse me, the one client problem uh, is still there because you have different properties, you have managers in different states, uh, they have different problems and you still have to juggle, you still have to prioritize those problems and deal with, well, what, what really comes first? And what happens when you get too much of, uh, let's run it past legal. Now in business, what you'll find very quickly, run it past legal is a, is a defensive mechanism as far as we were concerned. Because, well, if I'm not sure about this, let's run it past legal. And then if it goes bad, then we'll just say, well, legal approved it. So, you know, it's not my fault, you blame legal. Um, and you get that a lot. Uh, when you work as in-house counsel, you get a lot of phone calls. People would not have called a lawyer if they had to pay 200 bucks for the phone call. But because they're in-house, they're already paid. Go ahead and call them. So lots of times you have to respond to those questions by saying, well, you know, my legal advice is all of your options here are legal. So I think it's a good decision for a manager to make, not a lawyer, uh, and, and try to deflect some of that. But it's one of the things uh, to, to understand going in-house is that first of all, corporations who have in-house counsel, they don't all do the same stuff in-house. We had a relatively small legal department and we hired a lot of lawyers on the outside. I think there was a great advantage of that. As I talked about in my class a lot, I hope you remember it, Elsa, is that you know managing your own lawyers is part of business. And it's an important part of business to understand what they're doing and to understand when they say, well, do you think we should go to trial or settle? That your opinion of that may be different than theirs. And you have to balance that. Your lawyer, of course, they're duty bound. They, they act in your best interest, but best interest isn't always objective. And 
you have to, it was advantageous to us, I believe, to have attorneys on the inside reading legal bills, reading the, the case summaries and, uh, and helping out with the decisions, especially settlement decisions when uh, it's, it's difficult, there's no correct answer. And a general manager just, just doesn't really know uh, where to turn with something like that. So I would not dissuade people from working in house, but do it knowing that uh, you're probably gonna have more clients than you had when you were working at a law firm. So that's um, that's the sum of my notes for now. I'm happy to answer questions. I'll I'll answer a lot more questions about Edwin Edwards if you want. That's something I researched a whole lot on the side, and it was a fascinating trial. But I do want to give you before I go. I want to give you one little brain teaser for uh, for the law students here, and it goes like this. So Edwards um, he accepted bribes from uh, all this is public record. He's I've been convicted of all of it. I'm not worried about defamation, but he, um, he was accepting bribes in exchange for telling his appointees on the gaming commission to license these particular people. And there were a limited number of licenses, So it was a very competitive process, which meant people were willing to pay a lot of money for that. And our partner and many other people paid the bribe. Well, he got caught when somebody, he paid him a bribe, but then they didn't get the gaming license. And they eventually, that person eventually went to the FBI and reported them and, and, and then they put bugs on them and they, and they blew the whole thing up. Um, but Edwards, when he got to his trial, he said, well, hang on a sec. If somebody gives me money, in that case, $600,000, under the assumption that I will perform some political favor for them in exchange for that money, and I accept the money, but I don't do the favor. That's not bribery. I'm going to think about that for a minute. It's still a federal crime, but that was his. Uh, that was one of his arguments: is that no bribery is when you pay for a political favor. So if you pay, but there is no political favor, that's just a, a poorly uh, informed gift of some kind. Uh, of course, that didn't work, and, uh, and he went to prison for eight years. Uh, but uh, it's the kind of thing that if you were on the outside, you could say, boy, I'm glad that's not my client. Uh, from the inside, we, we have to deal with a problem like this. So in any event, I'm happy to have uh, whatever, whatever questions uh, people have. I appreciate you uh, also involving me in this today. It's great. Distinguished company to be in. I uh, thank you so much, Professor Warner. That is fantastic. Um, I've caught Judge Stern's reaction to some of these <laughs> comments. <laughs> Got to get her on here. Um, Judge Stern, any comments about either Edwin Edwards, uh, his argument? Did, would that not fly in your court either? Or would you be a little more loosey goosey about that? And then um, how about that featherweight burden of proof? Oh, you're, you're muted, Judge Stern. I said both things are utterly horrifying. And yep. yeah, in my court, it would probably be a bribe. Oh yeah. <laughs> but it would of course depend on what law I was applying, but gosh, that sounds like a bribe to me. You know, you're, you may be a bad giver, but he was a bad receiver. So <laughs> there you go. Right, um, right. And the featherweight burden of proof, that one is really astonishing. You know, I'm an old tort war horse from way back that my, I had a mostly an insurance defense trial practice. and. I mean, that would have given me sleepless nights. I just, you know, talk about a motivator to settlement. That would be it because, um, you know, hard to know what a jury would do with something like a featherweight, you know, because a featherweight of proof doesn't necessarily mean a featherweight of compensation. There you go. That, that is a good point. Um, and I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, no, both both of you were excellent. Thank you guys, seriously, both on a personal level for your time here. Um, okay, so this is for both of you. What are um, some of the biggest changes to either the courtroom or the legal system that you have seen since the beginning of the COVID pandemic? That's definitely a big issue on our minds. Well, yeah, I'll just dive in because one just like pops fully formed into my mind. 
which is I grew up with courts and practice as a judge in courts where personal appearance in the courtroom was a critical piece. And Zoom appearance, like what we're doing here today, is going to become the norm. It is economically incredibly beneficial for attorneys and their clients. It makes life a little tougher for the self-represented person in a whole variety of ways. But we're trying to think of ways that those problems can be alleviated. I think they're with us here to stay. The other thing is that they are interestingly um, reducing trial costs in certain instances where it is not uncommon at all now. And people are very desirous to have all of their expert witnesses appear via Zoom because then they're not paying for trial time and accommodations. They're only paying for that window of time when they've got the expert on the stand speaking their, their piece. So tech, and, and this sort of opened a door. There's all kinds of discussions about tech that are, you know, people were resisting so hard. Things like um, remote um, arraignment in criminal cases and public defenders saying, you know, personal right to confront and you, you know, you've got to be physically present. Um, PDs and DAs to, are on both sides softening on some of these positions, understanding some of the advantages. And you know, certainly sheriff's departments and other people that are doing services like transporting prisoners, you know, feel strongly that, you know, and now that we spent money setting up these systems in many counties and where the jails are connected with the courts, no one wants to turn that clock back. I can think of many other things, but that's the one that I would mention. Mr. Warner. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, of course, I've been uh, I've been teaching for 20 years, so uh, I'm completely out of the legal field now. But um, I can tell you uh, two things. Well, first, and I hope your I hope your classmates share my dislike for online education. But that's a completely different uh, uh, seminar, and I'd be glad to happy you to uh, talk at that. That one too, but um, but I can tell you from a legal standpoint, the questions the there was a lot of questions over uh, employment in Las Vegas. Of course, everybody got laid off, and um, there were a lot of uh, legal questions that came up about uh, safety when people started opening back up. Is the OSHA regulations about uh, personal protective gear and uh, those sort of things. Um, personally protected if people have, um, let's say underlying health condition that they don't want to return to work. It's a health condition that would not qualify as a disability, but it is complicating enough to make somebody want to, well, if there's a risk of exposure, I don't feel safe going to work. And so there's a workplace safety uh, concern there. For the most part on the employment law side, uh, the, the big issue about the pandemic was not the employment law part, it was the labor relations part, which was the union uh, struggling to keep their members working. And that really came down to a couple of big uh, negotiation points uh, later on, but they were in the middle of a labor contract that of course did not anticipate any of this. Uh, and so that's something that I think we'll see play. We're actually gonna see the pandemic play out next year as labor contracts are renegotiated in the mm -hmm. hotels and whether they're going to start to think about, well, we should make provisions for if this happens again, is uh, what can we do to, to uh, protect workers and to protect their rights to come back to work? And that's really been the, the, the big issue right now is which employees get selected to come back to work. Right to work is a very hot topic in um, Nevada. And going off of the employment issues, what, or sorry, how would changes in the legalization of sports betting affect employment in institutions where the practices are taking place? Would it have any major implications on existing employment law issues? If you gave me that two days ago, I'd probably come up with something to say. I just, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, there's, I know there's a lot of people who are professional sports book managers now, just because there's so much more opportunity. But uh, other than labor market, frankly, uh, there, 
their employees with the specialization that, uh, that we didn't need before, but otherwise I don't. I, the only thing I would be able to say is it may be a source of just more litigated problems, which is, you know, anytime you um, increase activities that, again, some persons in the community consider to have a profound moral dimension and that if they're the type of activity that unfortunately might be susceptible to criminal activity, it'll have an effect on the legal system. But you know what that would be is very hard to predict. Understandable. Um, judge Stern, as a judge who oversees hundreds of family law cases each year, seeing both the worst and best of humanity, how do you maintain your mental health? And for both of you, what strategies do you use and what strategies do you suggest for new lawyers? How wonderful that you assume that I've maintained my mental health. <laughs> oh, no, it, it is an issue, but it's an issue for judges that cuts across all areas of practice, not just family law. Again, one thing is sort of the, the cognitive dissonance effect where sometimes you're applying law and you're having to make a decision where you're thinking, boy, this really doesn't necessarily serve equity, but it's the way it has got to be. And so that can start to, to stress. The other thing is just the quantity of work, um, especially as we try and recover from COVID. Our caseloads are enormous. Our backlogs and the delays have been enormous. So um, our working hours are long and stressful. Um, but then that's true of lawyers everywhere. It's true of most professionals everywhere. And the tools available are the same tools that, that are always discussed, which is, and, and, and in fact, the Administrative Office of the Courts here in California encourages judges, take your vacations. Don't try and be, you know, Susie Strongwoman, take your vacation time. Um, you know, try and control your court calendars, use good court management skills. And if you need to, you know, calm down a week a bit in order to take care of a medical issue or whatever it may be, do that for yourself. Don't just let the, the quantity of the work sort of run rush shot over you. And then of course, there are the things that, that all professionals um, could be encouraged to think about in stressful environments. You know, have a philosophical or spiritual dimension to your life that is a place where you can put and think about these kinds of problems. Cultivate friendships outside the profession. And I emphasize outside the profession because those people will be a fertile source of com both comfort and, and interest and, and, um, and encouragement, um, both for you to play hooky when you can and also for, for you know, expressing a different mode of understanding of what you might be going through. Um, and if you do end up in a real bind, um, seek professional assistance if you need. And I don't know how it is in, in the court programs in other states and counties, but in our state, there is a unit within the administrative office of the courts that um, shepherds a program of essentially wellness services for, for judges that judges can access and get information much as some employee, employee, employee insurance programs have such resources. My advice is entirely different, which is quit practicing law, get a job as a teacher, <laughs> and you will be happy all your days. Or get a job as a judge. I don't, well, I'm not uh, allowed to practice law anymore. <laughs> but, See, that's good. I, and I refer to myself in academics as a recovering lawyer because <laughs> I, I try, I actively try. I used to carry a practice on the side and found that even that. Um, but what I would say to students is this, whether it's practicing law or whatever you're doing, if you like your job, if you enjoy doing your job, you're going to be okay. Um, if you enjoy having a lot of time off and wearing a tie, about twice a year, uh, teaching is a great profession for you, but there's not quite as many jobs available. But, um, you know, I, I certainly agree with the judge. You got to be careful that there are a lot of harmful factors that you're working along. 
Uh, you know, it's kind of like doing like a dangerous mining job. Be aware of the dangers and do everything you can to protect yourself from it. Um, but I uh, cannot say that I've ever had a minute when I regretted uh, turning in my license and doing something else for a living. Well, becoming a judge um, was very, you know, um, I think a salutary move for me. I, I often find myself feeling great compassion. I mean, as we came out of COVID mm -hmm. for the attorneys who practice in my court, because this to last time period has brought just extraordinary stresses and strains to the practice of law, you know, um, not the least of which is how do you keep a practice going that, you know, has employees and so on when, you're, when your um, income has gone through the floor and things of that nature, tough times. You are in good company. Neither of you are the first um, of today's symposium to encourage us to find a new route and not be lawyers. So <laughs> you are in good company. Um, how, okay, so going back to something that Judge Stern, you actually just spoke about and how Zoom Court has interacted with the prisons and, and setting up. How has Zoom Court, I've heard, maybe you can attest differently, that Zoom Court has helped the self-represented defendants or litigants in a way that was a little bit unenvisioned? Well, it's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, when we're talking about just access to the courthouse, um, it's very helpful. Um, and it also means access to court services that say if you're an, a worker who works odd hours or you have trouble getting away from work to say go see a family law facilitator or attend a court sponsored child custody mediation or come to a mandatory settlement conference or whatever it may be. There are many aspects of remote appearance that can help um, self-represented persons. But I also think that, that something is lost in the ability to be physically present in the court, to be able to communicate with someone directly. Um, it, you know, and it also means when, when they're in court over Zoom, I can't say to them, just um, the family law facilitator's office is right down the corridor here to your right. Stop in there on your way out and talk to Kristen. You know, I can't, I can't give the direct um, impactful uh, uh, assistance, appropriate assistance to, to litigants. Um, it's on balance, do I think it has more to offer than it takes away? I think I'd have to answer that question with a guarded yes, as long as we keep on working on some of the challenges. Interesting. Um, Professor Werner, sorry, just since we've had a little bit of the mob on the brain from our keynote speaker, some of our students are interested to know if you were aware of the Mafia's hold or any uh, mob connections on certain casinos in Las Vegas while you were either counsel for Steve Wynn or at Mirage or at Boyd. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't you understand he has to say no? I was going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> yeah, well... Put it this way, I worked for Boyd Gaming. Boyd Gaming was the company that the federal government designated to come in and operate the Stardust and the Fremont at the end of the movie casino. So we've always been, as a matter of fact, we were called in Missouri, one of the Missouri commissioners called us the Boy Scouts of Gaming. Uh, and it was a designation we were very happy to have. It served us very well. Um, Everybody knew uh, what was going on. But by the time I got to Las Vegas, um, that was pretty much, go of course, they're still around. My son went to preschool with Tony Spalatro's grandson. Um, and so when you go in and see that name on the little board in the preschool, uh, you know, okay, I'm, I'm in Vegas now. But um, no, when by the time I got there, the corporations had taken over the casino industry, and if there was a mob influence, they were in smaller businesses and uh, and really on their way out. Um, the thing in uh, in Louise, Louisiana, of course, is different, and um, and things were different there. But it was um, it was pretty much gone. Uh, by the time that I got to Vegas, and the gaming industry had definitely cleaned out. Uh, and 
working in a company that that prided itself on on being the opposite of them and and operating super clean games and uh, everything transparent. Uh, and I think that's why that's why we got that uh, that reputation that, that we have and that they still have today. I can attest to that they are a very clean company. Um, can you tell both of us? Uh, can both of you? Can you tell us about the pros and cons of alternative dispute resolution and how taking a collaborative approach is different than litigating a case? Clearly, both of you don't really feel we should go to trial, even though you are a judge. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, expand on that? Well, yes. Um, the, the phrase um, alternative dispute resolution is outdated. What we refer to in the biz these days is appropriate dispute resolution. It's not one size fit all. Some call it the multi-door courthouse. You might be walking into traditional litigation. You might, might be walking into a doorway for arbitration. You might be walking into a doorway for mediation. You might be walking into a doorway for recommending mediation. The idea is expanding the tools available so that you have tools that fit the dispute, both in terms of its size, its um, financial value, and the kind of issues that are at stake. Um, you know, uh, I don't think a case gets to trial in our court without having gone through probably at least two appropriate of dispute resolution proceedings. One is our, um, we would have something called Samadras, which is an early um, uh, uh, mediation education at settlement conference program. Nearly all significant litigated cases are um, uh, referred to that program very early on. Um, and we tell them that the program is designed, that it's desi uh, designed for the time when you know about enough about the case that you can negotiate, but before you've spent tons of money on you know, depositions and thousands of records being subpoenaed and everything. It's designed to fit into that slot when you know enough about the case to either be over cocky or too scared <laughs> and when um, you've spent too much money on it. And then right at the end, of course, comes my pet program, the mandatory settlement conference program that occurs within anywhere from two, one to two months prior to trial. Um, <clears throat> And very few, very, I'm happy to say that not that many cases um, escape from that program, I guess you would say, without having settled. And I think that's to its benefit. One thing has to do with court resources. I don't know how it is in other states, but in California, it would actually be an impossibility for us to try more than the approximately 5.8 to 6% of cases that actually go to a court or jury trial. We're juggling as it is. And so unless people want to go back to the bad old days when it takes you know, five or seven years to get a case into a courtroom, um, uh, appropriate dis dispute resolution is, is uh, here to stay. And frankly, as you can tell from my remarks, I've been around this playground for a long time now, both as an attorney and as a judicial officer. And there is so much more benefit associated with it than, than any detriment. And in fact, a cynical person might even say that there's a dark side to it, which is it's also a chance to find out all kinds of information about the other side's case that you might not know early on. It's a chance to assess their temperature and emotional attitude toward the case. So, you know, I never would encourage anyone to go into a uh, alternative dispute or, or, or appropriate dispute proceeding in bad faith, but, you know, you can learn a lot. So that's, you know, it has advantages on a number of fronts. Sure. And I would uh, absolutely agree. I would say from our own experience uh, <laughs> in that we went to mediation in, I don't know, I guess um, maybe, maybe, 15, 20 times maybe in, in major cases. Of course, the Jones Act, there's a lot of mediation because if you're suing for personal injury with a featherweight burden, you want a lot of money. And sometimes it took somebody else to kind of talk them down off of that and say, you know what, you know what? 
you sprained your knee. This is not a million dollar case. But um, what we found is that the success of the mediation usually was a function of the ability of the mediator. Um, some mediators are very, very, very good at it. And they're good at protecting um, what Judge Stern mentioned about people misusing the process and people just using it as a means to do. And, and a really good mediator can kind of separate that out. And so we're not gonna start arguing about this, but the, I've also been in mediations where basically they just took notes back and forth from one conference room back and forth. It doesn't solve anything and, and nobody learned anything and nobody got any closer. But um, so I think if, if you are going to go into a mediation, uh, I would say find the best quality experience mediator you can find with a lot of experience in the field that they're mediating. I think um, they, they tend to be, at least my experience was those were the successful mediations was because of the quality of the mediator's work. And I, uh, I couldn't agree more. I could yeah. not agree more. And the key there is training and education. You know, a lot of people, they get to the end of their law practice and they wanna go semi-retired. So they hang out a shingle and they say, okay, I'm a mediator now. And they're not, and their success rates demonstrated. You know, um, getting formal training is of critical importance. And um, a little mileage on you, you know, in practice doesn't hurt, of course. It's not a job really for newbies, but um, there are certain skills in mediation. And also, some people just have a natural talent for it. Um, and we are very careful to make sure that people who participate in our court sponsored programs are good because the last thing you wanna do is infect people with a dislike of mediation because it's conducted improperly or the mediator isn't balanced or favors one side or, you know, the pitfalls for the unwary in mediation are very present just like they are in a courtroom. You have to know what you're doing. If I could add this Elsa, the um, labor relations was the area, other area of my practice. And I gotta tell you that uh, to me, one of the most uh, gratifying and also efficient parts about labor relations is private dispute resolution. And labor arbitration has a long, long, long history of very successfully dealing with uh, labor contract disputes without ever getting into the courts. And I think, um, no offense to any court or any judge, but, you know, staying out uh, is usually better than going in. Um, unless it's a dispute, you just cannot resolve any other way. And I think labor arbitration, I think is an excellent example of how a dispute resolution procedure can be, can work well over a very long period of time. And because there are very, very, very many very good experienced qualified labor arbitrators out there who uh, can can handle these in a, in a very professional and, and uh, an even-handed way. And, and, you know, even judges are the first people to say, I love the court, but you really have to be on your guard and you have to be on your toes and know what you're doing when you go there. Um, and there are certain classifications of cases, for example, virtually everything connected with family law, mm -hmm. where the cost of litigation emotionally and um, financially is so huge. You know, you've already got a problem when you're trying to take one family's nut of resources and divide it into two homes. But, you know, I always tell litigants at the begin of, beginning of our settlement calendar, every dollar, and this is not disrespectful to lawyers who are worth their pay, but every dollar that you spend on the fight itself is not only um, not a dollar that in either side can capture, but it's a dollar that you can't share. It's just gone. And it's shocking how, you know, a, a you know, your standard middle class estate where they own a home with a good amount of equity, maybe each of the, the uh, partners in the marriage have a modest retirement account and they've saved some money. It can go up in smoke. And if you have attorneys who are not ethical practitioners, there is a phenomenon where people litigate until the money's gone. I agree. And then, and also, then, the, then the attorneys abandon them on the courthouse steps 
And when push comes to shove, you've got self, two self-represented litigants in front of you who can't understand where all the money went and there's nothing left to fight over. It's, you know, mediation is, the, is a necessity in family law as I see. Absolutely, and I think um, in everywhere, well, Elsa, I'm sure that sounds familiar to you uh, because it's something I talk about a lot in my class is that the money you pay your lawyer to win is the same money you could have paid to resolve the thing in the first place. And in so many of the cases, what we see is people will spend a lot of money to fight when they're really the prize isn't worth it. And, um, and I always encourage people to think about what it is you're fighting for before you decide how much you're willing to pay for the fight. And it may not be worth it. And you don't like to settle when you think you're right. You don't like to give a lot of money for a sprained knee, but why is that better if you give all that money to some big law firm? That's, that's not winning. That's just somebody different is getting your money. Well, and what the, what the um, academic research has told us, I made a brief reference to this in my talk, is that when they do research with people in litigation at all levels of, of size of dispute, Settlement is generally acknowledged as being one that leaves people in better financial condition, but also better psychological condition. And it's very common for people who went all the way through, you know, bam, bam, and they get their jury verdict and they talk to them a few years later, and the person's looking over their shoulder and said, literally says, what was I doing? Because there is this situational blindness that occurs when you when you have the courage of your convictions, right? And this is kind of the job of the really good media mediators, you know, not just to um, educate people about the value of stuff, which is really important in, in all kinds of, of damages cases, but, you know, expected outcomes. You know, sometimes attorneys will get family law litigants all charged up, you know, you can get those kids and you can do this. And, what they don't tell their clients is that, for example, family law is incredibly governed by statute and by case law that's very mature. Few surprises, even in a society changing as rapidly as ours. So the range of outcomes in any family law case has certain limits based on the nature of the case and who the parties are and the age of children and how much money they have. You know. Um, anyone who tells a person in a family law case that they're going to be shoot, sh they can shoot the moon is not, is not being honest with their own client. And so mediation that got, like in our Samadras program, um, the way we were able under California law to get, to force cases over $50,000 to mediate, which is technically non-statutory, was by saying it's a mediation education session where the mediators are calling them in with their counsel to talk to them about why mediation is great. And oh, by the way, if you agree and sign this piece of paper, I'm a, I'm a mediator and let's spend the rest of our time constructively in mediating the case. And at first people were wary and now the mediators tell us they, you know, they start their spiel and the attorneys say, no, 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 don't waste our time with that. Let's just mediate. <laughs> so, and, and especially in situations where clients have been put in a position where they, I hate to say it, but the straight information is not being shared with them from the source where it would should come, which is their lawyer. The mediator looks the litigant right in the eye and says, allow me to tell you about this, my friend, that this is what the downsides are. This is the range of outcomes that you're not, can't really get beyond, you know? And, um, you know, Thank that helps so true. And I mean, you guys are phenomenal. Um, I knew this was going to be a great discussion on mediation and dispute resolution. We do have one last question, um, and then we're we'll turn it over to um, Madison and Gaffney for closing thoughts and wrap up. But for both of you, what is an emerging legal issue that you are following closely right now? Mm. Uh, well, I tell you, from my perspective, it's um, it's not strictly 
employment law issue. It's a labor relations issue, but labor unions, uh, the, the whole labor unions have been re-energized by the pandemic and they found some recent successes. There's more organizing, but there's a whole nother thing happening now, which is um, informal labor organization. So groups are coming together, protests, movements, the $15 an hour movement, things that are outside of the traditional model of labor organizing into unions. And I think the law is going to have to deal with that because as a, as a labor organization, those kind of things have no legal standing, but they're going to demand that. And I think that the concept of a labor union is going to expand uh, to include a lot more activity. And that then creates more legal rights for employees and more opportunities for employees to use their, uh, use their collective power. I think one place where we're going to see activity, and, and, and it's one I follow very closely because it's very uppermost in my mind for a whole number of reasons that don't apply here, <laughs> some of which have to do with being surrounded by um, technology people in my private life. <laughs> but um, the role of technology, how it's employed, who will benefit from it, how it's paid for, um, how you have to provide it to those who might not be as well supplied with equipment or access. And, um, you know, uh, we're, we're just starting to see developing case law in this area. And I think it is going to have a very profound impact on how the courts do business into the next decades. And, um, uh, and it's one where it would be pretty easy to get it wrong. So that causes me worry because it has to be done in a way that preserves due process, due process and people's civil rights. And um, depending on the day, my confidence of the ability to get to a place where that is the case wavers. That is the reality of it. Thank you both so, so much for being part of our symposium. You were incredible speakers and we are so grateful to have you guys. Thank you so much. Well, I enjoyed every minute. Thank you. I would appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. Thanks um, very much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you both. Seriously, it was incredible. And what a great discussion we've had um, here and all day. Um, in like 30 seconds, Madison Gaffney is going to come up here and give the closing. Thank you both incredibly and I'm going to turn this camera off so she can come up here. Yeah, I'm going to turn my camera off, but I want to listen to Madison. Thank you. Hello there, Danae. I have finished my talk. Oh, it went very well, and I'm... Talk about a great time.
Even though Vermont law in graduate school and myself may seem heavily environmental focused, I think we can all agree that this year's symposium gave us much to think about in terms of interstate and interstate sports betting and other multi-jurisdictional issues. I have the honor of thanking those who made this symposium possible. I wanna personally thank the CAFE crew, Buildings and Grounds, and Bill Bond and Parker Thurston for all of their help and investment in our symposium and for dealing with all of the technical complications. Thank you, Dean McCormick and Professor Varadi for mod moderating and President Smola for introducing and assisting with the event. Thank you to Emily Davis and Morgan Zielinski for picking up the food and thank you to the members of Vermont Law Review for showing up and supporting your symposium. I wanna give the biggest shout out and thank you to my partner in organized crime, Elsa Larson. As you will read in book four of Vermont Law Review's volume 47, this symposium is Elsa's note come to life. The work, time, and passion she put into making this event a success deserves a standing ovation. All right, I'm just, I'm not there, but I'm picturing that you're giving her a standing ovation. <laughs> um, we have explored the history of mom, mob infiltration of casinos, the impact of the Wire Act, and other laws impacting states' abilities to offer sports betting. And we have seen how these laws intersect across jurisdictions and legal fields. Our panelists have, our panelists have provided us with, mu with much to think about regarding the expansion of legalized sports betting. Regardless of whether you believe interstate sports betting should be legalized or not, if this symposium has shown us anything, it's that the house always wins. Thank you again for attending. <laughs>